Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous people. Clark, are there any documents? Yes, Mr President. I tabled documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. And are there any proposals for committees to meet? There are no proposals for committees to meet. Then I will call on business. Clark. Oh, sorry, just before we do that. Yesterday, the Senate agreed to the order for the production of documents requiring the Minister representing the Prime Minister to provide to the Finance and Public Administration References Committee documents relating to the Urban Congestion Fund. A table a letter from the Chair of the Committee advising that the order has not been complied with. And now we will go to business clerk. Government business ordered the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 5, Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Deputy President. And I would like to begin my remarks by acknowledging the passing of Mr David Dalitnor. Mr Dalitnor was a remarkable storyteller, painter, dancer and actor. His powerful presence connected with audiences across the world. Most Australians of my generation have Storm Boy etched on their memory, a powerful childhood exposure to a different way of seeing the world. At a time when it was uncommon to see First Nations actors on screen and racial stereotypes dominated Australian society, Mr Dalitnor brought culture and country to mainstream audiences in a way unseen before. He transformed Australian cinema. And I offer my deepest condolences to the families in Ramangini, Manangrida, Darwin, Murray Bridge and across Australia. This bill is labelled a Treasury bill. And weirdly, it combines non-controversial changes to corporate insolvency law with what is perhaps the biggest overhaul of screen policy setting in decades. So I will confine my comments to just schedule one of this bill, which deals with screen policy. It's important to place this bill in the context of some recent history, in terms of how this government has treated the screen industry and in terms of existing tax support structures. Australia's screen industry has given us some incredible Australian stories. Gallipoli, Wake in Fright, A Country Practice, The Secret Life of Us, Paper Planes, The Dry. As a country, we are capable of making incredible film and television. In January this year, the government used a non-disallowable instrument to completely change the local content quota system. They effectively removed the requirement for certain types of content such as Australian children's television, to be made at all. Eleven months on, children's television productions tell us their commissions have completely collapsed. That is an entirely predictable outcome, but it doesn't mean it is any less worrying. Because the Australian market is a small one in global terms, premium film and television is expensive to make. There are some movies which have been huge commercial successes. Gallipoli, Crocodile Dundee, Muriel's Wedding, but there are others which have told incredible Australian stories which may not have got off the ground without government support. Samson and Delilah, Hearts and Bones, Alex and Eve come to mind. So our industry requires a level of government support in order to flourish and to continue to produce great Australian content. It's the kind of equation you see in many areas of government policy. There is a public good at stake that is, the production of Australian film and television shows. 
If the market won't provide that outcome on its own, government steps in to help. One part of that framework is Australian content for television. But as I've said, the government's approach to this is killing this sector. For many years, commercial television networks were required to produce a certain amount of Australian children's content, documentary and drama each year. The other part is taxation offsets for film and TV production and post-production services, which make it easier for Australian-made shows and films to get off the ground. What has been so odd about the government's approach is that for many years this has been common ground in terms of policy. Both sides of politics have agreed. Nobody wants our kids growing up without hearing Australian accents on the TV screen. We want to see local heroes at the local cinema. But this government has walked away from that consensus. And what's disgraceful is that they use the cover of COVID to do so. Last year, when the minister used the cover of COVID to suspend the subquotas for the different television genres for just a year, they swore black and blue. Just a year, they said that it was a temporary measure. But those who feared there was more going on were sadly proved right. And as I said, 11 months on from a decision to remove those subquotas, children's television production companies tell us their commissions have completely collapsed. The government's next step in their campaign was to try and halve Foxtel's local content quota from 10 per cent to 5 per cent. A lot of people might not realise how much fantastic content has come out of Foxtel. Love My Way, Upright, Picnic at Hanging Rock, Wentworth, just to name a few. Well, this time, government senators were awake, and well done to those government senators. They said no. They recommended in a bipartisan report, along with other senators from this place, that the section which halved at Foxtel's Australian content requirement be dropped from the bill. They backed Labor's position and the government backed down. And it shouldn't have come to that. It shouldn't have been necessary, but it did. So this bill is part three of the government's attack on the local screen industry. It's not as bad as it might have been. Their original plan was even worse. The original plan included a reduction in the producer's offset from 40 per cent to 30 per cent for an Australian feature film. Would have devastated the Australian film industry. It would have meant like films like The Dressmaker would not have been made. It took a coalition of film producers and stars to come together. They travelled to Canberra several times to make the government listen. It also took a groundswell of support from everyday Australians who'd enjoyed a summer of Australian film. Higher ground, Penguin Bloom, The Dry. Just imagine last summer without them. That part has been dropped from this bill. But unfortunately, many other parts of this bill are just as damaging to the industry, and I'll go through a few of these in turn. The threshold for qualifying expenditure to access producer offsets for film has been doubled from $500,000 to $1 million. And what that means is the, uh, the only productions that will be able to access the producer offset will be large premium productions. It's pretty obvious what the problem is. Many smaller productions, which need the offset to get off the ground, will not go ahead. And this particularly impacts documentary productions, which typically have an expenditure of just over $500,000. And there's some fantastic examples of Australian documentaries. Recently, in my blood it runs, provides just one example. These are true Australian stories, and the government wants to cut them off at the knees. The threshold for qualifying expenditure to access post-digital and visual effects offsets, it's PDF for short, that's also doubled from 500,000 to a million. Now, a lot of Australians might not realise how immensely successful the PDF industry is, but this is a growing industry. It's incredibly important, and it's a heavy hitter on the world stage. This is one of our great exports. Lots of people might not have heard of Animal Logic, but lots of Australians will have watched their work. Captain Marvel, Peter Rabbit and the Lego Movie, just a couple of examples. They are considered one of the best outfits in the world. I've had the very good fortune of touring their studios, meeting their CEO, seeing their vision. This is an incredible example of outstanding Australian innovation, leveraging some of our best capabilities, a country that is, has terrific levels of education, high levels of digital literacy, immensely qualified people doing something really creative. 
The Australian Post and VFX Alliance estimates that 400 jobs in this incredible sector are at stake if this change goes ahead. The Gallipoli course, which allows expenditure incurred overseas to be claimed against the offset, will also be removed. Now, this clause was inspired by the classic Australian movie Gallipoli, and it means that Australian films which need to shoot in overseas locations are not disadvantaged. The reality is that sometimes Australian stories require part of their production to be filmed overseas. And particularly given the diversity of our population, imagine the film Lion if parts of it could not have been filmed in India. Imagine Gallipoli without being able to go overseas to film it. This just doesn't make sense. This is a completely blunt instrument, and if the government is trying to encourage Australian employment in the screen industry, this is not the way to go about it. Other more minor measures in this schedule include removal of certain types of expenditure that can be claimed against the offset, such as overheads and copyright, and other measures designed to limit the coverage of the current offsets. Now, I don't dispute that there are good parts in this bill, just one good part, and that is raising the producer offset from 20 per cent to 30 per cent for television productions. And I want the industry to know that Labor appreciates how important this change is to them. It has been a long fight to get there. As these changes are due to retrospectively apply from July 1, many television productions have already budgeted for this change. They are desperately waiting the passage of this legislation. So despite everything in this bill, everything in this bill being announced in September last year and the bill itself being introduced back in June, the government have left it till now, the second last day in the last sitting week of the year to list the bill. It's inexplicable. It's left Australian producers desperate and put the financing of local pro productions at risk. And the government has wasted time playing silly political games for absolutely no reason, and the industry has paid the price. Labor will move an amendment to this bill that seeks to remove the damaging parts of this bill while keeping the increase to the producer offset for television intact. We recognise the urgency and the importance of the bill's passage. We won't stand in the way, but we utterly reject the government's attempt to bundle measures that are unambiguously good for the industry in with measures that are damaging to other parts of the industry. And this approach, careless at best, malicious at worst, tells you everything about this government's respect for Australian stories. Um, Senator McAllister, you indicated uh, moving an amendment. Is that a second reading amendment? No, it's in the committee okay, stage. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise uh, this morning to contribute to the debate on this piece of legislation, uh, changes to Australia's screen sector um, and our film industry that have been uh, long uh, uh, debated, and yet a piece of legislation that still uh, despite being uh, flagged um, more than 12 months ago, is far from perfect. In fact, desperately needs uh, fixing. The debate over how we support Australian stories in this country has been uh, uh, long fought. How much time uh, do we give Australian stories on our own television screens? How much support do we fund those producing and making Australian stories to ensure that we do have a true representation of what uh, we tell ourselves, what we tell the rest of the world, how we reflect on our own history. You know, storytelling is such an important part of who we are as a community and as a society. The history of storytelling, of course, has been around for tens of thousands of years. Today, we're debating a piece of legislation that is so important in making sure that here in Australia we can continue to tell our stories, to help us understand who we are, help us reflect on the things we value, to help us understand how others see us. It's part of soft diplomacy. It's part of education. It's part of fostering social cohesion and well-being. Storytelling helps us be more empathetic as both individuals and as a community. 
It helps us deal with division and difficult issues. Storytelling is important for making sure we understand our history and the debates over our history. If it wasn't for storytelling and the Australian screen sector, many Australians would have no idea of the history well before white settlement, no idea about the struggles, the richness of the culture, the history of our First Nations people. If it wasn't for our Australian screen sector, many of the stories that have been covered over the years never would have been told to an audience that needed to hear them. As a mum, I've always been incredibly passionate about making sure that we have Australian children's programming so that our kids can access a window into how they see the world, see themselves reflected in what they see on screen, help them make sense of who they are and where, where we all fit. But time after time after time, those who passionately tell these stories, make these stories, produce these stories, have been under attack by government policy. They haven't been prioritised and nurtured the way they should. We've seen changes in the last year that attack the amount of Australian stories on our television screens by changes to the quotas and the subquotas, the regulations that say a certain amount of content on our TVs, on our TV screens and on our streaming services that should be Australian, Australian made. So we're not just being bombarded with stories from overseas. So our children are not just being bombarded with shows straight out of the United States which bear little resemblance to what growing up in Australia is like for Aussie kids. I came to politics with a desperation for social change. I think most of us in this place are here because we want to make the world better, our community better. We want to do the best we can to help improve our communities. And one of the best ways of achieving social change, and that is, of course, changing the hearts and minds and bringing people along with you, is by telling stories. Our Australian screen sector is needed if we are to progress and improve and be better as an Australian society, and particularly for those of us wanting to see social change in some of the areas where the, it's been the most difficult to discuss. If it wasn't for storytelling, we wouldn't have the truth about our First Nations history. If it wasn't for storytelling on our television screens and through our films, we wouldn't have progressed marriage equality in this country in the way that we have. If it wasn't for the power of storytelling, we wouldn't know about the horrors and the histories in relation to the stolen generation. If it wasn't for the power of storytelling, we wouldn't know the fights that women, not just in Australia but around the world, have taken up to achieve and fight for equality. This bill makes it more difficult for the people who tell these powerful stories to keep doing that. There is a good part of this piece of legislation, and that, of course, is the increase to the producer offset for television, something that has been long and hard fought for. And finally, that has been put on the table. But there is riddled through this piece of legislation whack after whack after whack to a sector that needs nurturing and support, because it is in and of itself a public good. It's essential 
for being a respectful and empathetic society that we're able to tell our own stories. A number of the elements of this piece of legislation dismantle the important work of documentary makers in this country. The history of documentaries in Australia is essential and so powerful as part of our record of history, tackling those difficult issues, dealing with things that have perhaps been too divisive to discuss. It is an important part, documentary making, of our public interest journalism in this country. But the changes in this piece of legislation will make it harder for documentary makers to do their job. It will make it harder for documentaries to be made about issues that perhaps aren't already being ventilated. Because unless you can Unless you're going to spend a million dollars making your documentary, you're not going to be able to access this support. That means so many documentaries in Australia that have previously been made just wouldn't have been under these new laws. The changes to the Gallipoli Clause, which is about allowing overseas footage and uh, filming overseas that is part of an Australian film to be counted as part of uh, the, the producer offset. Well, that doesn't make any sense. We are part of the world. Australia is not its own isolated unit, separate from everyone else. Our stories connect us to the rest of the world, and so should, <laughs> so should our films and the way we tell about Australia's position in the world. Cutting the Gallipoli Clause will only make Australia more isolated. Art and creative work, storytelling in this way, is such an important part of soft diplomacy, and it is so often underestimated in the conversations that we hear, in the debates from politicians and those in representing, particularly at this point, some of the really highly contested discussions about Australia's role in our region right now, our relationship with China, our relationship with the Pacific, our relationship with the United States. Being able to use soft diplomacy and the power of storytelling is essential if we are to de-escalate conflict if we are to find pathways towards agreement with our neighbours. It's far too often that it's just dismissed. I, I, I rarely, in fact, I'm not sure I've ever heard Mr Petty, Peter Dutton, while he stands on his soapbox speaking about the conflicts with China, does he ever talk about embracing the power of our creative workers and the power of storytelling and what soft diplomacy, what role soft diplomacy can play. He seems all too busy looking to thump his fist and pull the trigger. And this is the problem with this government's approach to this issue and to the, art in to the, in the arts industry across the board. They have been attacked time and time and time again. COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic has hit the art sector harder than any other industry, whether it's the live performance or on screen. And rather than stepping in to support our artists, we have another bill, another piece of legislation bowled up today to the Senate, which will dismantle the good work that they do. Which is why the Australian Greens will be supporting the amendments before uh, the chamber from uh, the opposition, amendments that we too had flagged, important changes to fix this piece of legislation, to send a message 
to those who dedicate their life's work to telling our stories as Australians, the diversity of stories as Australians, to let them know that we have your back. The parliament actually, and, the, and those of us who are here making policy day in, day out, we have your back. We know what you do is important. It's not some luxury lifestyle, some vocation that doesn't contribute, as some on the other side would have you believe. Being an artist is a real job. Being a filmmaker is an important job. Producing Australian stories that we can tell ourselves to help us understand and be more empathetic about our differences, that is essential. And we will fight to improve this piece of legislation because we have your back. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with these amendments. I hope that the crossbench see the value in supporting not just the tens of thousands of jobs that are on the line, which, by the way, this government gets their way, these changes happen, that will cost jobs. This is the government who says that they stand for the economy. Well, this industry is an essential part of Australia's creative economy and they need to stop being used as Scott Morrison's plaything. Artists and the creative workers in this country are sick of being kicked time and time and time again. The contribution that artists make to our society, our community, our public debate is so essential. We value it, we will fight for it, and we will try and fix this legislation so that you don't have to keep begging and scrimping every single day. I applaud the changes proposed to other members in this place. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Young Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Uh, well, I rise to make some brief remarks uh, about this uh, T-Lab bill. Um, and these are important matters. And the way that we regulate the arts and the media sectors uh, will be some of the most important um, economic and social judgments that parliament will make over the next decade or so. Um, we, are, we are looking down the barrel of having a vastly greater uh, foreign control of uh, media uh, organisations uh, simply by virtue of the massive digital disruption that we are, we are living through. Uh, and basically, everyone knows that there are five very large companies that are based in the United States uh, that are, have started out as uh, a form of uh, digital supplies organisations and are morphing into um, effectively everything production companies, banks. Uh, and so um, we, we need to be uh, nimble in the way that we run our affairs in this country. Uh, now, these particular measures deal with the tax settings uh, and the offsets which are available to production companies. I note that um, the Screen Producers uh, Australia organisation uh, has called for this to be dealt with by this parliament in this year to provide the, the certainty that is required for these producers. And that is, and that, and that is entirely valid and, and welcome. And I'm sure that the Senate and the parliament uh, will be able to achieve that goal for the industry. And I, I know that there are lots of people that are following this debate very closely because there are jobs that hang off these things. Uh, and tax offsets and incentives are important. We know that from, uh, from these arrangements and we know that from the, uh, the research and development tax incentive. I mean, the reality is that um, you wouldn't have organisations like Canva in Australia employing thousands of people unless you had 
tax offsets because those companies would set up shop in Silicon Valley with the official family of the uh, digital world, which is already over there. So um, my point is that these are, uh, at first glance, uh, detail, uh, but they are connected to a much broader and important agenda for the country, which is what are the settings we're going to have to ensure that um, Australians can get access to Australian content and that Australians can uh, work in the digital and the tech and the media businesses, which are morphing into effectively one sector. Uh, that is going to be a very, very big question. And we can't get stuck with static policy settings. And we can't have policy settings which were put in place 20 or 30 years ago when the media landscape was radically, radically, radically different. So um, I welcome this, this measure. I know that the minister and the government have listened to the Senate uh, committee process here. And uh, I think once again, we see that the Senate committees uh, probably do some of the best work of the parliament uh, in providing that additional scrutiny and, and providing the capacity for people to have their say. And uh, it is very important that we protect and preserve the, the institution here of the Senate committees, which are celebrating 51 years this year, uh, because they serve a really important role in giving people access to, to, to policy makers. And in this case, I think the revisions here are very sensible and I uh, look forward to this legislation being debated and passed. Senator, the whipping list has uh, Senator Griff, Senator Davey. <laughs> Senator Griff, you have the call. Uh, thank Senator you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, although this bill implements a large number of measures, most of them are minor technical changes which are uncontentious. The exception to this is the changes to the screen production incentive, which could have significant impacts on our film and television industry. I very much have serious reservations about this measure and have had so since it was first introduced in June. And judging by the representations made to my office and to the Senate bill inquiry, those reservations are very much widely shared. My fundamental concern is that this strikes me as a very narrow change. The government says that the incentive changes are intended to drive the local industry towards higher quality productions, and it seems reasonable to believe that that will in fact be the effect. But what I wanted to know is how this measure fits into a broader strategy for the local screen industry. The Commonwealth puts many millions of dollars into subsidising this industry every year. We have done so for decades, and it's likely that we'll continue to do so for decades to come. But it is astonishing that we do this without having a clear strategy for the industry. The Minister for the Arts should have a vision for the sector, a vision of where the industry could be in five years or ten years' time. We obviously have the talent and the resources for our screen industry to do incredible things. And there is so much potential to build on those strengths and take our industry to the next level. So there should be a strategy jointly developed by the minister, the department and the industry which sets out how to take the industry from its current position to the next level. And we should have a clear idea of how government money and regulation will be used to support this strategy. If we had a, a vision and a strategy and I could see how this measure contributes to it, I could have no problem whatsoever supporting this bill. I will always support empowering our local industries, but we don't have a vision and we don't have a strategy. This measure isn't part of a long-term plan. It's just a fiddle, a play with the policy levers to see what happens. Unfortunately, it's a fiddle that is likely to have some serious detrimental effects on parts of the industry. A lot of industry stakeholders have made it clear that this bill will be quite damaging to their businesses and will probably lead to some job losses. Ordinarily, these issues would be picked up by a broad consultation and engagement with industry. That would give government the opportunity to reconsider some of the measures, but that clearly did not happen. There may have been consultation, but it was not broad. 
it failed to include all parts of the industry. And it was not deep. Many stakeholders were not consulted about all of the measures that are under consideration, and many of them were stunned at what was ultimately included in this bill. This is simply not good enough. It's a failure of government. And the failure was so obvious that the government was forced to acknowledge it in the bill inquiry report. But they continued to press on with what was obviously a flawed and somewhat harmful bill. Now this leaves the Senate in an invidious position. If we support the bill, we will enable the government's damaging changes to some parts of the industry. But if we oppose it, certain film subsidies will not be paid as expected, and that will be particularly damaging uh, for productions that are currently underway, which many have already secured external financing on the basis of these subsidies. Now that could lead to production businesses becoming insolvent and some projects immediately shutting down. It will also damage the reputation of the Australian industry and may deter future projects from coming to our shores. Both outcomes are damaging to the local industry who frankly have done nothing wrong here. They deserve a lot better from this government. But we still have to make a decision and I've decided to listen to the industry who tell me that the passage of this bill is now the lesser of two evils. It will still be harmful, it will still be damaging, but it is less harmful than the alternative. So I will be supporting this bill. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I too rise to support this bill. Uh, like Senator Griff, I have had many conversations with the industry who have stressed to me, as Senator Griff quite rightly says, uh, the lesser of two evils, but importantly, the changes to um, the Australian Screen Production Incentive is imperative that this passes through the parliament as soon as possible. As Senator McAllister in her contribution earlier pointed out, many productions have received, and Senator Griff also noted, many productions have received finance on the basis that this change will go through and will be retrospective to the 1st of July uh, this year. So it is imperative that we pass this bill. I, uh, I participated in the Environment and Communications Committee process that reviewed this bill. And um, I want to note that the committee, while it found support for the bill was mixed, noted that the strong support for Schedule 1 of the bill that facilitates the increase to the Australian, Australian Screen Production Incentive um, was, was overwhelming um, and that it recommended that the bill should be passed. Furthermore, industry organisations such as Free TV Australia and the Screen Producers Australia have advised of the need for timely passage of this bill to give the industry the certainty and the confidence they need to make important investment decisions so that we can have the Australian content that every contributor today has highlighted is important. Um, Senator Hanson Young quite rightly speaks of the need for us to be able to hear, see, listen to, watch Australian stories. I also want to note how many of those Australian stories are produced in regional Australia. The economic input that the screen production industry makes into regional areas, places like Broken Hill, where we've seen some fantastic screen production. Silverton, the little town of Silverton, which is proudly home to the fabulous Mad Max Museum. These regional areas benefit from our screen production sector, and the screen production sector benefits from the screen production incentive. Several witnesses to the inquiry, however, did raise concern about the increase in the qualifying Australian production expenditure threshold, and I want to address those um, concerns today. These, are, these concerns were particularly dominant in the documentary sector. However, the department did point out that Screen Australia is being provided an extra $33 million in additional funding to target and support high-quality 
and culturally important Australian content with a focus on the documentary sector. Um, a number of stakeholders also raised concerns about the increased threshold on the post-digital and visual effects sector, or the PDV sector, highlighting that often PDV work is split between several smaller companies, uh, and they raised the concern that meeting that $1 million threshold is a bridge too far. However, in their um, response submission, admittedly late submission to the committee, the department did clarify that the, what is commonly known the quape threshold um, of one million applies to the whole production, not the individual contact, contract. So a production company would be able to um, enter into PDV contracts with multiple companies at less than the million dollar as long as the total equated to the million dollars. Uh, the committee also noted that the threshold remains unchanged at $500,000 for shorter form productions of up to 60 minutes for non-feature length content. And, um, it was based on that information that the committee recommended the bill be passed. But it also recommended that the department consult with industry further to develop measures to strengthen the Australian screen production incentive requirements to maximise the value of work awarded to Australian PDV providers. And um, I sincerely hope that the department has taken that recommendation on board um, and it has commenced that work uh, to see what we can do to continue to encourage the use of Australian PDV uh, providers who are located all over Australia. The beauty about post-production post work is that it can be done almost anywhere. And uh, we have some fantastic PDV companies based in regional New South Wales. Big shout out to them. Um, I hope that the passage of this bill, the successful passage of this bill today, sees much more uh, investment in Australian content, Australian screen production, and Australian post production digital and visual effects. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate today. Schedule 1 to the bill makes a range of reforms to the Australian Screen Production Incentive, including increasing the produce offset for films that are not feature films released in cinemas to 30 per cent of the total qualifying Australian production expenditure, and various threshold and integrity amendments across the three screen tax offsets. I can also confirm that the, Senate has, that the government has agreed to the recommendations of the Senate Committee on Environment and Communications to increase the copyright threshold for documentaries. And I thank senators involved in the, pressure, the preparation of that report. Overall, the changes to the Australian Screen Production Incentive will ensure the screen tax offsets effectively target areas that require support and encourage production and commercial distribution of quality Australian screen content in a digital environment. Schedule 2 to the bill relates to small business insolvency. The main small business insolvency reforms, which came into effect on 1 January 2021, introduced new insolvency processes suitable for small businesses, reducing complexity, time and costs. These processes enable more Australian small businesses to quickly restructure. Where restructure is not possible, businesses can wind up faster, enabling greater returns for creditors and employees. This measure makes consequential amendments which will support the operation of the new insolvency processes. Schedule 3 to the bill makes minor, technical, minor and technical amendments to Treasury portfolio legislation. This includes amendments that clarify the law to ensure that it operates in accordance with the policy intent, making minor policy changes to improve administrative outcomes or remedy unintended consequences and correct technical or drafting defects. And I commend this bill to the Senate. I, I guess, uh, thank you, sorry, Acting Deputy Chair. I, have a, um, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved in this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I put the question that the bill be now read a second time. Those questions say aye. 
against no, the eyes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation deal with consequential and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Act 2020, make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the law in the Treasury portfolio and for related purposes. Is the wish bear with me, Minister. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There be no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move the government amendment on sheet ZA122. This amendment increases the copyright cap for documentaries from 30 per cent to 50 per cent of qualifying Australian production expenditure for two years from 1 July 2021. The bill containing reforms to the Australian Screen Production Incentive uh, was referred to the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. The committee delivered its report on 31 August and the committee recommended that the copyright cap, a measure that limits the amount of Australian held copy, copyright that can be claimed under the offset, be set at an initial rate of 50 per cent instead of the proposed 30 per cent in order to monitor the, initial, monitor the initial impact on the sector. So This change will increase payments by an estimated $1.3 million over the forward estimates. A copyright cap of 50 per cent remains consistent with the policy intent of encouraging the creation of new content. Accepting the committee's recommendations of a 50 per cent copyright cap on documentary productions for two years is consistent with the aim of the broader reforms. It will also provide the sector with an appropriate adjustment period. And this change will alleviate concerns around the impact of the changes, in particular for documentary makers. Based on historical data, it's expected that all documentary productions either will benefit from the change to the cap by being able to claim up to 50 per cent of their copyright costs instead of 30 per cent, or will not be impacted at all. Additional funding, as mentioned by Senator Davies, has been allocated to Screen Australia, and setting the copyright cap for documentary productions to 50 per cent for two years will give the documentary sector more time to adjust to the broader reforms. The government will continue to monitor the impacts of its policy settings on the screen production sector. Does any honourable senator wish to make a contra? Oh, sorry. I apologise, senator, Acting Deputy President. Um, Labor supports this amendment. It was recommended by the Senate committee, which inquired into this bill, as the minister has pointed out. I do want to make clear, though, that Labor's position is that no change should be made to the existing settings on copyright expenditure eligibility thresholds at all. But we won't stand in the way of implementing this recommendation, which will at least blunt the initial impact of the measures contained in this bill on the documentary sector. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, or Chair. Apologies, we're in committee. Uh, uh, the Greens uh, support uh, this amendment. Um, uh, however, um, uh, we would prefer uh, that there were no changes uh, being made to the copyright um, uh, elements uh, in relation to uh, these matters, particularly for documentaries. We are extremely concerned that through this piece of legislation the government is cutting uh, documentary uh, making in this country off at the knees. It's going to make it very difficult for um, documentary makers in Australia to uh, get um, finance, to be able to tell their stories, to be able to uh, uh, report. Uh, such an essential part of public interest journalism in this country comes from documentaries. Such an, an important part of our re record of history uh, and our telling of history comes from uh, documentaries. Such an important part of helping as policy makers and uh, those of us in public life uh, to understand uh, how the community is feeling, to ventilate difficult issues, to uh, come to a consensus of community is through uh, documentary making. And uh, I just I, I don't understand why it is that the Scott Morrison uh, Barnaby Joyce government is so intent of uh, tearing down 
the documentary sector in Australia? I mean, is it because you don't like um, people uh, reporting history, telling things as they are, calling out issues that have previously gone uh, unreported? Australia has a proud history of making documentaries and making really good ones. And all of this is being put at risk uh, by these, uh, several of the elements in this piece of legislation. Um, this will um, uh, limit some of that damage, uh, but not all of it. Uh, and it's just mindless insanity for the government to continue to want to whack and destroy Australia's documentary sector in this way. Does any other honourable senator have a contribution on this amendment? I intend to put the question. I put the question that the amendment be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. We now come to a, a, an amendment which I understand the opposition is going to move. That's right, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I uh, seek leave to move items 1 to 5 on sheet 1351 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay. Um, as I indicated in my remarks in the second reading speeches, this amendment seeks to remove the most damaging parts of this bill. This bill represents as I indicated, the third stage in a rolling attack by the government on the Australian screen industry. Measure after measure contained in this bill creates circumstances where Australian television programs, Australian films, Australian documentaries will struggle to get off the ground. And I point particularly to those parts of the bill that raise the threshold for eligibility from half a million, from five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars, this is significantly a very, very significant increase, and it means that many small-scale local productions, those productions which do indeed tell Australian stories, will not be able to get off the ground. We recognise the urgency and importance of passing this bill. And as Senator Griff pointed out, the way that the bill has been assembled places senators in an invidious position. Do we pass a measure that is desperately needed, that has been banked by the television sector, and in doing so also pass other measures which film producers and documentary producers tell us are going to be a problem? And it's on that basis that Labor is seeking to amend this bill. The amendments before you. Um, seek to excise those parts of the bill that would do the most damage. And I do ask senators to give consideration to support for these. We're not going to stand in the way of holding this up, but it would be better for Australia stand away the bill and hold things up. But it would be better for Australian industry, Australian film and television, if the amendments that are before you now were passed. Uh, Senator Hanson Young uh, thank you, uh, Chair. You. I just rise to indicate uh, support for uh, these amendments. Uh, they are all issues that were um, covered by the uh, Senate inquiry into this piece of legislation and all seek to uh, reduce the damage uh, that is in this bill to the local Australian screen sector, um, particularly those small-scale productions which uh, we know are so essential to telling our stories, uh, our Australian stories, our local stories, uh, but are also so essential to the local industries. I know there are senators, uh, you know, being the state's uh, house in this chamber, senators from all around the country and in our different states, we have uh, very localised uh, and unique uh, screen and film sectors. Well, this uh, bill, as it stands, is going to devastate uh, those local uh, production houses, uh, the local um, stories coming out of our states, and we need to fix it. Um, 
This is not asking for anything more than keeping the status quo. Um, there's plenty more that could be done, uh, but we're not asking for anything more. We're just asking for uh, damage not to be done here. Let's take out the bits of this piece of legislation that uh, drive a truck through Australian production, drive a truck through Australian stories and documentary making. Um, we're not asking for any more money, um, uh, Minister, through you, Chair. Uh, we're simply asking uh, that uh, the government accept uh, that the settings for uh, these smaller productions and for documentaries uh, need to be left as they are. Otherwise, uh, we risk um, devastating an industry that, in fact, is only just starting to recover um, since the pandemic. Um, and uh, Senator um, uh, McAllister was correct in the articulation of the wicked problem we have here, and that is um, there is one element of this bill uh, that is desperately needed uh, to, to pass. There is also um, a whole lot of other elements of this bill that are going to devastate <laughs> Uh, the rest of the industry, uh, pitting our creatives and our filmmakers and our producers, our storytellers uh, against each other. Um, not a very good thing to do uh, to a sector that is already struggling to get back up, uh, back up and running. Um, and why on earth the government is being so pig-headed uh, about this is beyond me. I mean, I know, um, you know over there on the government side, um, you know, Mr. Morrison is hardly, uh, has, has hardly uh, put himself up as the hero of the arts, and he rarely utters the word. Uh, he's continued to talk down uh, to the, the broad art sector, refuses uh, to, to deal with the very harsh reality that the sector is feeling right now because of uh, COVID. I mean, let's not forget. This is the government that cut the Department of the Arts in the first place. Right? So that we understand we're dealing with a very a difficult mindset when it comes to uh, Mr. Morrison and his approach to um, arts and creatives in this country. But honestly, this is unnecessary. Uh, this is an unnecessary attack. Uh, it's nasty. It's a nasty thing to do. To pitch, to pit the sector against each other. Well, that's what the government's doing here: uh, picking winners uh, and letting everybody else fail. Uh, these amendments uh, go some way to trying to fix this. And for those of us in smaller states, where our uh, production uh, industry is uh, really starting to um, become part of our local economies, it is essential uh, that these amendments pass to protect the sector. Uh, and I hope the crossbench uh, support the amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. The government opposes this amendment. The government is pursuing an integrated package of reforms, including support to attract uh, a pipeline of inbound production, changes to the Australian Screen Production Incentive and additional funding for Screen Australia and the Australian Children's Television Foundation. Changes to the Australian Screen Production Incentive are designed specifically to refocus government support to that sector, encouraging it to target expenditure towards on-screen quality and incentivising the creation of original Australian stories that can better compete in the global marketplace. And they will also support producers to create content of ambition and scale that will meet audience expectations. This is being achieved through careful balancing and targeting of the Australian government's tax offset policy settings to achieve the objective of supporting a mix of domestic and international production, generating jobs and stimulating the economy. Major amendments to this bill, like the amendment proposed by Labor, will significantly diminish the effectiveness of the changes and upset the balance that is needed to achieve the objective, objectives of creating local Australian content that can compete for domestic and global audiences while also generating jobs and stimulating the economy. 
Does any other honourable member have a contribution on the amendment? No honourable member has indicated they wish to speak further on the amendment, so I intend to put the question. The question is phrased in a particular way that if you support the opposition uh, amendments, you will vote no, and if you support the government's position, you will vote in the affirmative. I intend to put the question. I put the question that items 2, 6, 9 and to 13, 15 to 23 and 25 of Schedule 1, standards printed, and item 14 of Schedule 1 as amended be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. We now proceed. I understand there's a further amendment from Senator Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Acne, Deputy President. Excuse me, Senator Patrick. My error. Uh, I have to put a further question. Uh, the next question I'll ask, put is that Amendment Five be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, you now have the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acne, Deputy President. I, I, I rise to indicate that I don't intend to move my amendment. Uh, th there is a difficulty with, uh, uh, with uh, the government in that it uh, is currently hiding the, re the financial reports of 1,119 of, uh, uh, of large the financial reports of large proprietary companies. Um, that creates a situation where uh, these large proprietary companies and these are not my words, these are the words of um, ASIC in response to uh, 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 submissions made to uh, an economics committee uh, into corporate tax avoidance, that uh, when you don't disclose your financial statements publicly, it can give rise to aggressive tax avoidance. And sadly, this is uh, uh, an exemption from reporting that only applies to a limited number of companies, very wealthy family uh, companies, and uh, sadly, as it has been shown by Michael West, uh, mates of the Liberal Party, donors to the Liberal Party. And uh, whilst I would love to move this amendment, I understand that the Greens and Labor won't be supporting. I understand that they are not supporting because they don't want to withhold um, uh, money from. Uh, the uh, television sector, uh, movie sector, and uh, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that because the government has, in fact, let, let this languish on the notice paper for some considerable uh, amount of time. Uh, so whilst I'm not moving the amendment, I think it might be appropriate if, uh, if other parties may wish to um, state why they wouldn't support in this instance. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just in um, uh, disclosure to uh, the chamber here, um, and thanks to uh, Senator Patrick for um, uh, withdrawing his uh, amendment. Again, this is the difficulty we are in. This government plays a, a game uh, with the lives and livelihoods and jobs of everyday Australians that if you don't do it their way, you get zilch. It's their way or the highway. I mean, that just totally characterises this Prime Minister, doesn't it? Um, Mr Morrison, if he doesn't get his way, it's all it's somebody else's fault and the whole show is off. Bang! Tantrum! Point your finger somewhere else. And that's what the government does every time, every time. The pressure is on. And, uh, you need a bit more strength of character from someone who wants to leave the country, I'd suggest, than just thumping their fist and saying, my way or the highway. Being a leader actually requires listening, consulting, talking, showing. And all we get from Mr Morrison is thumping, grumping, thumping, grumping and pointing at someone else. That's all we get. So thank you, uh, Senator Patrick, uh, but you know, really, this is an indictment 
on, uh, on the government. And, uh, we understand on this side, uh, in the Greens, that there is an importance to the disclosure of this information, that the government hides this information to cover up for their mates in big business, and we don't think it's appropriate. And, I th and this chamber has said that time and time and time again. But of course, you know, Mr. Morrison uh, runs this country uh, as if you know no one else matters, and so that's why we're in the position we're in. So um, it, it is with great reluctance that we're not able to progress uh, that particular amendment today. Did it. Uh, thanks, Chair. I uh, also would just wish to accept Senator Patrick's uh, invitation for an explanation of Labor's approach to his question. Uh, Labor fully supports, of course, the principles in the amendment that Senator Patrick had circulated. Uh, I know that this is something that Senator Patrick has been concerned about for some time, and indeed we've cooperated in this chamber to try and get this outcome in different bills. Um, but Unfortunately, the government consistently resists this proposition for reasons best known to them. Why is it that large private companies are not subject to ordinary transparency measures? Why is it that they persist in this protection racket, in this grandfathering arrangement that they seem totally unable to walk away from? It's part of an ongoing culture of secrecy. It's a depressing indictment on their approach to government in general, but unfortunately uh, we've seen when a, an amendment of this kind is passed in this chamber, it's rejected in the other place. I've indicated throughout this debate that we do not want to see this bill held up. We know that there are television producers, depending on the outcomes um, of the, the passage of this bill, and it's on that basis that we did indicate to Senator Patrick that on this occasion we were not in a position to support his amendment had he moved it. Does any other honourable member wish to make a contribution? I intend to put the question. I put the question that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 5, Bill 2021, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, deal with consequential and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the Corporations Amendment, Corporate Insolvency Reforms Act 2020, make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the law in the Treasury portfolio and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Legislation Amendment, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority Board and Other Improvements Bill 2019, Second Reading Debate. Senator McMahon, in continuation. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, as I was saying last night um, when I, I opened my contribution, uh, the importance of um, agricultural and veterinary chemicals and their regulation can't be overemphasized. Now, <clears throat> how, the, uh, how this has come before us uh, is not something we just thought up yesterday. This has been a long process. Um, it came out of the part of the 2015 Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper. And the government committed to streamline access to agvet chemicals and better manage the risks that they pose, whilst at the same time retaining protection for the health, welfare and safety of humans, animals, plants and the environment. Um, 
The Morrison Joyce government recognises the need to better balance regulatory effort with risk and improve veterinary surgeons, farmers and other users' access to newer and better agricultural and veterinary chemicals, including many medications. <clears throat> this government also recognises the need to ensure that our regulatory agencies have effective governance arrangements with clear accountability and transparency. The department consulted on potential AgVet chemical reforms between 2015 and 2018. Stakeholder feedback indicated widespread interest in reform and support for a more efficient and effective regulatory system. And I can personally report that industry that I have been speaking to, as, as you're well aware, I'm very close to this industry, being a veterinary surgeon, um, people in industry that I have been speaking to recently have talked about um, how there have been improvements, how they have seen improvements in the way that, um, that the APVMA works, in the way that it approves uh, medications and chemicals, in the, the time that it takes uh, to get approvals through. That, um, that was a big uh, thing that industry has had for many, many years. Um, this is a quite small agency and it's often dealing with um, hundreds of applications at any one time. And uh, industry what has been concerned for many years about the, um, the time taken to get things approved. And I am very pleased to report that um, under the, the previous Ag Minister, uh, uh, Senator McKenzie, and under the current Ag Minister, Minister Littleproud, um, that there have been improvements, and there have been incremental improvements, and industry is, um, is, is still looking for more improvements to be made, but they are quite um, impressed with uh, the, the steps that have been taken to improve these areas. <clears throat> Now, the APVMA is probably an agency that a lot of people haven't really heard of and, and, and don't really pay a lot of attention to. But as I've stated, it is a vital agency. Um, it, it, it approves and regulates uh, all of the chemicals that are used in agriculture, absolutely vital for our agricultural industries. Uh, we have a very strong agricultural industry in Australia and a, a proud history uh, of our agriculture and the food and fibre that we produce. And uh, all of this to be efficient and effective and safe does rely on um, the efficient regulation of the chemicals that are used in it. <clears throat> but also veterinary medicine. Although many Australians would not have heard of this agency, uh, the vast majority of Australians have or have at some stage um, owned animals, owned either farm animals or owned companion animals, pets, or performance animals, um, such as, as racing horses and greyhounds or um, you know, horses that are used in competition. So the veterinary side of it is, is very vital. I mean, not only for production animals, so veterinarians and the, uh, the medications that we have access to are vital for animal health and welfare in our production systems. And uh, these, these range from intensive production systems, such as, as chicken and pigs, to quite uh, extensive systems, uh, such as uh, beef cattle. And the, uh, the treatment, the maintenance of not only the health, but as I said, the welfare is absolutely vital and the medications that are used in doing that. Um, vital that we get them approved in a timely manner and, uh, and vital that they are regulated in a way that, as I said, is, is safe and efficient and effective. But we also have companion pets. And um, you know, most people in Australia would be, be well aware of pet cats and dogs and, and birds and these days reptiles. Um, fish and uh, veterinary medications that are regulated by this agency are absolutely um, vital in in all of these animals, all of these companion animals. Um, and and modern 
veterinary medicine is increasingly coming into line with human medicine and people are increasingly demanding um, improved treatments and outcomes for their pets. And in fact, you know, these days it is quite common for pets to undergo chemotherapy for cancer or to have complex surgeries, including complex orthopaedic surgeries, complex soft tissue surgeries, and medications for many um, both emerging and existing diseases and conditions. Um, so the, um, the regulation and the approval of these medications is vital uh, to those pets and their owners. And we're a very um, small country in terms of population and in terms of our, our pets in our veterinary industry compared to countries you know, such as um, the US and the UK. So we don't have a lot of, um, of medications that are developed in this country. We rely heavily on, on both human medications and uh, medications that are developed overseas. Uh, now these have to get approved in Australia to be able to be used. And that is, that is where this agency comes in. They are absolutely critical in getting timely approval for these medications and also making sure that the, uh, the testing and the regulation that's been done overseas is appropriate for Australian conditions and for um, Australian pets and production systems. So this bill will improve the APVMA's governance, reduce the regulatory burden on industry, support the APVMA's operations, strengthening the integrity of the regulation system, and enhance the way the regulation operates. Um, now, <clears throat> I've already spoken about how this agency um, operates and the way that it's important to increase the efficiency and the time in which um, various medications and chemicals are approved. And one such example of this is um, minor use permits. Now these are, are permits that are granted by the agency for chemicals and medications that generally aren't, don't have widespread use or are needed in, in a urge, very urgent situation. Uh, they're generally used in small, small amounts, small production systems. Um, and they may not have had the time or it may not be um, worthwhile to the company to go through the full registration process, which is quite expensive and quite onerous. So an example of where these are used in veterinary medicine is uh, autogenous vaccines. So where you have um, an outbreak of a disease on a particular property, uh, and we're trying, to, we're trying to get away from widespread use of antimicrobials, and that's where these vaccines are important. So there'll be a veterinary investigation on a particular property where a disease is occurring. Um, and an identified uh, bacteria will be found that's the cause of the disease outbreak. And a vaccine can be developed to that specific uh, bacteria on that specific property. Now, you're not going to go through a whole regulation process to, to, to um, get a vaccine to the market that's you know, for use on one or two individual properties. Um, so that's where the minor use permits comes in. Now one of the issues um, that has come about is that uh, the agency has five months in which to approve one of these minor use permits. Uh, and then um, the APVMA can go back to the proponent with a, a question about um, the information that's contained in the permit application, which then triggers another five months. So you can have almost a year between when a disease is identified on a property and when the permit is issued uh, for the, the vaccine to combat that disease. And now um, anyone would acknowledge that that's, that's not desirable. We need to speed this process up we need to still maintain um, safety and uh, efficacy, but we need to speed this process up. 
And that is where, that is where this will come into effect, that, um, that we're continually improving the governance of the AAPVMA and we're continually improving its efficiency and effectiveness. So as someone who is um, intimately involved in the agricultural and veterinary industries, um, I, I thank the ministers involved. And um, as I said, Minister Mackenzie has been instrumental in this. And um, I, I thank her for the work that she's done on it. And uh, industry, industry certainly uh, strongly, strongly uh, welcomes and recommends um, this bill and the improvements in effectiveness and efficiency that it will bring about. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I did lis listen with interest to Senator McMahon's contribution uh, to uh, this debate from her own, um, rooted very much, I think, in her own expertise um, in this area, and um, it does uh, it does cause me to reflect um, that it is a that it is a pity, um, in my view. I'm not sure what Senator McMahon's view is, but it is a pity that she won't be um, back here um, in the next term, uh, because bringing that perspective, um, I think, uh, is very important. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of things that I don't agree with Senator McMahon about, um, uh, but um, she does genuinely bring that perspective and that expertise from that sector with her. And it is, um, I think, a bit of a symbol of the decline uh, of uh, the modern National Party, uh, that instead of continuing to put people from the agriculture sector uh, into parliament. Uh, they've decided in this case in the Northern Territory to put a sky after dark um, right wing operator uh, into the parliament rather than somebody who brings, um, brings that particular set of expertise uh, with them. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, at the outset of this discussion. Senator McMahon's right. These issues about the regulation of um, agricultural and veterinary chemicals are important for the future, um, yes, of our agriculture sector, but they do have an impact too for people who operate uh, in the veterinary industry um, in terms of people's companion animals. Uh, but also, of course, in the racing industry for greyhounds, uh, for, uh, for the horse racing industry. Um, they, are, they are critical, critical questions. Um, now, these, um, the chemicals that are regulated uh, the chemical, the, the, and the processes of using, utilising the chemicals that are regulated are important also from an animal welfare and environmental perspective. Uh, they're often powerful and dangerous chemicals that require an effective regulatory system. Um, they are they, ju just like chemicals uh, that are used for human health. The application of these chemicals should be. Uh, properly uh, enforced, a proper compliance regime. And of course, these things aren't interchangeable, uh, human health and animal health. Um, I've noticed that uh, the coalition backbench isn't immune uh, from having uh, members of it who think that products that are used for horse health, for example, uh, might have applications for human health. Uh, and there have been some characters who inhabit the government's backbench who have been urging Australians who should be paying attention to real scientific research, uh, not uh, people who are in their cellars doing their own research, who assert that Australians ought to buy horse paste and use it on themselves. 
uh, to, instead of getting themselves properly vaccinated. Uh, and those people ought to stop, uh, and they ought to you know, pay attention to the science, and they ought to act actually in the national interest. Of course, more broadly in agriculture, uh, what we've seen is falling public investment in agricultural research and falling public investment uh, in research, both in terms of, and I take Senator McMahon's point, Australia is small in population terms compared to the rest of the world, but our agricultural industry is large compared to the rest of the world. And so our investment in public research, whether it's in relation to uh, veterinary medicine or pesticides, or the broader questions of genomic research, uh, plant development, uh, animal husbandry, um, on-farm productivity, our investment in public research in these areas ought to be punching above its weight in global terms. But it's not. Both at, at both at Commonwealth and state level, public investment in these areas has continued to decline. And we have got big challenges as a country in agriculture in terms of water availability, in terms of future uh, animal and plant diseases and insulating Australian agriculture have been a step ahead in terms of developments um, in animal and plant disease and in terms of productivity. We are absolutely behind the eight ball in terms of the Commonwealth's engagement with Australian agriculture in the effort to lift Australian agriculture up the value chain so that we're not just exporting raw commodities overseas, but that we're creating the good jobs in country towns, of food processing jobs in particular, uh, meatworks in our north. Uh, making just-in-time food products for the Southeast Asian market. We are falling well and truly behind in those areas. And it's all very well for the National Farmers Federation and the government and indeed the Labor Party to say that we support the National Farmers Federation's $100 billion of agricultural exports by 2030 objective. But it's not enough. It's not enough. I mean, on-farm productivity has continued to rise every year since the 1970s in Australia, except for years that have been drought years. Australian farmers have been doing their bit, the 86,000 farming operations of lifting productivity. The real lifts in national productivity will be in shifting Australian agriculture up the value chain not just operating on the basis of the incremental improvements in on-farm productivity and then just being a function of volume and price. We should be leading the world uh, in these areas. If I can return to just this agency, the Australian Pesti Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority controls the assessment and registration of all these chemicals as well as the supply activities right up to the point of retail sale, the bill really proposes to just create an additional governance arrangement. That, that governance arrangement was the result of the independent review of pesticides and veterinary medicines regulatory system in Australia. And they are correct that the APVMA is one of the few corporate Commonwealth entities without a board. Now, all of the other Commonwealth regulatory entities with a direct responsibility for human life and health, Food Standards Australia, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, they all have boards. And the APVMA doesn't have a board. I mean, gosh, it needed one. It needed one. Somebody needed to stay uh, to, to stand up in the public interest. Uh, when the then Deputy Prime Minister and again Deputy Prime Minister Mr Joyce announced the transfer of the APVMA's offices to Armidale without any, without any process. 
But on the basis that this has been proposed and it's consistent with what's happening more broadly, Labor will be supporting the bill. It is worth noting, of course, critical stakeholder groups have expressed some concerns with the design of the bill. Uh, they say it'll have no independent power over the authority. There's no clear policy rationale, uh, rationale for it to exist. And of course, as always, the costs will be borne by farmers themselves through higher prices. It's not often that you can construct a governance system that alienates all of the stakeholders in the sector, but of course, this is the modern National Party. Senator Canavan says correctly they don't represent farmers anymore. There's an utter hypocrisy in this legislation. We'll support it. There needs to be some governance, some governance over this authority. A few years ago, the Deputy Prime Minister filmed himself yelling at the sky about how he doesn't want government in his life, he said. In the other chamber, it was quite an odd video. If you haven't seen it, you should, you should watch it. In the other chamber, he mocked the concept of achieving public policy outcomes through legislation or even regulation, which is an odd thing for a bloke who sits in the parliament to say. Um, it is notable, of course, that the, gov that, that the Deputy Prime Minister wanted to get a whole lot more government in the lives of the citizens of Armidale by moving the APVMA there. It's hard to accept the claim that he made at the time that this was all about creating jobs in regional Australia. I mean, at that time, the government was embarked upon a course of deleting thousands of public sector jobs. Thousands of public servant jobs were deleted all across regional Australia at the same time. In the New England, government cuts to agricultural research have devastated scores of jobs in the Deputy Prime Minister's own electorate. 200 jobs gone at the local university, the University of New England. The relocation was opposed by the department. Almost all of the serious stakeholders opposed it, and even Ernst and Young, when commissioned to provide a report, argued there would be little or no benefit. It wasn't legislated. There was no cabinet process. There was no consultation. It was utterly bungled. The APVMA and Minister Joyce forgot to hire an office space. Public servants for months were reduced to going and sitting in McDonald's to use the Wi-Fi. 85 per cent of the staff refused to move. And it's been plagued with financial difficulty ever since. It's cost at least $26 million. There's no way of calculating the real financial cost of this utter bungle. It's hard not to think that having some board, even with the deficiencies of this regulatory system, wouldn't have provided some assistance at protecting this capability uh, from Mr Joyce's uh, preemptive uh, and um, senseless uh, approach uh, to this move. Of course, the other thing that gives me pause for thought in this is this allows yet another government board that the government can make appointments to. And we've seen what happens with the National Party and Mr Joyce in particular and their approach to government appointments. Recently, the mayor of Tamworth, who's retiring, sat down with the prime minister, as he outlined in the Northern Daily Leader, which is a fantastic newspaper based in Tamworth, that he was worried about what he'd be doing to occupy his mind in his retirement. So he spoke to his old mate, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. Joyce appointed him to be the chair of Infrastructure Australia. I mean, just entirely sweeping aside any idea of merit, any, any idea of what's in the national interest, just appointed his mate who needed a retirement job. It's a men's shed for mates approach uh, in the National Party these days. 
the, I hope, but I don't trust, that the Morrison government and Mr Joyce can actually make fair income appointments to this board, actually make appointments that are actually in the national interest, actually appoint people like Senator McMahon, who have actually got a little bit of expertise in this area, rather than appointing former staffers, former staffers, <laughs> retiring councillors, political fixers, branch stackers, national party mates to all of these boards, because that's all. That's all this government's been capable of doing when it comes to public appointments. As I say, there is a deep complacency in the National Party about the future of Australian agriculture. Much more work, much more work needs to be done. We'll support this legislation, but what Australian agriculture needs is a government that actually stands up for it and actually does a little bit of work. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Thank you, Chair. Can you, can you hear me okay? We certainly can, Senator Wish Wilson. Oh. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to start by pointing out uh, to those who might be watching this debate today or, or reading the Hansard that it is curious that this legislation, in one form or another, has been kicking around uh, this chamber and the House uh, and through a number of reviews for nearly seven years. So, uh, for the background, um, the regulation of chemical products in Australia, or the regulatory framework for managing pesticides and veterinary medicines in Australia, is collectively referred to as a National Registration Scheme for Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals, or the NRS. And this is a partnership between the Commonwealth and the states and territories. The assessment and registration of agricultural and veterinary chemicals, AgVet chemicals, as well as the control of supply activities up to the point of retail sale is undertaken by the APVMA. And control of the use of AdVet chemicals after sale is a responsibility of individual states and territories. The AgVet code is contained in a schedule under the Code Act. And under the NRS, the AgVet code operates together with the code of each participating jurisdictions. Um, to constitute a single national code applying through Australia. Now, um, going back to 2008, uh, this regulatory framework has had a number of reviews. And those reviews, which I haven't got time to go into in, in any detail, um, essentially led to legislation in 2013, so eight years ago. Um, and that was called the 2013 Amendment Act. And that act, which came before the parliament, uh, which I remember, I remember the debate back in 2013, encouraged the development of newer and safer chemicals by providing more flexible and streamlined regulatory processes with higher levels of transparency and predictability for business seeking approval for AgVet chemicals to enter the market. The reform should result in a more straightforward assessment process that is easy to understand and more cost effective to administer. In many cases, products for, uh, particularly for products of low regulatory concern, the reform system as established by these amendments should be faster, deliver more predictable outcomes and result in improved health and environmental protection for the broader community. Now, despite the lengthy consultation which led to this 2013 Amendment Act, um, as is said in the Bill's Digest, it was not without its critics, as it was unclear whether the relevant amendments would lead to greater efficiencies which they were intended to create. Um, of greatest concern were the following, the potential for increased cost for registrants and applicants, and increased complexity in the regulatory system, uh, which might result in the loss of existing agricultural chemical products and discourage the introduction of newer modern chemistry and biological products, and the potential loss from the Australian market of useful products that were safe and effective to use due to the need to obtain reapproval or re-registration of these products. Now, this Sounds like good, good uh, kind of wholesome policy content, uh, Acting Deputy President. But you need to look at the politics of this. Um, this bill, uh, after a very long consultation process and uh, nearly seven years of reviews, uh, was dissented to by the coalition 
senators at the time that it went to committee, uh, who also voted against this bill when it came to the Senate. That led to a 2013 federal election promise to review and overturn the uh, 2013 Amendment Act. Uh, and that gave birth to the Coalition's 2014 Amending Act after that election promise. Now, the Coalition government got elected in 2013, uh, and clearly uh, they were doing the bidding of the chemical industry, uh, who wanted to make it even easier to register products. And uh, it's, taken, it's taken another seven years for this legislation to get before us today. So I'm not sure what is at the basis of the government's lethargy in relation to this bill. And I also note that this legislation has been on the, uh, on the papers in the Senate now for many, many months and is continually put to the back of government bills. But nevertheless, in, uh, in the final hours of the 2021 year, uh, we now have this bill before us. Um, there are a lot of concerns that a number of stakeholders uh, have with this bill. Uh, and the Greens have made it very clear in its earlier iteration uh, and my colleague, uh, Senator Janet Rice, who had the agricultural portfolio for the Greens back in 2019, that we don't support making it easier for large chemical companies to register products. Uh, we believe this is counterproductive, both for farmers uh, and both for community trust in the AgVet uh, and the uh, legislative framework we have in this country. Um, but let's be honest, this, this, this bill um, serves two purposes but one master. The first purpose is to uh, supposedly uh, improve the effectiveness and efficiency of regulation. The second purpose re-establishes a board for the APVMA. Both purposes serve the need of the pesticide industry. Uh, and it's been raised by a number of stakeholders, um, such as the, um, the National Toxics Network and Public Health Association of Australia, including in the uh, the Senate inquiry into this bill, um, that, these, that these changes are a recipe for further deregulation, uh, which we're, we're seeing in this bill. Uh, and this puts consumers at risk and undermines trust in the framework. Um, we believe it uh, puts at risk public health, uh, smaller farms, biodiversity, and the science of the process. Um, so the bill seeks to introduce a streamlined process for approvals. And the streamlined process, part of the codified double speak of uh, privatisation and neoliberalism, removes a whole subset of chemicals from the regulatory scheme. Big industry need is prioritised at the expense of scientific and environmental safeguards. Um, and I'd like to point out that um, I've used these chemicals myself, acting deputy president, as a as a as a vineyard as a as a vineyard owner and a small business operator. Um, I, over many years, uh, I tried to move my vineyard to biodynamic uh, farming from you know, the use of, in my early years, the use of things such as glycophosphate and Roundup uh, and, 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 and various pesticides uh, and insecticides that are covered in this bill. I've done my training to get certified to use uh, agricultural chemicals. In fact, I did many hours of training to try and understand uh, these, these bills. So my father was a farmer and often used uh, agricultural uh, chemicals, and many of the many of the uh, many of the of my friends who I went to school with uh, were farmers who have used these chemicals. And interestingly, at my 30-year school reunion, which I think shows my age, um, this issue was discussed. Uh, how many how many friends I went to school with who had lost their fathers to cancer, working on farms over many many years, uh, and there was a real concern about what caused that high level of cancer and whether it was exposure to using uh, crop chemicals, pesticides uh, and herbicides. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a real issue for farmers that have to use these chemicals every day. And they have to have a system and a framework uh, that they have trust in. So this bill would permit the APVMA to apply a disqualifying criteria to any application for new chemicals. But this criteria in this bill is poorly explained and opens up decision making to arbitrary judgment rather than defined scientific and public health analysis. Furthermore, even if disqualified through this mechanism, an applicant could still apply for approval and registration under other provisions 
of the AgVet Code. The bill proposes extending the protection period for protected information. This is essentially a copyright for chemicals. By extending the protection period, it means large corporations can monopolise chemicals, preventing farmers from accessing generic, cheaper goods. Given the financial pressures many farmers face, this also risks the prospect of more imported counterfeit products entering the market. And if these concerns are all in the bill's digest and they've been raised by very respected uh, stakeholders in this debate. Part four of the bill makes changes that restrict mandatory reporting to total, total chemical product quantities. In effect, this means that data on active constituents is lost. There are already limits in available data on chemicals in Australia, particularly on the relationship between cause and effect in relation to public health and their effectiveness. Further restrictions on data mean more risk of chemicals entering the market that are lacking in detailed information. The bill establishes a new board of the APVMA, and this has been one of the most controversial aspects uh, of this legislation, ostensibly to support the chief executive in terms of governance, governance of the APVMA. What the government is glossing over, however, is the fact that an advisory board already exists under the Administration Act, but they have failed to appoint positions on this board for a number of years. In fact, the last appointments expired in 2015. Now, why is this the case? This is a very good question for the minister to answer. The current advisory board gives plenty of scope for appointments to be made on the basis of experience in the regulation of chemical products, toxicology, consumer interests, public health, and work and health, OCH health, work and safety. It beggars belief that the government has consistently, and one can only assume deliberately, failed to fill a board designed to support all functions and aspects of the regulatory framework run by the APVMA. Um, I believe the board is a transparent attempt to stop the APVMA with industry figures. Now, I understand Labor, uh, in, in their contribution yesterday, the first speaker to this bill, said that they will they've expressed concerns, as they have uh, in, in the uh, in the light in their response to the latest piece of legislation, and I will, I will read this is in relation to the Rural and Regional Affairs Transport Committee. Um, the majority view of the committee was that the bill be passed. However, Australian Labor senators expressed their deep concerns about the policy rationale for the implementation of a governance board because, amongst other things, the APVMA governance board will not have the power to independently set APVMA strategic direction, drive its operational performance, set an appropriate risk management framework and ensure greater accountability. Under the proposed legislation, the minister will continue to have the power to direct the APVMA and will, provide, and will be provided with the power to direct the board in the performance of its functions. Therefore, it appears the government's board will just be another layer of regulation, which will be an additional cost to farmers. But also, my concern goes beyond the fact that this will just be another additional cost to farmers. Uh, it will be over whether the board is actually truly independent of the chemicals industry. Uh, and figures within this industry or advocacy groups that are lobbying for uh, uh, lower regulation and increased uh, or more rapid approvals of their products. Um, I would like to point out as a, as a kind of, uh, I suppose, a backdrop or a frame to this debate, Acting Deputy President, that groups of experts, such as the National Toxic Network, um, have made it very clear that Australia already has a very lax system of control of agricultural chemicals. Uh, and this would put it further out of step uh, with the EU, the US and Canada that are increasingly looking uh, at new research and information into key chemicals that we use on our farms and chemicals I've openly admitted that I used when I first started my vineyard, uh, such as, for example, Roundup or glycophosphate. And I have here before me new, new reports just out of the EU uh, in recent weeks uh, around the, the validity of uh, the science that has gone into uh, the registering of these products, uh, especially uh, around human safety for their use. Um, there's also been recent concerns raised in months, recent months around fipronil, a product that I also use to control European wasps on my vineyard that can have negative effects, especially on bee populations. These chemicals are being reviewed all around the world, yet in this bill before us today, we're going to be passing legislation that makes it even easier for chemicals such as these uh, especially if they're considered to be consumer chemicals 
uh, to be registered, uh, which I think I, I believe is totally unacceptable. And in fact, I believe many farmers, especially for small farmers and farmers that are looking to, uh, and my state is absolutely full of smaller farmers that are trying to grow uh, high, uh, high value uh, niche products that rely on a clean, green and clever brand. Um, the, any any deregulation uh, of agricultural chemicals is going to further put our industry and its reputation uh, at risk. So um, I think we need to be very clear here that this bill uh, is not uh, is not what is needed uh, for the Australian agricultural uh, industry, um, and uh, the Greens will be opposing it. Acting Deputy President, um, after neglecting AP, APVMA for so many years uh, with authority and their authoritative scientific advice. The government is seeking to elevate industry voices instead to progress their own agenda. Um, and I would uh, ask that people do read um, the uh, submissions that were made to the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee most recently on this bill and note the, um, the concerns of uh, experts in relation to protecting health, safety and the environment. And I'll just finish by saying the Greens will be opposing this bill as we did in 2009. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It gives me great pleasure um, to provide the second reading speech on behalf of the Agriculture Minister, uh, David Littleproud, with respect to this bill. Australians need access to safe and effective agricultural chemicals and veterinary medicines. They protect our crops, livestock and domestic pets, safeguard our environment for invasive weeds and pests, and meet consumer needs for things such as household insecticides. Agvet chemicals, as these products are commonly known, have brought long-term benefits to Australian agriculture by supporting increased productivity, better quality produce and more competitive industries. It is important that the regulation of Agvet chemicals continues to be streamlined to maximise the benefits for Australia. It is also imperative to ensure that the strong safeguards built into the regulation of Agvet chemicals are not compromised. Through a cooperative scheme with the states and territories, the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority the APVMA, is the national regulator of agvet chemicals up to and including the point of supply. The APVMA has an important role to ensure that agvet chemicals supplied in Australia are safe for people, animals, plants and the environment and don't adversely impact our trade market access. The APVMA needs to be both efficient and effective in its regulation of Agvet chemicals, and I thank the senators who have made contributions today to that effect. The bill supports these objectives by streamlining regulatory processes while strengthening the vital protections for health and safety of humans, animals and the environment. Given its vital role, the APVMA also requires robust governance arrangements that reflect modern practices for ensuring the accountability and performance of the regulator. The bill that supports this critical outcome by establishing the APVMA board and ceasing the advisory board. Legislation underpinning the APVMA and Agvet chemical regulation was developed in the 1990s and we have announced a comprehensive review of the whole legislative framework from first principles. In the meantime, however, the chemical industry has made it clear that there are simple, non-controversial changes that could be done right now to improve the efficiency of the Agvet chemical regulatory framework reduce some costs and increase the speed to which farmers can get access to safe and effective chemicals. The bill therefore includes measures to improve the administrative efficiency of the APVMA and promote quicker access to chemical products. This has been one of the key uh, issues that industry and stakeholders and primary producers have raised with us as a government time and time again and it is our government that is dealing with this. The measures in the bill reduce the regulatory burden for applicants on applications by increasing the APVMA's flexibility when dealing with minor errors in applications and for information that can be taken into account during an application. The bill will also en enable the APVMA to choose where appropriate to use computerised decision making as part of the processes, thereby increasing efficiency whilst maintaining appropriate checks and balances. Computerised decision making might be used, for example, in decisions involving an administrative check of an application. The bill also makes changes to enable the use of new, simpler processes for assessments based on risk. Specifically, the bill provides for new prescribed approval and registration processes that will be quicker and less costly than those that are currently available, whilst ensuring the chemicals assessed are safe and effective. These new processes 
will apply for those active constituents, um, chemical products and labels that require minimal or no assessment of technical information and retain the requirement that the active or product meets the relevant statutory criteria, including in relation to safety of human, plants, animals and the environment. This measure has the potential to free up the time of the APVMA assessors so they can actually focus on more complex assessments. The bill also removes the need for industry to undertake two unrelated reporting activities, one for levies based on chemical product sales and a more complex reporting activity on active constituent quantities. It simplifies and aligns these reporting processes based on the quantity and value of product sales. This significantly reduces reporting costs for industry without compromising the availability of information for our international reporting obligations and policy development needs. The chemical industry has been seeking changes to these burdensome reporting requirements uh, for some time, and the bill delivers on those changes. The bill also provides for incentives for registration holders to include on product labels certain uses of chemical products that they do not ordinarily register. Similar to the approaches applied internationally, the incentives in the bill operate by extending data protection periods on information for up to five years if certain priority users are included on the labels. These extensions would be prescribed in the regulations. Based on the experience of these incentives overseas, it will encourage more priority users on labels, including minor users, where the costs of adding the use are not justified by the additional commercial returns to chemical manufacturers. This will significantly benefit Australian farmers. Don't believe Senator Ayres' rhetoric. Other measures in the bill enable the holder of an approval or registration to vary the approval or registration while it is suspended. This will ensure that the issue identified that led to the suspension of the approval or registration can be appropriately rectified at the holder's request. The bill also makes changes to strengthen the integrity of the regulatory framework. To perform its role, the regulator of the AP the APVMA has to rely on information provided to it by applicants. The bill provides the APVMA with a broader suite of sanctions that will allow it to proportionally respond to any false or misleading information it receives. This includes both administrative sanctions and civil pecuniary penalties. Uh, industry understands the importance of increasing the range of compliance options available to the APVMA. The bill further bolsters the integrity of the system by harmonising the need to inform the APVMA of new information, including information that shows the substance may no longer meet the safety, require, re, sorry, the safety criteria across all holders and applicants. The bill also includes measures to improve risk communication uh, about chemical products. This increases the integrity and transparency of voluntary recalls of AgVet chemicals and modernises the legislation so the reporting obligations are very clear for persons recalling these chemicals. Importantly, the bill also introduces a five-person skill-based governance board for the APVMA. This board will provide the APVMA with additional skills and experience to deliver an increasingly accountable, efficient and effective organisation. Currently, all responsibility for the APVMA's strategic lead leadership, governance and day-to-day -day operation rest with the Chief Executive Officer. The CEO is therefore responsible for setting, implementing and monitoring the APVMA's policies without any other direct support. This is an unreasonable and unsustainable management burden on the CEO that is not effective or efficient for the APVMA's successful long-term operation and ongoing improvement. The board will be accountable. Um, as an authority under the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act. It will ensure the proper, efficient and effective performance of the APVMA's functions and determine the policies, objectives and strategies that the APVMA will follow. In addition, the board will play an important role in implementing the outcomes of the government's comprehensive review of the whole AgVet okay. legislative framework from first principles. The board appointed by the Minister for Agriculture, David Littleproud, will consist of a chair, the APVMA CEO and three other members selected on the basis of their skills. Board members will be appointed on a part-time basis. The CEO is included as an ex officio board member to support informed and collective decision-making and ensure the board's policies are effectively integrated into day-to-day -day operations. The APVMA will continue to deliver independent and evidence-based decisions. The board will oversee how the APVMA does its job by establishing and monitoring the framework under which it operates. Day-to-day -day administration and decision-making, such as registering individual chemical products and undertaking compliance and enforcement activities, will remain 
the responsibility of the APVMA CEO. The APVMA is one of the few corporate Commonwealth entities that doesn't have a governance board to ensure um, corporate compliance and management accountability. All other Commonwealth regulatory entities with direct responsibility for protecting human life and or health have governance boards. So this is a, a great reform. The board model chosen by the government is comparable with other corporate Commonwealth entities and with private sector companies. Its proposed size, comparison, uh, sorry, size, composition, role, functions, duties and powers conform to Commonwealth policies as well as modern best practice guidance on corporate governance. Board members will be required to have appropriate qualifications, skills or experience in financial management, law, risk management, public sector governance, science and or public health. The board will be able to establish committees to assist it perform its functions and exercise its powers. And these committees will provide a mechanism to seek input from and engage directly with industry stakeholders and other experts as required. The bill provides transparency around ministerial directions to the board. Any written directions made to the board by the minister will be notifiable instruments with the particulars and effects of these directions reported to the APVMA's annual report. The bill additionally requires a review of the operation of the board after four years to ensure it is actually being effective and efficient. The bill also ceases the existing APVMA advisory board. The advisory board had no legislative power to direct a particular course of action and has not been operational since 2015. Further measures in the bill clarifying meanings or addressing de deficiencies or inconsistencies in relation to the regulation of AgVet chemicals, which is great to see. These are largely minor issues. However, when considered together, they improve the overall operational efficiency of the APVMA. The measures in the bill represent a considered approach to improving ag AgVet legislation and have been developed through a program of engagement with all stakeholders. The board measures have been developed through a process of detailed, targeted consultation with stakeholders directly affected by the AFP VMA's governance. Other measures in the bill have also been consulted on publicly, and this has confirmed uh, that these measures will deliver benefits to industry, the regulator and the broader community. The bill will improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the national system for regulating agrovet chemicals while strengthening its integrity and positioning the APVMA to become a modern and sustainable regulator. It will ensure that safe and effective agrovet chemicals can continue to be available uh, to our community now and into the future. A more efficient regulator will deliver flow-on benefits to the APVMA's clients, including improved client services, uh, reduced regulatory burden, which will reduce the cost of doing business. I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of the minister, all those involved, uh, as is made noted in comments uh, today by both sides of the chamber. This has been a long process, and we believe we've got the settings right. Um, and the APVMA is a great example of our government's commitment to decentralise uh, government services to the regions, closer to the communities that they serve. And history has borne out that, whilst controversial at the time, Moving the APVMA to Armidale has been a benefit not just to the agency but to the broader uh, community and hasn't actually resulted in some of the perceived challenges um, by those who opposed it. I would like to thank previous ministers Joyce uh, and the current minister, Minister Littleproud, for ensuring uh, that this fantastic bill gets the support of the Senate to hopefully pass today with amendment. Uh, thank you, Minister. So the question is that um, the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I'm going to put it again because I only heard one voice. So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Chris want to make these? Yeah. Uh, stop the bell. So the question is that the second reading uh, amendment, uh, the second reading, be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and seven noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I understand that. <coughs> I'll call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to agricultural and veterinary chemicals and for related purposes. And I understand that there is a committee stage. I'll just wait for the papers. Yes. 
Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Thank you. The amendments. Um, listed on the circ circulated in the uh, chamber, Schedule 1, item 22, 25, and 36. They don't appear to be the ones I've got, but just checking. So, Minister, if I could clarify, I understand you're seeking leave to move one to four. One on to sheet. four on sheet TK188. Yes. Uh, is, by leave and altogether. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Is Senator Farrell, are you seeking the call? Senator McKim. Um, Deputy President, I uh, understand that Senator Wish Wilson is seeking the call just to ask a couple Thank of questions. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, uh, Deputy, Deputy President. Um, Minister, I, I raised in my in my second reader contribution that um, the advisory board for APVMA already exists under the previous administration act, uh, but the government has has failed to appoint positions to this board uh, for a number of years. The last appointments expired in 2015. Um, do you agree with this? And can you explain to the chamber why? Uh, there's been no appointments to this board now for the last six years. Just um, before I call the minister, Senator Shulson, your uh, sound is coming across quite muffled. But I, I think that minister did understand what you were asking. But if not, she can seek clarification. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Senator. Were you <laughs> asking me if I agreed in setting up? Um, the board, as proposed in the bill, and asking why the government hadn't appointed anybody to the advisory board over recent years. Is that yes, I'm, I'm seeing nods. Oh. Um, yes, I absolutely agree with setting up uh, this board as the appropriate model of governance. Uh, every single uh, other Commonwealth entity of, of this type has a similar governance arrangement as we're proposing in this bill. Uh, so I think it will uh, give the right level of oversight and accountability and transparency, and also ensure uh, that the role of the CEO of the APVMA um, can focus on that day-to-day -day duties uh, and leave that uh, largely governance oversight to the appropriate mechanism in the board. Uh, as to why um, vacant positions on the advisory board uh, that has existed in the past haven't been filled. Uh, obviously, that's been a decision of government. Um, and as you know, that currently there's a nine-person advisory board. It had no legislative powers to direct any course of action. Um, so, it being in existence or not, didn't actually result in any um, direct um, kind of uh, specific actions out of the CEO. So the, the course we've taken um, is appropriate. It's taken a, a, some time to get agreement to the changes that we've proposed, and, and they're before the Senate now, and, and rightfully uh, we're looking for the Senate to support. President, Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President. Um, yeah, sorry, Minister. You, um, you haven't explained why the government haven't appointed these positions previously. Um, so can I, can I just ask you again um, why in the last six years there's been no appointments? I understand why you're setting the board up now, but why, why didn't you use the previous act to Minister. set up appointments to help the uh, CEO of the APVMA? Minister. Um, well, as I said in my previous answer, it, two reasons. A decision of uh, government and, and specifically um, current and previous agriculture ministers, as I said, um, 
The advisory board had no legislative powers to direct any course of action. Um, the APVMA already has the ability to consult with stakeholders without that advisory board. As such, while the advisory board created considerable costs, it didn't actually serve that necessarily uh, regulatory function, and the government made the decision to cease the board on this basis, and that is uh, why we're now putting in uh, the actual governance board that we are. Because, as I said early, my earlier, it was a decision of government, and the advisory board, as it stood, couldn't direct in a way that um, you may think it might have. Uh, Senator well, Wish Wilson. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Well, it may have if it was set up, um, but I, you, you mentioned it was a decision of government. But, um, I wanted to raise the concerns that were raised by the Labor Party and the Greens in relation to the. Um, the inquiry in 2019 at the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee. Um, the APVMA Governance Board will not have the power to independently set APVMA strategic direction, drive its operational performance, set an appropriate risk management framework and ensure greater, account greater accountability. Under the proposed legislation, the minister will continue to have the power to direct the APVMA and will be provided with the power to direct the board in the performance of its functions. Um, is this still the case with this legislation today? Will the minister be able to direct the APVMA board, governance board, uh, once it's set up? Yes. Yes. Minister. Senator, um, the minister will still be able to direct the APVMA governance board. Um, I wait for the call, what? Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. Sorry, there might be a bit of a lag there. Yep, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm just wondering why, why, why I understand this is designed to assist the APVMA's, um, you know, CEO. Um, but what, what's the point of appointing a board with various levels of expertise if, if the minister can still, can still direct it in, in relation, for example, to its strategic direction, its operational performance, its risk management framework and its accountability. Um, and w will, will decisions of this board be made public and will there be transparency around what it advises the minister? Minister. Uh, the, the minister can already direct the uh, chief executive officer and there's a range of other functions that the board uh, will be um, conducting. Um, and all the directions of the minister will be published in the annual report. So there won't be a heavy level of direction, I imagine, um, from current or future ministers. Senator Wish Wilson. Yes, thank you, Deputy President. Um, so the directions of a minister might be published in annual reports, but will the advice of the new APVMA board be also made public? Will, their, will the minutes of their meetings be subject to order of production of documents? Or other, or other, uh, other processes. Minister, I see it is just um, the directions from the minister that will be published in the annual report. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Look, there, there was concern raised. Um, in fact, over many, we went through it in our second reader over the many. Um, reviews we've had over the years. The previous uh, Senate committee um, inquiry into the 2019 legislation, uh, the inquiry into this legislation, that this APV, APVMA board might be stacked uh, by the minister or by the government, especially in favour of industry. Um, and that you may be aware, Minister, there was criticisms, uh, in fact, the very strong criticisms raised in relation to Minister Littleproud's first principles review. Um, he appointed a panel of export experts um, into this issue and, of course, that review has led to this legislation today. What assurances can you give that the uh, construction of this board, the co what it, who's, who constitutes the advice, is going to be independent of industry? And by that I mean I mean the chemical industry that make that make these 
uh, veterinary and, and other chemicals and are applying for registration. Minister. The second reading speech. This will be a skill-based board. Um, this is a body, a regulatory body that actually regulates chemicals, so not to actually hear, take on and listen to advice of those involved uh, in that industry wouldn't result in uh, functional regulation into the future. So um, we need to make sure that the regulation of agvet chemicals in this country is safe, it's sustainable, it's uh, good for human health, it's good for um, uh, animal health and it's good for the environment. And that's exactly uh, what this advisory board skill set will do. They also obviously need to have a range of skills, including risk management and, and public governance. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Minister. Uh, sorry, Deputy President. Um, Minister, going back to that, um, the first principles review by a panel of experts, much of which has been used uh, to, has been incorporated into the legislation today. Um, are you aware of concerns that um, the industry's, you know, the panel's mandate prioritise costs to industry over the environment? And there were there were questions raised over the um, over its chair, uh, Ken Matthews. Um, I, I know myself and others have asked questions about this in Senate estimates. And Mr Matthews himself has publicly acknowledged these concerns about potential conflicts of interest. He was chair of, uh, recently the chair of Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia, uh, whose members include some of the biggest producers of chemicals and importers and users of pesticides, including Crop Life Australia, Oz Biotech, and uh, obviously the National Farmers Federation was part of that. Um, you know, he acknowledged that environment groups were cranky about his appointment, but he also, I think in fairness, said he didn't believe the industry was pleased with this report. Um, what assurances can you give us that this panel, uh, given Mr Little Proud's record in relation to the, the panel of review, will be independent of industry? Minister. I've already answered, um, Senator, the fact that this will be a skill-based board. Um, and that industry is a, an important voice within the regulation of these uh, types of products. I hope you're not suggesting that the APVMA doesn't use the very, very best regulatory science on which to base its decision about the safe uh, and sustainable uh, regulation of agricultural and veterinary ch chemicals in this country. Uh, internationally, Australian is known uh, for basing its decision around these matters on science and that underpins so much of our um, successful trading relationships, particularly in ag agricultural products. So I've already answered uh, the question with respect to the skill set of the board. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I did raise in my second reader speech as well, uh, Minister, that um, expert groups such as the National Toxics Network, which is full of basically made up of scientists, um, believe Australia has a very lax system of control of agricultural chemicals, um, and we're, we're out of lockstep with other countries such as EU, US and Canada. Uh, and for example, recently um, there's new information coming to light. I always leave these things to the scientific process, Minister. Um, I don't criticise scientists. I think it's their job through a scientific process to constantly be critiquing each other's independent, hopefully independent research. Um, but you may be aware uh, that only, uh, actually only last Friday, so a couple of days ago, there was a new report out of the EU uh, that l highlighted that only two out of 11 herbicide studies uh, given to EU regulators are now deemed reliable. So nine out of uh, 11 studies that were used for the regulation of these chemicals on further review under the scientific process uh, have been shown uh, to be unreliable in terms of looking at the impacts on, on human health. Um, so, look, I can send you a copy of that report. If I was there, I would, table, I would seek to table it. Um, but my point is these things are an ongoing... The scientific process is an ongoing process, uh, and it is, a, it is a factual point and a point of significant controversy, uh, both in Australia and elsewhere, that industry um, contributes and pays to research studies into its own products. Um, my question uh, on this on this line of question on this in the, the theme that I've just raised, Minister, 
Um, I, 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 I meant what I said in my second reader speech very seriously about farmers being at risk, the most at risk cohort in human health uh, from the use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, of course, they can have broader environmental impacts when they get into rivers and streams and uh, it impacts, uh, potentially impacts soil health, something I was very familiar with as a, as a grape grower myself. Um, has there been any studies done uh, looking at farmers as a cohort um, and cancer, cancer rates in the farming communities versus other, versus other controls or other, uh, other, other parts of our community? Has there been any health impact studies on farmers who use these chemicals more than anyone else? Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Senator, um, you've traversed this particular broad topic in many Senate inquiries, in, um, not just related to this bill. Your question in no way uh, relates to the bill before the Senate today. Um, and the whole point of having a body like the APVMA and a, an efficient and effective regulatory framework means that uh, primary producers across the country will be safely able to use uh, chemicals um, on farm. Senator Wish Wilson. President, um, I, I'd ask you to reconsider your response there, Minister. The, the question I'm asking is absolutely critical and pivotal and fundamental to this, this uh, questioning that, or this bill that we have before us today. Um, no one's impacted more by potential health impacts from the use of herbicides and pesticides than farmers. I mean, they are used in. Um, you know, weed control by, by local governments, and there are other cohorts who use them, but essentially farmers are the key people that are using these products. So if there is a, if there is a lax system or a, a, a sub-optimal or substandard system for registering products that could potentially be dangerous to human health, then that is exactly what we are debating today. So I'd ask that you reconsider that. And I'll ask the question again, has there been any studies done uh, on cancer rates in farmers uh, versus control or other community cohorts. Senator Wish Wilson, do you have any further questions? I think, unless I have a second voice, President, I probably won't get to ask any more than one more question. But I'll just, I'll just put this on record, President, that I, I, I Deputy President. Um, and up these, these criticisms, yes, you're right, uh, Senator McKenzie, but the Greens have raised this, these questions and these issues over many years. Um, I haven't, however, because I've been, I'm new to the portfolio within the Greens. Uh, but from my own personal experiences as a grape farmer, having used these chemicals, and um, all my mates I went to boarding school with were farmers, and I, I know that this is a significant matter of interest amongst the farming community. Um, they're the users of these products. You have, of course, the producers on the other side who manufacture them and want to get them to market and make as much money as possible. And then in between, you have scientists and other experts. My point that I'll finish on is it's not the APV, APVMA here I'm criticising, Minister. It's your government. Uh, you've taken seven years to bring this legislation before the parliament today. I'm not sure why there's been a lack of urgency to get this legislation passed. I'm not sure why it sat on the notice paper for months and months and months and always been pushed to the bottom of the pile. Um, I think farmers' health, um, as well as the health of the environment and the health of our ecosystems, is, a, is, a, is an absolutely critical, acute thing that we need to be debating and addressing. And I feel, and my party feel, and many uh, stakeholders out there feel that today is a missed opportunity to have that debate and that serious debate. Um, and I would uh, put on record that I, I know Labor were moving an amendment today, uh, and I understand that amendment's been withdrawn, uh, and they've come to some arrangement with the government, um, and they're leaving this to your, I suppose, your discretion as to how you appoint that board. Um, but I have no faith uh, that your government will prioritise the interests of farmers and public health and the environment over the interests of big industry. Uh, I think that's always been your your modus operandi since I can remember. Thank you, Acting De Thank you, Deputy President. 
So the question is that um, items one to four on sheet TK188, as moved by the minister. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill stand as I beg your pardon. The question is that the bill now be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Legislation Amendment, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority Board and other improvements, Bill 2019, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move the bill as amended and the report be adopted. So the question is that the a motion to adopt the report be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. <laughs> and I'd like to move the third reading. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bell. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the noes. Order. There being 27 ayes and 7 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to agricultural and veterinary chemicals and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number 3, Telstra Corporation and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. And I am looking for Senator Keneally, unless Senator Farrell is taking the call. Is this the are we on to the Telstra? Yes, Telstra Corporation. Yep, thank you. Yep. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I um, rise to um, speak on the Telstra Corporation and other legislation amendment bill and uh, indicate at the outset that Labor supports uh, this bill. Um, and I'd like to begin with a quote. It's good to see that the National Party have extracted this deal. Oh, what's happened to Senator Mackenzie? She's disappeared. The National Party has used this position of leverage to get both the money on the table and the legislation on the table to fix the problems. Uh, that is what the National Party does. We are a few in number, but we managed to extract a deal. And I sit here today with my colleagues proud of what we have achieved. Senators may wonder when this statement was made and by whom. In fact, it was made on the 14th of September um, 2005 during the second, second reading of the uh, Telstra transition to full private ownership bill by the now Deputy Prime Minister. This was the last step in Senator Barnaby Joyce's selling out to the Liberals and agreeing to the privatisation of Telstra as a vertical integrated monopoly a process which we began in 1996. It was a dark day for infrastructure investment and a bad day for competition policy and for common sense. It was a day when uh, we were told the regulatory obligations imposed on Telstra would serve the public interest and deliver the service and infrastructure investment that Australia ne uh, Australians needed. As we now know, those assurances from the then uh, Senator Joyce turned out to be non-existent. Telstra is no longer a vertically inter integrated monopoly because after a decade of dithering by the coalition, the uh, Labor Party structurally separated it. We did so in the national interest and in the name of competition policy. The bill currently before the Senate arises from Telstra as a private entity seeking to restructure its business to better align the management and operation of its assets with the T22 strategy. This time, the restructuring is one that Telstra is pursuing of its own accord rather than in response to governments. Telstra has publicly stated its plan to restructure their company into separate legal entities. Those entities include Telstra Group, Infraco, Tower Co and Serve Co. 
These entities will hold different classes of assets and operate at different layers of the network. The explanatory memorandum notes that Telstra does not require legislative change or government approval to un undertake the restructure. However, without legislative and regulatory change, a range of key obligations that apply to Telstra would become ineffective or cease to apply to the successor entities. As such, my understanding uh, is that this bill primarily seeks to address three key issues that arise from Telstra's proposed restructure. Firstly, to re uh, repoint Telstra-specific obligations that would otherwise cease to apply to new Telstra entities to the entities in the Telstra group. Second, to introduce a ministerial directions power that enables the Minister of the Day to direct the demerger, demerged Telstra entities into fulfilling its existing regulatory obligations or assist in the delivery of the obligations of uh, another Telstra entity. This can include cooperation between entities to fulfil regulatory obligations or to uphold obligations in the NBN Telstra definitive uh, agreements. Third, the bill has been drafted to ensure the facilities access framework has its integrated uh, integrity upheld and that the restructuring does not in inadvertently move assets outside the scope of the uh, regime. Furthermore, the explanatory memorandum uh, of the bill states, the bill has been developed on the principle of regulatory equivalence. That is, the regulatory obligations that currently fall on Telstra should also fall on the entities in the new corporation, uh, corporate group in roughly the same way. While Telstra is free to restructure its businesses as it uh, sees fit, successive parliaments uh, have placed and maintained a range of obligations on that business and, and it's important that these remain effective. It is an appropriate principle which Labor supports. However, la Labor not interpret this to mean equivalence is purely a technical or legalistic sense, but in a practical sense too. That is the lens we have put on the bill. Based on briefings Labor has received from the Department of Infrastructure and Communications and from Telstra, we are satisfied that the proposed measures in the bill give effect to regulatory equivalence. And in circumstances where unforeseen issues could arise, the bill affords the minister the necessary direction making powers to deal with them. There has clearly been a lot of technical consideration put into this bill and Labor thanks those who have provided briefings. It should also be noted that Telstra has been proactive in identifying employment related issues and bringing them to the attention of policy makers. Separate instruments in the uh, Senate are dealing uh, with the grandfathering of employment uh, benefits for Telstra employees and based uh, consultations um, with uh, unions. Labor is satisfied uh, that those issues are being adequately dealt with. As such, Labor will support the bill. Uh, talk about the uh, structure of Telstra, the MBN and its regulatory obligation conjures up many memories. We would be hard pressed to find a group of people more unqualified on broadband technology and the telecommunications policy than the current Morrison Joyce Liberal National Party coalition. In the mid-1990s, the Liberal National Government began the process of privatising Telstra as a verti vertically integrated Thank you, monopoly. Senator Farrell. The time for this debate has now expired oh. and we'll move to Senator's statements and I'll call Senator Bragg. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a statement about the Senate committee system uh, and its engagement on a particular issue. Um, I think it's a very troubling precedent that we've seen in this place over the last week where the Senate has voted to uh, close down a legitimate area of inquiry. And I'm talking about the inquiry into the ABC's complaints handling system, which has been, has been deferred, effectively thereby cancelled. Um, the Senate committee system, uh, which was uh, put in place permanently in 1970. Uh, and of course, last year uh, we uh, reflected upon the 50th anniversary of that system. Uh, I would say gives Australian people the greatest possible access to our democracy. And it is a 
incredibly successful system in that it provides for scrutiny of government. And there has been much legitimate debate about uh, corruption and about integrity issues, uh, as you would expect in a country like Australia. I often think that the debate misses the point that there are strong integrity measures that are already in existence. You do have an Auditor General. You do have parliamentary scrutiny. You have parliamentary scrutiny through the Senate estimates and through those standing committees which were first established in 1970 during the Gorton government. Now, the, um, Stephen Holt wrote a very interesting piece about 10 years ago about the history of this system. Um, and uh, Jim Hodges, I think, was the first person who proposed this system in the 50s. Uh, but it was adopted, as I said, in 1970, and I think uh, largely at the behest of uh, Lionel Murphy and some others uh, that have put in place this system, which of course is modelled on the US committee system, uh, which Odgers himself uh, went to study in the United States. And so I think this is a, a system that uh, everyone would agree has served the country very well. And I think we want to be mindful, mindful I should say, of the precedents we set. We need to be very careful that we don't walk back scrutiny, we don't walk back accountability, because the principle here is that uh, any government agency that receives an appropriation is accountable to the Senate, is accountable to the Senate committee system. And that is an important principle which I think uh, we all should be very careful that we preserve, because after all we are the custodians of this system. And so I regret uh, that uh, this judgment was made, although I respect the judgment, uh, and I think we should reflect upon the, the policy contribution of these committees as well. It's not just scrutiny of government, it's also uh, been through the often the select committees over the past 50 years. Uh, that significant policy developments have followed. Scrutiny of government, freedom of information, the metric system was sent to a select committee. Uh, there was a very long-running committee into superannuation, although I may have a, a different view about how that's all landed. But the reality is these committees have done very significant policy development and they've also done very important scrutiny of government. Uh, I would say that the worst thing uh, that we do in Canberra is the run of the run of the mill question time stuff. I mean, there is not a a person that you can find that would say that is a good use of taxpayers' funds. But I would say the best thing that we do is through the committees. The committees, the committees uh, do provide a high level of collegiality. They do provide an opportunity for policy development, and they do provide an opportunity for government agencies and the government itself to be scrutinised. So um, that is why I've asked to have this time today uh, to make the point that the Senate voting against having an inquiry into a government agency which receives an appropriation, I think, is a very, da very dangerous precedent indeed. Now, the, the terms of reference for this particular inquiry, uh, which was conducted, to be conducted through the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee, was established under Standing Order 252AV, and it was to look at the adequacy of the existing arrangements on the accessibility, responsiveness, and efficiency of complaints handling. Now, this has nothing to do uh, with uh, anything other than that. It has nothing to do with editorial independence, as some have argued. Uh, it has nothing to do with internal interference. It has to do with how a Commonwealth-funded agency deals with the public. Um, that has nothing to do with editorial, editorial independence, which is preserved under the ABC's Act and under the Charter and under the editorial standards. I don't think anyone of any political stripe uh, would ever want to interfere with that, although we may at times be disappointed with the coverage. The reality is that there are many groups in our community that are unhappy with the complaints handling function of this agency. 
um, and that is a matter of public record. You only need to look at uh, what um, some multicultural groups have to say, what some veterans groups have to say, uh, what many individuals have to say, and uh, that is that they are unhappy with the way that their complaints are handled. Either they have not been treated seriously or they have not been answered in a timely manner or mistakes have been made on, on a repeated basis. So I, I would say that um, this quite extraordinary intervention from the ABC um, asking the Senate not to do something uh, is a really, really risky precedent for the Senate and for the committee system. Um, it is not a highly unusual inquiry. I mean, there are already three or four similar inquiries being conducted through legislation committees where they are reviewing the performance of government agencies. Um, so it is not a highly unusual inquiry. Um, uh, equally, um, it is not a very good principle for officials um, appointed by the government to be trying to direct the elected parliament in any way. I mean, sure, people are entitled to provide their, their advice, but the explicit nature of how this was done, I think, is, is very dangerous in a democracy like Australia. Um, I don't think that uh, any government agency should be trying to force the elected parliament to do anything um, other than provide advice which is frank and fearless. Um, I think that sort of direct politicisation uh, is very risky and, as I said, I regret very much uh, the precedent that has been set here. So uh, the, the Senate committee system is one of the strongest institutions in our democracy and it ought to be protected and defended by all. Uh, there, are there are legitimate issues here that the Senate committee was proposing to look into uh, in a very surgical manner, and I think that is entirely legitimate. And so I regret uh, the judgment that has been made, and I place on record that I think that uh, this is a precedent that people will regret, uh, because closing down the House of Review's capacity to conduct legitimate inquiry into taxpayer-funded organisations uh, is a very important role for this Senate. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Carr. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to speak about the passing of Emeritus Laureate Professor Stuart McIntyre. And unfortunately, I was unable to attend his funeral, which was held in Melbourne yesterday. On the 22nd of November, Australia lost one of its greatest and most prodigious historians and public intellectuals. Stuart McIntyre, who died of cancer at the age of 74, was preeminently a historian of the left. But as the tributes to him from colleagues of all political persuasions testify, his scholarship was academically rigorous and never merely partisan in its approach. That did not stop him being a target in the so-called history wars. And because he defended the dis discipline of history as an inquiry into truth, an inquiry into the events and attitudes of the past that have made us the people we are today, an inquiry that must be conducted without shrinking from those aspects of our past that cannot be raised. Conservative critics derided this as the black armband view of Australian history. Stuart, on the other hand, was not intimidated by such a label. Instead, he pointed to what those who used this term were actually doing. In his book, The History Wars, he wrote, in submitting history to a loyalty test, they are debasing it. In his lectures to the generations of students and the numerous articles and books, Stuart's taught that acknowledging the truth about the past is the first and most necessary step in building a better future. Graham Davidson, another celebrated historian, was quoted in a uh, bit in the Australian recently and talked of Stuart as a quote, first and foremost a scholar with a deep devotion to his craft. He read constantly and widely. He resisted dogma, political and intellectual. His friendships transcended the political alignments and intellectual fashions. 
He wrote elegantly, with as much sympathy and insight about Victorian Liberals as he did about the Communist trade union officials. Another uh, obit by Michael Lazarus, who wrote in the Jacobin magazine, describes Stewart as more than a writer and a researcher. His encyclopedic knowledge of Australia and working class history was equalled only by his generosity as a teacher. He gave his time freely and magnanimously, and his dedication to imparting his knowledge and advice reflected the very best of 20th century traditions of the left. Now, I can testify to the truth of those personally, by personal experience. I found him to be an inspiring teacher. I was one of Stuart's students at the University of Melbourne, and he was supervised my master's thesis on the factional mobilisation in the 1930s Victorian Labor Party. He was a mentor who became a lifelong friend. Stuart was an intellectual activist. He dedicated his time unselfishly outside of the university's duties, which of course, he, whether it be on the Victorian and national libraries, the Academy of the Humanities or the Review of History and Civics curriculum, or as an editor, or on the Heritage Council of Victoria, or as president of the Historic Association. He was a willing participant in political campaigns to defend democratic values. He was chair of the Biased is Bad News Committee during the time of the Kerner government in Victoria, and more recently, he was chair of the International Brigade's Memorial Committee. The long list of Stuart's books includes several that can be deservedly called landmarks. Some would say that his greatest work is the two-volume history of the Communist Party of Australia. His first volume, The Reds, the Communist Party of Australia, From the Origins to Illegality, is regarded as a definitive text on the CPA. Now, it's not a dry narrative of branch meetings and party congresses of speeches and resolutions carried and lost. Above all else, it is a history of people who were, who became communists. It tells us their individual stories, illuminating their life experiences that led them to make their political choices. Stuart, for many years, was a member of the Communist Party, which he joined as an undergraduate. In later time, he, of course, joined the Labor Party and he when he returned from his postgraduate studies at Cambridge. The second volume of his history the, on Australian communism, the party, the Communist Party of Australia, from heyday to reckoning, will be published in February next year. And when it appears, I'll be no doubt it'll be widely read amongst his peers in the histo history profession. It will be both earnestly and appreciatively criticised by some of them. Stuart will have expected no less, and his judgment on who uh, and, and regard to the history of the CP uh, I think will probably be amongst his greatest work, and that claim will probably stand the test of time. For me, as in other of his books, at least was his contribution to the understanding of Australia's national story. Australia's boldest experiment, the War and Reconstruction, is a history of the country in the 1940s. Specifically, it tells how the Curtin and Chifley governments set out to build a nation that was both more equal and more prosperous than the one that had gone to war in 1939. The Department of National Reconstruction was created in 1942, and what ended in the Pacific War was not even in sight. And most uh, people who criticised the government's decision to begin work on reconstruction at the time uh, were, of course, uh, whereas when the country was in such immediate danger. But the decision was vindicated by the policies that led to the public investment in manufacturing and housing and social activity and in universities and the social agencies. It was Australia that was transformed by a vision and the achievements of the Curtin and Chifley governments. Vision and achievements, of course, that stand in good stead to us today. Stuart wrote many books, but here I want to make note about one more, and that is, of course, uh, the matters in regard to his history of uh, concise history of Australia. Uh, and it's a short book, but it has run into five editions, the most recently, of course, in 2020. It lays bare the national story, its triumphs and its failures. And above all, it's told in a lucid and elegant prose, which cannot be said of every work of academic history. Stuart's socialism drew him into the course of Australian history rather than separating it from him and from that history. He lived a view that history is never an ending dialogue between the past and the present. Stuart McIntyre, I believe, can aptly be compared with Manning Clark, both as a prodigious, extensive knowledge of Australian history and, and both who wrote with erudition, and they took their erudition lightly. 
Stuart's writing was in the tradition of the great British historiography of the Whig or the liberal historians such as George Trelevin and Thomas Macaulay, or even E.H. Carr. He shared with, its, uh, with the socialist historian Eric Hobsbawm a view that history cannot be subdivided into narrow specialist fields that lost sight of the great narratives of social development. Great historians write in a way that readily appeals to a wider readership, even in the works that are addressed to academic peers. And I repeat, in this regard, Stuart was one such great historian. With the passing of Stuart McIntyre, we have lost a great Australian. I extend my condolences to his wife, Martha, and to his daughters, Mary and Jessie, and for all those who knew and loved him. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. We're about to finish another year in the Senate. I became a senator seven and a half years ago. Seven years in one job, one place, one relationship is often when you ask yourself whether it's time to move on, time to question whether what you are doing is really the most important thing, the most worthwhile thing to be doing. I've been doing that in recent months and reflecting on the great unfinished business of my time here. In my first speech in, my, in this place, I said that my agenda for my time here was clear. I said that I wanted to be able to look my grandchildren in the eye and tell them that it was during my time in the Senate that Australia turned the corner and legislated to begin the shift to a zero carbon safe climate economy. Sadly, seven and a half years on, I do not see us much closer. I mean, finally, we've got a government that has been dragged kicking and screaming to commit to a target of net zero by 2050, but hasn't got the short-term targets, any meaningful target for 2030 to support that, and hasn't begun that shift to be shifting our economy away from coal and gas and oil to renewable energy. And we've got a Labor Party that is prevaricating and resisting setting science-based targets because of the influence of the coal and the gas and the oil companies. We know what the science says. If we are going to have a better than even chance of keeping the world below 1.5 degrees hotter than pre-industrial levels, then we need to be acting urgently, not just talking about it, but acting to be slashing our carbon pollution. In the science says to have a better than even chance to keep below 1.5 degrees, Australia should be reducing our carbon pollution by 74 per cent by 2030. It's slashing our pollution by three quarters in the next nine years. I met with leading Australian climate scientists yesterday who briefed me on the most recent report of the International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Shane McGregor and Julie Arblaster from Monash Uni, Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick from the University of New South Wales, and Andrew King from Melbourne Uni. I wanted, I wanted to name them because our Australian climate scientists are absolute heroes. They are at the coalface, to use a very appropriate metaphor. They are sitting in the fire. They can see their science is saying this is how the world is unfolding. The world is now 1.1 degrees hotter than it was before we started belching carbon into the atmosphere in great amounts. At current trajectories and countries' commitments to reduce carbon pollution, we are still headed for more than three degrees of, of heating. And what Shane, Julie, Sarah and Andrew told me yesterday was sobering. Unless we take serious action to slash our carbon pollution, we are facing a pretty horrific increase in extreme heat events, in extreme fires, in drought conditions, the ongoing rise in sea level that is already washing away our coastlines. I don't know about you, but every time I visit any beach around the country, I am horrified by the level of coastal erosion. That, my friends, is climate, our climate crisis at work. And yesterday, I was shown a diagram that showed that a very small increase in sea level, just a few centimetres, can lead to the sea retreating tens, if not hundreds of metres. That's a lot of coastal land that's being lost. But sadly, all that is very consistent with what I laid out in my first speech, where I said, 
We are major contributors to the world being on track to being four degrees hotter in my children's lifetime. Without urgent and meaningful action, it will not be possible to grow food crops across vast swathes of the world. In Australia, the climate of the wheat-growing areas like Dubbo will become like the central Australian desert. And extreme heat waves will occur every 10 years instead of every 100, more extreme than the heat wave Southern Australia experienced in 2009 that resulted in the Black Saturday bushfires and the deaths of hundreds of people. Land that is home to hundreds of millions of people, including Australian suburbs and beaches, will be swept away by the sea. The Great Barrier Reef will be but a memory, and Antarctica will be on its way to be irretrievably ice-free. Goodbye, gorgeous Adelie penguins. What the scientists told me yesterday, however, was that there is still hope. If we take urgent action now, it's not too late. We can avoid the tipping points that will lead to the melting of the Antarctic ice sheets and the total thawing of the Greenland permafrost. The world can still act to keep global heating below 1.5 degrees, but that time is fast running out. The IPCC report, the science tells us that if we want to have a 83 per cent chance of keeping global heating below 1.5 degrees, we need to re reach net zero carbon in six years. If we're willing to risk a 50 per cent chance of reaching 1.5 degrees hotter than now, then we can leave re leaving um, net zero for 11 years, i.e. that's 2032. So hello, hello, pay attention everyone in this place. I don't care what party you're from. I want you to look that science in the eye, to sit in the fire with our climate scientists and commit to taking the action that's needed to reach net zero carbon in that time. And do not give me any gumph about Australia being a special case because our economy is so dependent on fossil fuels, or that there's no point us acting until China does, or that somehow magic new unicorn technology of carbon capture and storage is going to make everything OK. These are desperate arguments of desperate, immoral peoples who, rather than looking the science in the eye, are selling out our future, who are happy to leave our kids and us in our old age and future generations and all other life that we share this planet with with a damaged, compromised world full of hurt and harm and almost certain widespread famine, war and pestilence. All countries need to act. We have the power here in Australia, so we need to be acting here. Yes, we can do our best to influence other countries, but fundamentally it is our responsibility to do what we as Australians can do. In my first speech, I set out some suggestions of what we needed to do to set pollution reduction targets based on science, to stop, stop subsidising fossil fuels, to create more jobs by boosting clean energy production and energy conservation, to start closing coal-fired power stations, say no to new goal, coal and gas exports, and to make the big polluters pay for the damage they are doing. All of these measures are are as relevant, if not much more relevant today, as they were seven years ago. But sadly, we haven't made much progress on any of them, other than that there is now broad recognition of the importance to jobs in the Australian economy of increased clean energy production. But that's only half a tick out of six. What's so urgent for Australia now, so much more urgent than it was seven years ago, is no new coal and gas. Fracking the Beetaloo Basin must not go ahead. Expansion of gas production at Scarborough and the Pilbara and WA must not go ahead. The Adani coal mine must not go ahead. And why the heck are both parties in this place, Labor supporting the government in giving hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies to coal and gas companies? It absolutely beggars belief. I tell you what, as we get to the end of this term of the Morrison government, I know what I want my next year in the Senate to deliver. I want this government kicked out. I want a change of government. And for the sake of our future, our climate, I want the Greens in shared power 
with the next government so that we can push that next government further and faster to listen to the science, to have science-based targets, to make the polluters pay, to see a shift to 100 per cent renewable energy and out of coal and gas and oil domestically, and then we'll have all the jobs that go with it. Let's make the most of our huge renewable energy resources, turbocharge green hydrogen production, accelerate the shift to electric vehicles, put energy conservation and zero carbon production at the heart of our manufacturing, agriculture and building industries. And in particular, we need no new coal and gas, ending our climate bomb fossil fuel exports. And for Australia then to be playing its part in creating a safe future for us all, a future that we can feel positive and hopeful about, where young people can feel positive about their future. It is possible, but to achieve it, we need to kick this climate denialist government out, and we need the Greens in balance of power to help achieve it. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. We are blessed that we live in one of the oldest and most successful democracies in the world. Our good fortune has come not through chance, but rather off the back of over a century's worth of people, paid and unpaid, who have worked to make it so through blood, sweat and tears. Our democracy works because countless Australians have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect the freedoms inherent in democracy. As society has changed, so should our electoral system be fine-tuned. Now is the time for immediate action by parliament on certain changes to uphold the integrity of our elections. Our system relies on openness and transparency that is upheld in the expression of voter choice and intent. Elections should not only be fair, open and transparent, but seen to be so. We must always work to fine-tune our electoral system. That's why I am calling to introduce optional preferential voting to replace the current system of compulsory preferential voting and by introducing the Robson rotation of candidates' names on ballot papers in federal elections for the House of Representatives. These two simple measures will enhance the democratic process by promoting fairness and simplify the electoral system, promoting voter choice, uphold voter intent and participation by minimising by diminishing vote informality. Both these recommendations were part of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters final report into the conduct of the 2009 federal election, a report that was tabled by myself as chair of the committee in December last year. These are sensible reforms that can be easily made to strengthen the integrity of our voting process. In the 2019 election, there was a rise in informal votes across the country, with New South Wales having the highest rate of vote informality. JSCAN identified there are multiple factors behind this, with the main ones being English as a second language, the number of candidates on the ballot paper and the proximity to state and territory elections that have different voting systems. Many informal votes in federal elections arise from the failure to preference or preference correctly. The current system is complex, can be confused with other voting systems in Australia and requires simplification. Introducing optional preferential voting to replace the existing system of full or compulsory preferential voting will simplify the voting process. Not only will it reduce voter confusion, it will further enhance voter choice. Under optional preferential voting, voters have greater choice at the ballot box. Voters have the right to choose whether or not they wish to preference other candidates. They definitely should not be compelled to allocate a vote for every candidate, especially those they fundamentally disagree with. However, voters would still have the option to preference. They may preference two or other candidates they like, or may preference all of them. Any argument that suggests optional preferential voting leads to wasted votes is false and undermines the principle of voter determination in electoral outcomes. Optional preferential voting puts the power in the voters' hands to vote for their preferred candidate and optimise their ability to choose who they vote for. If a voter would rather have their vote exhaust, because their preferred candidate has lost, then that is their choice. 
the right to not vote for a candidate that a voter does not support or does not know is, a, is fundamental to a voter's right to take part in elections, upholding the notion that the voter is the primary determinant of who they vote for and the electoral outcome. To compel a voter is not only unfair, but undermines the integrity of our system. Optional preferential voting is a win for voter choice and a win for democracy. Another reform that will substantially enhance our electoral process for the better is to introduce the Robson rotation for House of Representatives ballot papers. The Robson rotation is a mechanism by which the order of candidates' names is randomised from one ballot paper to the other. This measure will increase fairness in the electoral process as it will reduce the advantage for candidates who draw favourable positions on the ballot paper. Currently, the existing system where one ballot paper is used enables candidates who have, who have drawn more favourable positions to benefit from down-the-line linear or donkey votes. Variations of the Robson rotation is currently used in both Tasmania and the ACT and is an effective, fair model of printing ballot papers. By introducing a system that prints ballot papers in batches, which allows for all candidates to feature equally in various positions on the, pallet, on the ballot paper, will diminish any real or perceived advantage obtained from such positions. The randomisation of the order that candidates appear on ballot papers promotes fairness in the democratic process as it removes the advantages associated with candidates being positioned in one of the more favourable positions. Favourable positions are those that are traditionally advantageous if drawn in a ballot including the top, the bottom and the, and the middle position on the ballot paper. These are the positions that candidates and their campaign managers get excited about. These changes to the ballot papers will increase fairness of the electoral system by removing any real or perceived advantage, as all candidates will feature in these positions. This will more evenly distribute the benefit from down the ballot, linear or donkey votes between all candidates. Stamping out potential advantages and ballot paper positioning is crucial for upholding the integrity of our elections. As such, an advantage that could easily be the difference in who is elected. The final measure that I believe is essential to fair and open elections is, is voter ID. Voter ID laws are needed to empower voters, increase transparency, establish further safeguards and create consistency. We line up to show our IDs at pubs to get into the election and, to be honest, most people already show it when they attend to vote. It is an expectation from, from voters, it is an expectation from those who already participate in the democratic process. Voter ID will boost public confidence in election outcomes, stop multiple voters and safeguard our democracy against electoral fraud. The argument from across the chamber suggests that there is no issue. It would appear that Labor and the Greens are running a protection racket to protect voter fraud, and that is sad. We currently Order. do not know the extent that electoral Order. fraud exists. And for those who are listening at home, you can hear the whittering away from opposition senators, opposition senators who wish, who wish to, to, um, to, to protect and run a protection racket for voter Order. fraud, and that is, that, is, that is very sad. Now, the proposal that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters brought forward in its recommendation was that if voters are unable to present a valid ID on polling day, another enrolled voter with an ID can attest to their identity or the voter can cast a declaration vote. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters recommended that nearly all forms of ID can be accepted, from a Medicare card to a bill from, from a service provider. This will ensure that eligible voters will never be denied the opportunity to cast their vote. Declaration votes are already cast when a, neighbor, when a voter attends a polling booth in another state or is assigned to a neighbouring electorate. These are sensible reforms that will ensure the integrity of our elections. The voter, having voter ID, having optional preferential voting and having the Robson rotation for House of Representatives ballot papers will ensure that our electoral system is fine-tuned, that it is improved and that we, it is sanctified and protected for future elections. 
So it is time to deliver on optional preferential voting, the Robson rotation and voter ID laws. Deputy President, uh, I, I come from Queensland, and Queensland has been inundated with, with rain, and we welcome rain. And just down the road from where I live, there is a community called Inglewood. And Inglewood, uh, most of Inglewood spent the night on, on high ground away from their homes. Indeed, the mayor of, of the local council there, Lawrence Springborg, uh, was with his community throughout the night. And I just want to pay tribute to the community of Inglewood and the other communities in, in the broad Darling Downs who have been impacted by the, the recent rains. Indeed, uh, photos have been sent to me of my own place. Uh, where my house is luckily on a rise, but all the roads to it are under at least a metre of water. So I'd like to thank all those who've been helping their fellow members of the community across the Southern Downs, across the Darling Downs, for the work they have done to help us get through this inundation. But the good news is that, that our dams are full. Thank you. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, we're here today in the last sitting week of the year, and I want to take this opportunity to express my deep thanks and appreciation to Australians after what has been an incredibly tough year. Of course, different states have experienced it differently, and individual Australians have experienced it differently too. But it has been tough for many, indeed all of us, in our own way. For those of us who have had our lives impacted, indeed those Australians whose livelihoods have been impacted, those who have missed special moments and indeed final moments with those that they love, families struggling with changing work requirements, doing schooling from home, having caring arrangements change at the last minute, insecure work often not keeping up with the need to adapt and shift their caring arrangements for those they love and care for, and our elderly who have been kept away from those that they love for too long, too much of the year. But today I want to acknowledge our essential workers especially, because their experience, wherever they live in Australia, has been really, really tough. I want to start with our health workers, because from day one of this pandemic, they have been on the front line of the fight against this virus, going above and beyond to keep our community safe. In hospitals, nurses and doctors volunteered, without question, to staff COVID wards even as we were just learning what this virus was, what it meant. We all remember the images of doctors removing their protection to reveal faces marked, scarred with lines from their goggles and masks, the scars shown from their service. Nurses standing by the sides of patients who could only see their families through video feeds while they were given oxygen or, in the worst cases, put on ventilators, put into comas. And testing clinic staffed around the clock by teams of individuals who worked well beyond their rostered shifts to keep the queues moving during times of increased testing and need. And our pathologists who have worked around the clock too, testing Australians, helping us to track contain the spread of the virus. In our Medi hotels, where Australian workers served as receptionists, cleaners, security guards, doing their best to support people, to keep them safe in facilities that were never built for quarantine. Many of these workers had zero training in the early days of managing potentially COVID positive guests. We saw time and time again outbreaks by leaks in these hotels, blame placed at the feet of workers, workers who were within a system which was already fatally flawed. Of course, our early childhood workers too, who were sent to work early on, caring for the children of essential workers without personal protection equipment, without proper protocols and guidelines to keep themselves safe, to keep the children they care for safe, to keep the families of those children safe. And they were crying out, saying, we're essential workers too, and no one was listening to them. No one was stumping up with the PPE. No one was stepping in to make sure that they felt safe and supported. And our retail workers, our workers in DCs, who fronted up, continue to front up, to work every single day during the pandemic to keep the shelves stocked, the checkouts moving. These workers could not work from home, and we would have been absolutely lost without them. The workers in our supermarkets, many of whom are young, many of whom are women, 
many of whom have significant and indeed in proportionate caring responsibilities to other workers. These workers turned up each day, even when their leaders weren't turning up for them. They have been some of the most vulnerable, some of the most exposed to the risks of COVID, but they turned up, they did the work, and they weren't given the acknowledgement that they deserved for this work for far too long. And of course, while many Australians work from home, our transport and delivery drivers, our truck drivers, fronted up each day as well, meeting the increased workload, meeting the increased demand from growing parcels, from growing online shopping, from growing deliveries. These workers stepped up, working longer or extra shifts in an industry which is already characterised by excessive hours, by dangerous conditions. And then they had additional challenges, crossing borders, waiting for testing, huge delays in a job which can already be far too unsafe. Of course, for so many of our essential workers, this pandemic has highlighted what they already know, that the impact of casual and insecure work can be devastating for families. Indeed, in a situation like this, it can be dangerous. And if we learn one thing from this pandemic, it must be that we need to urgently tackle the crisis of insecure work in Australia. And we must fight the growing Americanisation of our industrial system and conservative efforts that seek to undermine the hard fought for rights of Australian workers. Deputy President, our essential workers have been through a lot these past two years. They deserve our thanks, they deserve our acknowledgement, but not in words, in action. Action that sees them paid what they deserve. Action that sees their workplace rights protected and advanced. Action that helps keep them safe, as they have worked so hard throughout this pandemic to keep us safe. And action that ensures they are treated with the respect that they deserve. A recent study by the University of Sydney and ANU found that more than half of retail workers reported having been abused at work during the pandemic. The study found that women, workers from a non-English speaking background and younger workers bore the brunt of this abuse more than others. We all remember the images across our television screens of individuals refusing to wear masks, of retail workers being the ones forced to enforce this, of our checkout operators being abused, team members being abused, horrific scenes in the aisles of supermarkets. Unacceptable behaviour un-Australian behaviour. And as we head into the Christmas period and all the joy and rest that that brings for so many of us, but where too stress and tension can also run high, where our retail workers are under as much pressure as ever. I fear this will get worse. Our retail workers are essential workers. They deserve respect. And there is absolutely no place for the abuse or harassment of retail workers. And as we lead up to this Christmas period, I am so proud to support the SDA's No One Deserves a Serve campaign, and I would urge all senators in this place to support it too. As I have said, acknowledging our frontline workers is about more than thanks. It's about more than acknowledgement. It's about making sure they are safe at work, making sure that they are paid what they deserve. And that is why it is just beyond belief that in my home state of South Australia, the Liberal Marshall government are denying these workers Christmas Day penalty rates. In every other state and territory, Christmas Day is a public holiday, no matter which day of the week it falls on, but in South Australia, it is not. And that means while office workers, indeed state government workers, get a public holiday on the Monday, and that's great, they should. But our retail workers, our hospitality workers, who turn up to work on Christmas Day won't be guaranteed penalty rates. And make no mistake, the Liberal government could have fixed this. Indeed, they still can. Parliament in South Australia is still sitting. And for goodness sake, in the year that we have had, in the year our essential workers have had, Surely this isn't beyond even the South Australian Liberals. Acting Deputy President, our frontline and essential workers have kept us safe throughout COVID. They have worked tirelessly around the clock 
a great sacrifice to themselves, to their families, to the people they love and care for. They have looked after our relatives when we've been kept apart from lockdowns or border closures. They've kept the shelves stopped, the supermarkets open, the distribution centres manned. They have kept Australians moving throughout this pandemic. They have kept our freight and our stock and our, our goods moving throughout this pandemic. They have kept our early learning centres open so our doctors and nurses can go to work. They have helped our children learn from home. They have been there manning our Medi hotels. They have been caring for our sick. They have been caring for our elderly in some of the most difficult circumstances those in our caring workforce have ever had to endure. It's time now that we repay that service, their service, with respect, with acknowledgement, both in words and in action. The respect, the acknowledgement and the deeds that they deserve. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. From time to time, I'll put a question to the public. How would you vote if you were me? I asked that recently on the government's proposed voter identification laws. The laws would require people to provide some form of government-issued identification when presenting to vote on election day. I had just over 33,500 submissions. Overall, nearly two-thirds of voters opposed the laws. 64 per cent of people taking my survey opposed the laws. In every state and territory, a majority of voters opposed the bill. I want to make it clear, when I do a survey, I don't, I don't hand over the wheel and say whichever side gets the most votes decides how I'll vote. I have a job to do. It's my job to get other people to do my job. I'm supposed to use my judgment and use my values, and I don't apologise for that. But one of the things I value is politicians that actually care what I think. I want to be that kind of politician. I want to know what my supporters think, because that's how politics gets better. So when I do a survey, I'm not asking people to decide for me. I'm asking, if you're in my shoes, how would you vote and why would you vote that way? I'm asking it as much to see your position as I am to see your reasoning behind it. It's like a massive team meeting where everyone who wants to speak up gets the chance to have their say. I'd say that's called democracy. And I listen to the arguments and I make my decision. And I've listened to the arguments, and I've generally tried to engage both sides of the debate. On balance, I don't think the laws do the job. I'll be voting no on the Morrison government's laws. It's not because the laws are racist. I don't accept they are. I can accept that they might have a bigger impact on the Indigenous community than everyone else, but that doesn't make it racist. All the law does is ask for identification. I don't think it's racist to ask for identification. If you get asked for ID when you get on a plane and airlines, they are not racist for asking for it. But just because it's not racist doesn't mean it's not bad. I thought about the problem the bill is trying to solve. And some opponents of the bill have argued that there isn't a problem here to solve. And maybe that's true, maybe it's not. It doesn't really matter, actually because I can accept that there might be a problem here and still think this, bad, this bill is bad. To be clear, I don't think there's evidence that there is widespread voter fraud. I don't think there is evidence that it's becoming widespread. But it doesn't take widespread fraud for it to potentially decide the election result. Seats are getting tired of these days. If 280 voters in Bass in Tasmania voted differently in 2019, the Liberals would not have won that seat and then I don't have the numbers in Parliament to form a majority government. 280 voters isn't a lot. So just because there isn't widespread voter, voter fraud doesn't mean there isn't a need to prevent it. Put it another way, if your car's never broken into, do you need to lock it? If your house is never burned down, do you need insurance on it? The best time to prevent a disaster is before it's happened, I reckon. Probably the only way to do it as well. 
I don't know if the problem is big, but it doesn't matter to the argument. So let's say there's a problem. The next question is, does this fix it? Asking someone for identification might make it harder for them to vote under someone else's name. How often that's happening? Well, nobody knows. Let's say it's happening a lot. Let's presume it is. Would it make it harder for someone to vote more than once? Not really. Not on the day, anyway. You'd be able to go from booth to booth, flashing your ID and ticking the box, but you'd get caught in the end when someone goes and tries to balance the books. But you wouldn't get caught on the day. So once your votes are thrown out, you've just wasted a perfect Saturday just being a plain pest. That's all you've done, and probably eating too many snags on the barbie. But then you'd be caught anyway. That would be captured under the current rules that are already there. The only way it, may, it might not be caught would be if you are currently attempting to vote as more than one person. Asking for ID would stop that. Asking someone for identification, ask them to prove they are who they say they are. That's about all it does. So that's the problem this bill seeks to address. It's the only thing this could really solve. So the questions I've, question I've asked myself is one, does this bill fix a problem? Maybe, maybe not a current one, but, could, but it could prevent a future one from developing. Two, is this solution appropriate to the problem? Mm. Maybe partially. It, it prevents people from voting by ticking off someone else's name. Nobody knows if people are doing that, but if they are, this would stop it. Three, are there benefits from fixing this problem? Sure. I want people to have confidence that the election results are based on the proper exercise of democracy. I want people to have faith in election outcomes. I don't want us writing because elections are being stolen. I want us knowing that conspiracy theories about voting reggae are simply that, fake news. We don't get there if we don't show the public that we take the integrity of elections seriously. Four, are there risks from fixing this problem this way? Yep, absolutely there are. The risk is the unintended consequences of what effect this would have on the voters at large. That's not a small thing. You're asking 16 million Australians to prove they are who they say they are to stop maybe, maybe, I don't know because I haven't seen the evidence on the table, generously, we're guessing here, a thousand people from doing the wrong thing who are spread throughout the country and so haven't yet had a measurable impact on election result. The people who can't prove they are themselves are given other ways to vote, but we don't know if those alternatives are not enough or too much. If you offer too many alternatives, you just make it easy for people to avoid the rules anyway. So there's a risk this bill ends up making things worse. So some people who are entitled to vote just won't. To make sure other people who are trying to vote more than once don't. And five, do the benefits outweigh the risks? No, no way, not even close. Put it this way, I'm prepared to accept there's a possibility there's some benefit from these laws. But if you're going to be honest about this, you've got to also be fair-minded enough to accept there's risk. Is there enough protections to allow people to vote legitimately without ID? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? <clears throat> Does this bill actually get the right balance? As I was reading through the responses, to be honest, I wasn't any clearer on the answer. Then I realised that that's because there is no way to know. There is no way to know. We're making a big change to the way people vote, and we really are doing it blind. We are blindfolded. We haven't done it before, so we don't know if the protections the bill puts in place are appropriate. Are they enough? Are they too much? Will they work? Will there be time to communicate the changes to the public? Now, if we had a bit more time to work through those questions, we might be able to get a clear idea of what works and what doesn't. But we haven't been given the time to work out those questions. We've had a solution dropped in our laps that's basically a solution with a blindfold attached. And we're told to put it on and see what happens. I don't think so. If the protections in place aren't enough, then thousands of people trying to vote legitimately, as is their democratic right, will be prevented from doing so. That would be a disaster. That would be a disaster many times worse than the problem this bill is supposed to prevent. If the protections in place are enough, then maybe a thousand people trying to vote illegitimately, which is wrong, will be prevented from voting multiple times. That's a good thing. 
But we've already got some protection against instances of multiple voting, so at least we're only strengthening our protections against part of, the, of a problem. Nobody has any idea what effect this bill will have on an election that's supposed to happen in three months, maybe, maybe six months most, who knows? And we're in the shadow of a fresh election and we're being asked to make radical changes to how we vote, with no trials and certainly no evidence, no evidence, just apparently theory. Uh, that's what we're doing here. This is where we got to in the Senate. These people were supposed to be big, supposed to be looking at all the evidence under a microscope, making sure that evidence is correct. We haven't done that. We haven't done that. As a matter of fact, it makes us look really poor up here as senators. We're supposed to be making laws in the land. And this is where we're at. We just flick things up there and vote for them without evidence on the table. That's where your Australian parliament has got to today. Well, I'm not going to be a part of that, and that's why I'm out. I'm voting no on the Liberal Party voters' identification laws, and they're my reasonings why. Senator Sestelja. Uh, thank you. Um, on 19 July uh, 1970, Avril Briggs had just turned 17. Her mother and father were heading to the harbour to see a Royal Navy ship called HMS Ulster. Avril decided that she would go with them, and little did she know this decision would change her life forever. On the ship uh, was this cocky Yorkshire sailor named Colin, who asked Avril out that night. Avril was absolutely horrified at the thought. Avril's nanny had told her that she would probably come home with a sailor, to which she replied, I wouldn't have a sailor if he was wrapped up in five pound notes. After asking three times, Avril finally agreed to go out that night in a group. After the night out had come to an end, the full group went back to Avril's house with her parents for a late night supper. When it was time for Colin and his friends to leave, they promised to write to each other. Colin admits that he was not a great writer, but was determined to keep in touch with the special girl he had just met. Avril and Colin kept up the letters, and in November that year, Avril decided to join the Navy. She wanted to join as a nurse, uh, but was not old enough, so decided to be a, a radar plotter, without any idea of what it meant other than a posting to Portsmouth, where Colin was based. After joining the Women's Royal Navy Service in November and going through the first four-week training and induction program, Avril was finally allowed to go into the nearest town to see Colin, hoping like nothing else that they still liked each other as it was only the second time they had actually seen each other. They would only spend a short time together as Avril was only allowed off the base for a few hours in the afternoon. It was then Colin asked if Avril would come and stay with his parents for New Year's in Halifax. While incredibly nervous, Avril said yes. Avril met the griefs, who were incredibly kind to her, and Colin's mum even remarked, that's the sort of girl I wish you would marry. Little did she know that by then Colin had already proposed, even though they'd only met up the three times. Constantly trying to meet up while they were both in the Navy was hard. The men were not allowed into the women's quarters and vice versa. They had to use public transport and didn't get a lot of time. The outcome was that they had to go to a pub every time they wanted to meet. It was very costly and it was always full of other sailors who knew them both. Avril and Colin had planned on getting married in 1972, but when Colin was suddenly told he was being posted, they decided to get married before he left. At short notice, they decided Christmas Eve of 1971 would be their wedding day. Only years later, uh, when Avril was organising a Christmas lunch, did she realise how inconvenient was that was for their family and friends. The total bill for the reception came to £41. Not bad for a dinner and wine for 43 guests. The entire thing finished by about 5pm and having no money for a honeymoon, they all went to the pub where Avril had great delight in telling anyone that would listen that she was now Mrs Grief. One of the first things Colin learned about Avril when they moved in together was her great cooking skills. Though he was very nervous uh, when she first brought a chicken to roast and he didn't think she knew what she was doing, it turns out she did, and he was lucky to find a wife who was such a great cook. And I can personally say that Colin's fear was misplaced uh, that day, as my wife and I are lucky enough to have experienced Avril's incredible cooking skills. 
The Greeks came to Australia in the 1970s, a young couple with two young children and two wooden crates of personal belongings and only about $500 to their names. Colin and Avril have built an incredible life together. They've had two girls, Kelly and Shan, and four grandchildren. Like most, life has had its fair share of ups and downs, but they've done it together. While at times they might have wanted to throttle each other, especially uh, with the constant tension of Colin being a neat freak, freak and Avril definitely not. They've worked on their marriage, they've faced challenges together, and they're a gra great example for family and friends around them. One of the stories that encapsulates the type of people Colin and Avril are is the way they choose to spend their wedding anniversary each year. Unlike most couples who might get dressed up and head out for a nice dinner together to celebrate the past year, Colin and Avril choose, time, choose to spend their time giving to others. Colin puts on his Santa suit and Avril dresses as Mrs Claus, and together they head out to the houses of family and friends, gifts in hand, and do their absolute best to spread Christmas cheer to children all around Canberra. To Colin and Avril, there is nothing more important in their world than their family and friends. They've always put the needs of others before their own. Colin spends a considerable amount of time volunteering to help with defence veterans groups and at the local police station, and bringing music and joy to disadvantaged children. And Avril, who every single day does little thankless tasks for her family and friends to make their days just that bit better, including making the most incredible quilts, while continuing her work as a nurse, even after trying to retire on a number of occasions now. They are kind, they are loving, they are selfless. The world needs more people like Colin and Avril. This Christmas Eve, Colin and Avril will again suit up and head out with their gifts. Their family and friends will enjoy watching their children take photos with Santa, but this year will be different. I share this story uh, today of Avril and Colin because this year it will be Colin and Avril's 50th wedding anniversary, something that deserves special acknowledgement. Congratulations to you both uh, on what is an incredible milestone. You continually bless the lives of those who know you. Now, Acting Deputy President, on a less happy uh, matter, uh, the ACT Labor Greens government are now one step closer to passing a bill in the ACT Assembly that removes criminal penalties in relation to hard drugs like cocaine, heroin and ice in our city. Now, while it's true that this extreme Labor Greens government have had some wacky policies in the past, this must take the cake, and I simply can't believe that this is the path they want to go down. Now, these drugs not only ruin the lives of those who take them, uh, but also ruin the lives of their families, our frontline workers, and many innocent bystanders who find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. The AFP Commissioner, Rhys Kershaw, recently stated when asked about these laws, he said, being a law enforcement officer, we see the carnage that cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine does. It just doesn't make sense that you'd want to legalise that. It's going to mean that organised crime will want to target this community in particular because they can move their product quite easily. It just makes it more difficult for us to com combat the rise of cocaine, methamphetamine and heroin use, and they're not recreational drugs. Now, with police already overrun, uh, because of the Labor Greens government's refusal to implement anti-consorting laws, making Canberra a hotspot for bikey gangs, this is the last thing that our city needs. And while we might stand in this place uh, and feel disconnected from the happenings uh, in the ACT Legislative Assembly, these are the same policies held by the Federal Greens, and they have no shame in pointing out that if they form an alliance with the ALP after the next election, they will be pushing their policies, and this is the kind of dangerous extreme policies we can ex expect of a Labor Greens government. Uh, you know, they, they want to halve uh, defence spending in this country. That's what the Greens want to do. Uh, they want to halve defence spending in this country, leaving this country vulnerable uh, to outside threats, uh, not to mention uh, cutting thousands of jobs here in the ACT. Uh, estimated that that would result alone. That one Greens policy would result in the loss of 13,000 jobs here in Canberra in both the public and the private sector uh, for those who work hard to support our troops and to support our defence efforts. So, uh, the Labor Greens policy in the Assembly, which seems to be coming closer to fruition after that committee report of decriminalising uh, some of these hard drugs like ice and heroin, uh, 
and cocaine, uh, cutting defence spending. We're seeing at an ACT level uh, what a Labor Greens government looks like. Uh, Adam Bant has made it very, very clear uh, that uh, if they hold the balance of power after the next election and there is a Labor government, uh, that they will be asking a price of the Labor Party to form government with them. And these are some of the extreme policies they have on the table. The decriminalisation of hard drugs like ice and halving our defence budget, not only would that be devastating at a national level, uh, here in the ACT we're already, we're already starting to see those type of policies and we would see the devastating effects not just of those drugs policies but of those policies that would cut thousands of jobs here in the ACT. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, um, I rise to um, respond in part to some of the comments that we've just heard from Senator Sizelja, who was in here decrying everyone but this government and in this constant failure to attach to reality. This government keep talking as if they haven't been in government. All the problems that have been described will be far worse if we get change. But this is the third term of a government, the third term of a government that is failing Australians. And today, Madam Acting Deputy President, I want to speak to the state of rural health care, particularly in our great state of New South Wales. It's in a mess. People cannot get the care that they need in so many of our communities. Under 10 years of coalition government in New South Wales and eight years of the federal government under Mr Abbott and then Mr who was the next one? T Turnbull. <laughs> and then we've got Morrison. Sorry, I could remember Malcolm, but I was struggling with the Turnbull bit. So the reality is we've had this change of three different leaders, but the same bad policy. And the health outcomes for those who call rural and remote Australia their home have plummeted. And that's whether they've got a Liberal or a National Party member representing them. They are not doing their job. They are not doing their job in this place. They are not standing up for those local communities. There was a New South Wales Parliament inquiry into health outcomes and access to health and hospital services um, in rural and regional and remote New South Wales. And what they discovered was truly shocking. And some people would remember the reportage of that earlier this year. Uh, tales of neglect and government ignorance of the suffering that has been inflicted on the communities across New South Wales. In Daniloken, we heard that midwives wouldn't give birth to their, in their own maternity ward because they knew. We heard of how staff shortages meant that tea ladies, tea ladies were looking after infants and that community members were travelling to Echuca across the border and into Victoria because the New South Wales health system wasn't delivering for them. And I've had senators in this place disrespectfully uh, playing with the name of the Premier of Victoria, making a joke of what's going on in terms of access to services. And the reality is it's far better if you get sick in Victoria than it is if you get sick in New South Wales. It's just not good enough. In Trundle, a little four-year-old child had to wait for one year to get a specialist appointment in Newcastle. And that's not even a small community. That is a big, big town, a city with a long history, well and truly over 150 years. Then, after getting an appointment, waiting for a year, had to wait another three months to get a diagnosis of cancer. Now, I don't know that anybody who's listening to this across the nation or anybody in this chamber could fail to have empathy for a family that had been on that kind of a dystopian health journey. To not be able to get a diagnosis and then finally, after delay, finding it's cancer. We know the reality of people accessing services through trying to get into their GP is in decay. In over 40 towns in western New South Wales, the predictions are that there might not be a GP in the next 10 to 15 years. And there are towns that are really, really struggling right now. Even on the central coast where I live, just over 100 kilometres from Sydney, people cannot get in to see their GP. There are GP registrar, registrar places that have been made available 
about 60, which is not very many if you get part of north of the, uh, the border. Uh, well, I call it the border to Sydney. It's the, the Brooklyn River, uh, the Brooklyn River Bridge over the Hawkesbury. And once you get north of that, you're in my home country, the land of the Dark and Young and the Garingai people. You get there and you go all the way up to Armidale for this health district. It's not a district. It's, it's a massive landmass. And the reality is, of 60 places offered for GPs, often only about 40 take it for a training session for a year. You know one of the reasons why they don't go there? Because they can't get their family into a GP. That is the description of a death spiral for access to GPs. And that's why Labor has pushed for an inquiry. And the Senate will be on the Central Coast on the 14th of December, hearing from local people about how diabolically hard it is after eight years of federal government and 10 years of state Liberal government to try and actually get something as basic as access to your local doctor. The situation is clearly untenable. Our rural and remote healthcare system is absolutely buckling under the weight of multiple long-standing issues. Staffing shortages, distances, the lack of community transport services, they're all chronic issues and they're endemic to the rural healthcare system. All things that no individual can fix. Only a government can fix these things. And a government that cared would have fixed them instead of leading to further and further decay of the system. And that's what we've seen across Liberal government in New South Wales 10 years and Liberal government at federal level for eight years. Local governments are being forced to subsidise local med medical centres. They're paying for doctors and keeping those vital medical services in town because the federal and state governments have failed in their jobs. That is putting a really great strain on already overburdened budgets from ratepayers. It's a small rate base in rural Australia. It just, the economics of it just don't work. And the governments just walk away and walk away. And they've been walking away so long that now people can't walk into a GP. 21 local councils were named in local government's New South Wales submission, including Forbes, uh, Carathul, Burke, Wagga Wagga, Coonamble, Edward River, Gilgandra, Gunnedah, Gwida, Hay, the Lachlan Shire, Murrumbidgee, Narandra, Chamora, Upper Lachlan, Upper Lachlan and the Wentworth Shire Council. All of those within my duty seats, all of them councils paying thousands and tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars, to fill the gap in the current health care services. All of the people in every single one of those great places across New South Wales, all of them deserve better. And their Liberal national representatives in this place have not stood up for them. And the proof of the failure of uh, uh, representation is in their everyday experiences for their families and people they love and work with. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare data shows that people are living in rural and remote areas have a higher rate of hospitalisation a higher rate of mortality, a higher rate of injury and poor access to, and a higher rate of use of primary health care services compared with those living in metropolitan areas. In rural and remote communities, the AIHWA notes that potentially preventable hospitalisation rates were as much as two and a half times as high as those in major cities. And that's because the system and the structure is not there to support access to health. Inequality under this government seeking a fourth term, a second decade of opportunity to ruin the nation. Inequality is now endemic in our system because of your postcode. We have to work and we have to change the government if we are to erase the injustices imposed by the tyranny of distance and overseen by this government. Beautiful and productive regions of Australia and the important industries they support are the engine room of the Australian economy. They shouldn't be forced to travel for eight hours to get to a doctor for essential health care. Your time has expired. I'll now proceed to two-minute statements. Senator McCarthy, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm proud and excited to share with the Senate the news of this year's National NAIDOC Award recipients. These annual awards recognise the outstanding contributions that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do contribute in this country, in their communities and with their families. Whether it's sport or social justice, the winners demonstrate strength in maintaining culture and working towards a better society. 
Among the ten winners are Female Elder of the Year Christabel Swan from Central Australia, Pat O'Shane AM took the Lifetime Achievement Award, Ernest Houlihan was the Male Elder of the Year, the Artist of the Year was Bobby Lockyer, Scholar of the Year Sasha Purcell, Apprentice of the Year Jaron Andy, and can I encourage senators to go on to the nadoc.org.au website and to all of you listening to have a look at all of the winners, in particular their stories. On a personal note, I wish to acknowledge uh, my uncle and families in Borroloola who received the Caring for Country Award to Gadrian Hooson and all of those who look after country. And finally, the Sports Person of the Year is my son, CJ McCarthy Grogan. Uh, a special shout out to you, CJ. It's been a, uh, an enormous year, uh, in particular uh, with the disruption to your studies overseas, and wonderful to have had you back in Australia, but also representing the Australian Paralympics wheelchair basketball team. It's an absolute uh, honour, and I know uh, that you are uh, incredibly humbled uh, by the recognition from uh, your peers across the country, but also from the Northern Territory NAIDOC committee because of your work with uh, people with disabilities and families. And thank you, son, for uh, being so inspiring Good to all you, Australians. Good on you, well done. Uh, Senator Macdonald remotely. Acting Deputy President, I rise to question why the Queensland Labor government put so little value into early childhood education. The mark of a good government is how it treats people. The economy is important, as is defence and infrastructure, but it's the policies that affect people which matter most. And in that regard, Queensland's government applies neither common sense nor reasonable judgment to its decisions and its people who suffer because of it. After nearly two years, the Queensland government continues to make decisions that are, are confusing and inconsistent, and frankly, people have had enough. Here's a comment from a Queensland childcare provider. I'm all for vaccinations and possibly would consider mandates a solution, but Labor's execution announced this morning is a shocker. How are we meant to staff our childcare centre with holiday leave already approved and some staff unable to work due to them refusing the vaccination? Do I hand them a resignation for Christmas? Back vacation care plans have been made for school-aged children that may not be able to be covered. All well and good for school-based teachers, a school will be closed, but long daycare services do not have that luxury. This short notice decision reflects the value placed on early childhood education. I don't think for a minute that Labor supports us more than any other party, as are often made to appear. No one really thought this through. Happy holidays, educators. Queenslanders have exchanged us, keeping us safe for dictatorship in extraordinary times, but Labor has repaid this good faith with inconsistency, with incompetence, and policies which penalise individuals unnecessarily. People deserve better than Labor, much, much better. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, Stella Morris, uh, Julian Assange's partner, uh, tweeted today that a decision is imminent on this Walkley Award winning Australian's uh, trial in the UK in relation to him being sent to the US uh, on an extradition. Acting Deputy President, uh, it's high time that this parliament got serious about Julian Assange. We have moved motions in this chamber, which has been supported by the Australian Senate, recognising uh, his persecution. Yet we have heard nothing from this government in relation to stunning and very disturbing revelations recently about plots by our ally, the US, by the CIA, to kidnap, kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange. We've heard nothing from our foreign minister about what our government has done to raise this issue with the US. Uh, and I would like to say today uh, that the Greens will be seeking to introduce a, a motion in this Senate for a references inquiry through the Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee to use this Senate's resources 
to get to the bottom of this. Um, it's high time we got serious about helping this Australian citizen who has been subject to punishment by process, the continual use of legal, legal warfare against this individual. Uh, he has rights like any Australian citizen has rights and we need to stand up for him. Um, so that inquiry, uh, we would be very hopeful of getting the support uh, of Labor and the crossbench and having a short inquiry uh, with a number of hearings in Canberra. Um, we hope to do, deliver this inquiry uh, around the election early next year and let's get on with it. Senator Lyons. Thank you. I want to talk about the Jenkins report that was released yesterday. And uh, we all need to be shocked about what it says. It is truly a shocking revelation of this place as a workplace leading out to our electorate officers. More than a third of people who responded, who are current employees, talked about being sexually harassed. More than a third. Every single senator and MP in this place should be standing up today demanding action. More than a third of staff currently employed talked about being bullied, bullied by their employers. And the shocking statistics are that the repeated offences are massive, are massive. So we know that 82 per cent of people who talked about being bullied said other people were bullied. And 66 per cent of people who said that they had been sexually harassed talked about other people also being sexually harassed. This place is about power and privilege. It's based on it's an aggressive workplace. There's way too many men here, and the redress needs to come from more women MPs and senators, more women as staffers, and all of us taking responsibility to call this out. Because I can't say, hey, it's not me, because that's not what the public sees. The public sees all of us. We are all tarred with the same brush here. We are all being held responsible to make this parliament a better place. And I, for one, made a pact with myself about six months ago that I would call it out. Because I've been abused at work. I know what it feels like to be voiceless and powerless. And the fact that we are currently doing that to staff in this place is an absolute disgrace, and it's got to stop. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you. Today I table a petition calling on this parliament to pass our One Nation legislation stopping COVID-19 injection discrimination. This petition was launched only 22 days ago. In that short time, more than 200,000 Australians have put their name to it. The people's strong opposition to injection, coercion and discrimination and separation continues to grow. Last weekend, many thousands of Australians exercised what little freedom remains to them to protest injection mandates. Australians have spoken loudly and emphatically, and senators will ignore this growing voice at their grave peril. The collusion last week to block this legislation from being referred to a parliamentary inquiry sends a clear message from parliament to the Australian people. That is, the people must be silenced. Parliament's clear message is that we, the people, must not be given the opportunity to say that we oppose injection, coercion and discrimination. The message is that senators here are very frightened at what we all might say in an inquiry. Always beneath control, there is fear. Senators are afraid that when we speak, we will expose their false narrative, that everyone opposed to co injection, coercion and discrimination is an extremist, anti-vax conspiracist. Many people who have signed this petition are fully injected against COVID-19. We, the people, are not against injections. We're against government coercion and government-approved discrimination. We, the people, understand this issue is much greater than COVID-19 injections and pandemic restrictions. We, the people, understand this is about some of the fundamental principles of Australian democracy, freedom of speech, individual autonomy, and the right to choose our own fate. Senators, our job is not to silence the Australian people. Our job is to listen to the Australian people and do what the people tell us. As senators, we're not dictators, we're servants. Senators, the people are telling you to pass our legislation and end this pandemic of discrimination. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the sad decay and decline 
of the quarantine facility, the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs in the Northern Territory, under the watch of the Gunner Labor government. Now, this facility was considered world-class, gold standard under Professor Len Lataris and his OSMAT team. Well, I can tell you it has gone from gold standard to winning the wooden spoon. Uh, just last week, we had three people presumed to have actually caught COVID within the centre. We had one person abscond, got out of the centre, was found hours later at a bar in Darwin's CBD. And just today, we have news of three people, three people absconding from the centre and uh, being found in, in Palmerston. The people are just, just going, over the, going over the very small fence and getting out. Now, this, this never happened previously under Professor Len Nataris, and that's why it was considered gold standard. It wasn't the physical buildings of the facility itself, it was the management. Now, what do we have? Less than six months since the facility has been handed over to Michael Gunner, and, and it has just gone into absolute decline. It has gone from being the shining light of quarantine facilities around the world and around Australia. We've had people come up to the Northern Territory to examine what this facility is like and what we're doing that's working so well. Well, it was working so well until the management of the facility was handed over to Michael Gunner. And it's gone from being the shining light to a chaotic failure. A chaotic failure. And that is very, very sad that in less than six months it has been torn apart and is no longer functional. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Yesterday in question time I asked Senator Payne about the government's decision to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Given subs won't be delivered until 2040s, and the strategic threat from China will likely to have passed long before then, I asked her to explain the decision. It was revealing that no explanation was forthcoming. But I do not blame Senator Payne for this. Instead, it is a symptom of this government's tendency to make big announcements, to catch the spotlight with a showy display, without doing the work to ensure decisions are right. The government has committed this country to requiring nuclear-powered submarines at huge and unknown cost. It has committed this country to supporting the United States in defence of Taiwan at huge and unknown cost. It has undermined our relationship with France, a key partner in the Asia-Pacific, at huge and unknown costs. And it has deeply damaged our relationship with China, until recently our biggest trade partner, at huge and unknown cost. And it has done this all without a clear justification. The Prime Minister and his Cabinet have made these decisions on our behalf without telling us why they are necessary or why we should bear these costs. Instead of acquiring nuclear submarines, we could have acquired the French submarines and still had enough money left over to transform every school and hospital in Australia. We deserve better government than this. We deserve a government that actually works through policy options, weighs up the consequences and makes decisions in the national interest, not their personal political interest. That is what we were elected for, and that is what the Australian people deserve. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I want to direct my remarks today to families of Jack Brownlee and Charlie Hawkins. Uh, that's Lana Cormier and Mr and Mrs Brownlee. And I want to also want to draw attention to Katanzariti, because I'm going to speak today about the ongoing increasing scourge of deaths on workplaces across Australia. This year, 194 workers have tragically lost their lives in industrial accidents. That's more than four a week. That's more than one every two days in Australia. These horrible occurrences are particularly prominent in construction, mining, transportation and the horticultural industries. Particularly, 16 people have died in the seasonal workers program, a stark increase from the zero deaths in the program between 2017 and 2019. 2021 marks the second year running that the rate of industrial deaths has risen. The Liberals and Nationals refuse to implement the necessary reforms needed to ensure accountability and safety for our work sites, and tragically, workers continue to die needlessly. 
I once again urge the government to act on the recommendations of, they, of the They Never Came Home report, which we tabled in this place and was chaired very ably by former Deputy President Senator Gavin Marshall. Bring on and respond to the Boland Review and follow in the footsteps of Victoria, Queensland and Northern Territory Labor governments. Introduce a national regime for industrial manslaughter. Australia needs the criminalising of industrial manslaughter. In, in, in this country, we need to ensure that workers who go to work come home. One death on a work site is one death too many, and I will continue to raise my voice for these families who have a right to expect so much more of the government. They should not elect this one because they've done nothing in eight years. I also want to honour and recognise Senator Gallagher's reminder that during the 12 months to the end of December 2020, 170 people died in crashes involving heavy trucks, uh, and they aren't even counted in those figures. Expired. There's work to be done. Senator, still John remotely. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Here in WA, we have a long and proud history of our community mobilising and organising uh, in the face of government decisions that put our community and our environment at risk. Uh, from the anti-nuclear movements of the 1980s to the truly remarkable protection of the James Price Point uh, in uh, WA's Northwest against fracking, a, a campaign that took place in 2013. Right now, we are bearing witness to the next chapter in WA's environmental history. And I'm so proud uh, to have seen some of these incredible community-led campaigns recognised at the Bob Brown Foundation Awards last week. I'm, I can't tell you uh, how proud I am to see uh, WA climate activist Bella Burgermeister uh, recognised as one of the joint young environmentalists of the year. Uh, Bella is a litigant in the landmark Sharma versus Minister uh, of the Environment class action. She is a truly impressive young person and has a really bright future ahead of her. I'm also really chuffed to see Jess Beckling, tireless work uh, with the WA Forest Alliance, acknowledged uh, with the Environmentalist of the Year Award. Now, Jess has been a champion for WA Forest for as long as I can remember and was instrumental in the WA government's recent decision to ban native forest logging. It is a real privilege uh, to work with people like Bella and Jess, who are committed to creating a future where our environment, our wildlife and our future generations thrive. It's what the Greens were founded on, and it's what we will continue to champion proudly in this place. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Yesterday, Labor Senator O'Neill presented the Privileges Committee report on whether the Commissioner of Taxation committed a contempt by refusing to comply with an order of the Senate. He refused to produce a list of all employers with an annual turnover of greater than $10 million that were paid a JobKeeper payment. The Privileges Committee decided against a finding of contempt. No action is to be taken in response to the defiance of a Senate order. The committee, act, acting outside remit, has made a compromise with the Commissioner that he will supply information about JobKeeper recipients in a way that he claims enables the Senate to fulfil its accountability function whilst excluding details that would identify entities that received JobKeeper. So we are likely to receive a list of, uh, that has no company names on it. How pathetic! But that's what the Privileges Committee has come to. I'm not surprised Liberal senators signed up to this, but I expected better from Labor. Labor condemned the waste of billions of taxpayers' dollars paid to pro profitable corporations through JobKeeper. The member for Fenner, Dr Andrew Lee, has, like me, uh, energetically campaigned to shame some of those corporations to give back JobKeeper payments they did not need. The list uh, would have made these efforts much more successful. The Pri Privileges Committee has gone to water, with Labor members too afraid to defend the rights and, the, and privileges of the Senate that were obtained over, century, over centuries in the UK, too afraid to stand up to the executive government. The Senate was weakened yesterday. Erskine May would be turning in his grave. Journalists often refer to the committee, the, the committee as, as the powerful Senate Privileges Committee. In the interests of accuracy, they should really change that adjective from powerful to piss weak. 
Order. Senator Patrick, you know that's not parliamentary. Senator Mariel Smith. Yesterday, Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins handed down her report into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. This report was born from the bravery of women who once shared our workplace and who started a much-needed movement for change. And its findings and recommendations are thanks to the participation of everyone who has worked in this building, past and present, who shared their personal experiences, some of them deeply traumatic with the reviewers. The report noted the sense of pride that so many people in this building feel when they start work in this place. I know that feeling. I felt it first as a staffer and I still feel it as a senator. Either as elected officials or as staff, we have the incredible privilege to serve in the heart of our democracy, to make a difference, to fight for a better nation, no matter what our vision for better may look like. But far too many who have held that privilege have been deeply failed by a toxic culture, by a workplace that hasn't been safe enough or respectful enough and hasn't supported them as it should. And it matters especially that it has happened here, because the people in this building set the standards for our nation. And if this place can fail women especially so badly, then is it any wonder that so many women around our nation feel unsafe or disrespected in their homes and communities? Today, I want to say to the staff in this building, you deserve to always feel a sense of pride for the work you do here. And, we've, you've and when you've decided to call time on your service here, you deserve to carry that pride fondly into the next phase of your life. This is an incredible institution, but as a workplace, it has deeply failed too many who serve within it. It is unacceptable and it must change with urgency, with depth and with the greatest ambition. I urge leadership in this space and action for those who deserve their concerns to be treated with the utmost of seriousness and urgency. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. When Donald Trump was US President, Prime Minister Scott Morrison was rightly criticised for his cosy friendship with this white nationalist leader who was impeached twice and tried to steal an election. But not much has been said about the Prime Minister's cosy friendship with another far-right leader, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India. Dangerous nationalism and authoritarianism with strong anti-Muslim and anti-Sikh elements have skyrocketed in India under Modi, and his administration should be condemned. This escalating nationalism has had direct impacts for the Indian diaspora in Australia too, as racism and hatred threatens communities who belong to minorities and who have been critical of Modi's agenda. Community members have shared with me logs of messages in large online communities, particularly on Facebook and WhatsApp, that are directly influenced by Modi's nationalist agenda and contain hate speech targeted at minority groups. This includes labelling the target groups as terrorist sympathisers, criminals, rapists and vermin. Words can escalate. This year, there have been several publicly reported incidents of violence and altercations between groups, including an attack on four young Sikh men in Harris Park, Sydney, at the height of domestic protests in India over Modi's farming laws. The impact of this hateful politics on many in our community is extremely concerning. It's a direct result of the importation of the nationalist politics of Modi and the Australian government's refusal to call it out. I call on the members of the government and the Prime Minister to condemn far-right politics and call out Mo the Modi administration for its authoritarian nationalist agenda. Senator Abetz. It's right and proper to honour those who have made a lifetime's contribution to their community. Sir Max Bingham was such a person who recently passed at the age of 94. Tasmania has lost one of its outstanding sons with the passing of Sir Max. Sir Max's reputation as a scholar, gentleman and intellect is without peer. I had the privilege of first meeting Sir Max when he was a member for Denison and leader of the state opposition when I first joined the Liberal Party in my home state of Tasmania. He was impressive with his insights and personal demeanour. Sir Max was a giant in the state parliament and I have no doubt he would have made an exceptionally competent premier. Chances are he was the best premier Tasmania never had. 
Unfortunately, he missed out on leading our state. Some would say he was too good for the cut and thrust of public life. But as an Attorney General and Deputy Premier and Police Minister, he was exceptionally highly regarded by all within the legal fraternity and the police force who considered him a true friend. After his distinguished career in the Royal Navy as a barrister, magistrate and parliamentarian, he further distinguished himself by serving on the National Crime Authority and then the equivalent of the Integrity Commission in Queensland as its uh, first chair. So, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, today I want to salute the life and service of Sir Max Bingham and extend my condolences to his family. Senator Grogan. Uh, thank you. Um, the release yesterday of Kate Jenkins' review into workplace culture in this building had some shocking content, especially on the treatment of women in this place. But what I want to talk about today is some of the groups that really are making a fundamental difference. And particularly, I want to highlight the work of one group that I visited recently who gave me hope. Um, the next generation understand these issues, they take it seriously, and they are ready to tackle it head on. Girls with Attitude is a student leadership group at Parra Hills School in Adelaide. And they got together to address everyday sexism and disrespect that the girls in the school were experiencing. They had a passion to work together and to create a safer and more respectful school environment. The school and the students, after three years of this program, have reported a significant shift in the culture, the culture of what happens in the playground, what happens in the classroom, and what happens across the whole school community. Girls with Attitude has developed a campaign in conjunction with the Northern Adelaide Domestic Violence Centre uh, aimed at identifying the roots of gendered violence and developing strategies to shift those harmful attitudes towards girls and women. I heard about how these young girls, as young as 10, were already facing discrimination on the basis of their gender and how it affects their lives and the lives of those close to them. We've got a lot to learn from groups like this. They know firsthand what it's like to be a girl in this country, and they know what needs to be changed to make a safer and more equal society for them to grow in. A big takeaway from my meeting with those girls was how utterly, utterly fearless they are. They've got big dreams, big aspirations, and we could learn an awful lot in this place from a group of primary students addressing Senator culture. Senator Grogan, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. The Morrison government is tackling the problem of online trolling and ensuring administrators of social media pages aren't liable for the comments that other people make on their page. Our anti-trolling bill ensures that people won't be able to use anonymous social media accounts to defame other people online. It represents action on an issue that so many parents express worry about. Victims of this behaviour will have the ability to unmask an anonymous user allowing them to pursue them in court. This will ensure that laws governing, people, governing people's conduct in the real world will also apply Order. for people online. There will be safeguards to ensure that these mechanisms can't be abused. There will also be provisions that allow the Attorney-General to intervene in cases such as where there is a major power imbalance. Importantly, Order. the bill clarifies that people who have social media pages are not liable for defamatory comments that other people make on their pages, resolving an issue of uncertainty that had been created by the High Court's decision in the matter of Vola. Without this reform, countless individuals and businesses could inadvertently get caught up in legal battles for failing to moderate the comments on their posts, even if they lack the time and resources to be able to complete that task. It shifts responsibility for these comments back onto the people who make them. The bill won't solve all problems with social media, of course, but it's an important step and it's using accountability to drive better culture online. It being 2pm, we'll move to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. 
The national accounts released today show that the Australian economy contracted by 1.9 per cent in the September quarter. Can the minister confirm that growth in the September quarter is the worst out of the 28 OECD countries that have reported so far? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank you for uh, I thank uh, Senator Gallagher for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I can confirm the release of the national accounts today, uh, and that the release of the national accounts show a contraction of 1.9 per cent through the September quarter. Uh, this is the result and the price of, uh, of lockdowns. Uh, it is um, not an un unanticipated result, uh, although it is in fact ahead of market expectations in terms of what the result was likely to be. Uh, I don't, Mr. President, have uh, have the uh, precise tally uh, for the quarterly figures across OECD countries that uh, that the senator uh, asked for, but uh, it is certainly the case, Mr. President, uh, that uh, Australia's recovery and economic performance through the pandemic uh, is in the top three across advanced economies around the world, and uh, that our performance in recovery, uh, through-year growth, uh, stronger than Germany, Canada, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, many others. Uh, Mr President, uh, through the course of this year there have been many disruptions. Uh, since the Delta variant became the dominant variant of COVID-19, uh, there have been lockdowns or state of emergency declarations in at least 81 different countries. Uh, that has obviously had significant impacts right around the world. Uh, but in Australia, uh, growth remains up 3.9 per cent throughout the year. Order. Growth remains up 3.9 per cent throughout the year. Uh, and Mr President is driven uh, by strong performances in a number of sectors. Uh, our rural exports in particular driving strongly, increasing by 47 per cent throughout the year. Uh, the terms of trade and trade surplus for Australia are now their highest on record. This is a demonstration Mr. President, of, uh, of just one area of the policies that our governments have pursued to create uh, the maximum range of opportunities for Australian businesses and exporters delivering Order. for them and delivering for the nation as well. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. In the September quarter, America's economy grew by 0.5 per cent, the UK by 1.3, Canada by 1.3, Germany by 1.7, and France by 3 per cent. But the Australian economy contracted by 1.9 per cent. If the Morrison government was doing such a great job managing the economy, why is our September downturn the worst in the OECD so far and the third biggest downturn in the history of the national accounts? Order, order, order on my right and my left. Order. Senator Hughes, order. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. Senator President, if you have to ask what the cause of the economic impact in the September quarter was, then clearly you don't understand much about how the economy operates, because the cause was very clearly the lockdowns that occurred across the country. Order. That's evident from the fact that Order. the dominant factor, the dominant factor Order. in relation to the downturn, was the decline in household consumption. Unsurprisingly, household consumption declines uh, when people uh, are living under Order lockdown restrictions. But we know, Mr. President, the rebound is strong. We know that because the ABS payroll jobs data shows 350,000 jobs coming back from September already. 350,000 jobs in that short period of time coming back. We know that Australia's global performance, as I said before, is on the through year from the depths of the pandemic in the top three in the world. So those opposite can seek to select a narrow band of time. We've got Minister, the demonstration, the evidence Minister, of Australian jobs Minister, and Australian your strength. Time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that if Mr. Morrison had done his two jobs on vaccine and quarantine, the Australian economy and Australia would be in a much better position than it is in now. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order on my right. Minister. So, so Mr President, the Labor Party don't understand that the cause of economic distress Come, that comes from lockdowns, and the Labor Party seem to think the Prime Minister of Australia only has two jobs to do. Well, Mr. President, they're wrong on all counts. 
they're wrong on all counts. Order. Now, what is helping to fuel that recovery, the 350,000 jobs that have come back Order. just in the space of a month or so, is the policy, are the policies that our government has implemented. Our economic recovery plan fuelled by the Order. fact that Australians have got more money in their pockets from tax cuts that we have delivered, $1.5 billion a month on average of support going through, fuelled by the policies outlined in the budget in terms of encouraging Australian businesses to invest more, particularly across plant, machinery, equipment, which we have seen such strong growth of, which is going to make sure Mr. President, that we do not just have the growth now but we have more productive and competitive businesses to fuel the export boom that we are seeing from Minister, Australia and growth across Minister, so many other sectors. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. My question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the risks to Australia's vital maritime supply chains and our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic in the lead-up to Christmas? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the question. Uh, Mr. President, as we all know, Australia is an island nation. Uh, we are bordered by three of the world's oceans. What that Order. means for Australians is ports are the gateway to our open trading economy. Anything that is done to interfere with our ports and slow productivity has a direct impact on Australians. Exports, in fact, make up around a quarter of Australia's gross domestic product. It also, as we know, the port, they employ hundreds of thousands of Australians right across our great country. And as we also know, Australians themselves rely on many important goods in their everyday lives. And in the lead up to Christmas in particular, when people are out there, they are spending money and businesses are looking to get access to the products that they need, we need to ensure our ports operate both smoothly and efficiently. But, Mr President, what we do know is that there is an ongoing threat of further industrial action at our ports prior to Christmas. And this certainly for all of those businesses out there who rely on getting their product into the country, this is of great worry to them. The Morrison government does, of course, continue to be briefed regularly on this threat and supply chain pressures. The National Coordination Mechanism is meeting weekly with industry players in the lead up to Christmas. And the one thing that we continue to say to the parties involved uh, in this dispute is negotiate in good faith and please resolve your issues. But at the same time, the government's position is very, very clear. The Morrison government stands ready to take action if needed to protect the Australian economy from serious harm. Mr President, we will stand up for all of those businesses out there, for all of those Australians out there, and make sure that at this time of the year they have Minister, access to the goods they need. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. With Australia being a trading nation, how important is it for Australians and Australian businesses to have both a working and productive waterfront? Before I call the minister, there is a lot of discussion happening on my left. All interjections are disorderly. Senator Wong, you are not helping. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as we all know, inefficient ports end up being a tax on all of us. They end up costing Australians money. They can end up costing businesses jobs. Uh, that is not good for any of us. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government have taken action to improve the productivity of our ports through infrastructure projects, but also through removing regulatory roadblocks for trade. We've introduced the simplified trade system which has been streamlining compliance costs for Australian importers and exporters whilst upgrading our legacy ICT systems. Whilst this is working, we know that productivity at our ports remains a challenge. This has been going on for a very, very long time, and in particular in impacting Australia's maritime supply chains. So what the Treasurer will do is release terms of reference for a Productivity Commission inquiry into the efficiency of our maritime logistics system. We need to ensure that the productivity on our ports is as best Minister. as it can be. 
Senator Betts, a second I thank the Minister for the good news about the Productivity Commission inquiry and ask further what risks is the Minister aware of to a productive and efficient shipping industry, particularly to our mum Order. and dad family businesses? Minister. Order. Senator Ayres. Minister. Well, thank you, and I'll take that interjection from Senator Ayres, because Senator Ayres is actually not the New South Wales government. Um, it is a potential Albanese Senator government. Ayres. That is actually the risk. Uh, to port productivity in Australia. Because, Mr President, what you have is a potential Albanese government that is beholden to the unions, a government that is beholden to the MUA. Now, if you are beholden to the MUA, what that means is if you do need to step up and take action to ensure that Senator Australian McAllister. families they can get access Senator to the goods and McAllister. services they need, Australian businesses they can get access to the product they need, you won't be able to say no. And that is not a good thing, Mr. President. That is not a good thing because when you have an inefficient port system, when you have action being taken that quite literally closes things down, you need a government that is strong. You need a government that understands productivity on our ports is essential to ensuring that, in particular, our economic recovery from COVID-19 continues. Senator Ayres, don't interject My during your own question. You have the call. <laughs> Crikey. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Mackenzie. The Minerals Council of Australia has admitted that mine workers employed as casuals by labour hire companies are paid, on average, 24 per cent less than permanent employees of the, of the mine operator. Does the Deputy Prime Minister support labour hire being used to undermine the pay of mine workers in regional Australia? The Minister, the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And on behalf of the Deputy Prime Minister, what we do support is an ongoing uh, investment in a sustainable and responsible and economically viable uh, minerals industry so that workers in the resources industry right across uh, not just central Queensland but your own home state of New South Wales can have sustainable, rewarding careers in an industry that not just underpins local economies in regional Australia Minister. but indeed. Minister. Senator. But it's very clear, relevance, it's very clear that she is not going to remotely go close uh, to answering the question, which was, if I can remind you, about whether the Deputy Prime Minister supports labour hire being used to undermine the pay of mine workers in regional Australia. Senator Ayres, I, I, I think we do need to acknowledge that the Minister had only just started her answer. Uh, you've brought her back. To your question, Minister, you have the call. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I didn't forget your question. I was just reiterating the National Party and the Liberal Party's commitment to a sustainable uh, resources sector to ensure that these workers are absolutely being employed. And I'm just wondering, uh, post next election, when, if you're planning to be in alliance and coalition with the Greens, whether you will actually hold the same. Uh, views and whether the workers that you seek to purport that you represent and stand up for in this place uh, will actually be looking to you and saying, why didn't you stand up for us? Why didn't you back a coal industry? Why didn't you back a gas industry? These guys want to shut everything down. Uh, so whether we absolutely, if it has the word fossil Minister, in it. Minister, Minister, on a point of order. Make the point of order. Do Are you rising on a point of order, Senator Ayres? I am. I am. I am, President. I know that the minister wants to stick to the partisan talking Minute, points. What is the point of order? But the point of order is relevant. She is not. She is not in the same galaxy as the question is. Senator Ayres, Minister, I will bring you back to the question. It was a reasonably narrowly framed question. I believe you were going to the question, but I will bring you back to the question. 
Minister, you have the call. You have 38 seconds remaining. Thank you. Well, the government believes in a workplace relations system that promotes fair, safe, harmonious and productive workplaces. That encourages employers and employees to work together, not a system that pits them against each other. When it comes to labour hire specifically, which is a proportion of all employees, uh, has been stable at less than 2 per cent of the last decade. Of the nearly 13 million employed Australians, less than 115,000 were employees paid by a labour hire firm. That is only 1.1 per cent of all employees. The record high of 1.5 per cent was recorded under a previous Labor Minister, government in both 2008. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Deputy Prime Minister Joyce refused to answer a question about the impact of same job, same pay in regional Australia last week, handballing it to Minister Fletcher, who claimed, and I quote, this so-called same job, same pay issue is essentially a made-up issue. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Mr Fletcher that same job, same pay is a made-up issue? Minister. Order. Well, I, I assume that Senator Ayres is actually referring to um, his bill. Um, and what I'm actually wanting to put on the table is what the government's view is around labour hire companies. My advice is that almost all labour hire companies actually use enterprise agreements that are signed off uh, and by the CFMMEU. We support, uh, as a government, an industrial relations system. Uh, the government doesn't actually set the wages. That's a negotiated outcome uh, between workers. Uh, yeah, let's remember who actually set up the fair work that we're uh, Minister, system that, that we're operating under. Minister, uh, Minister, sorry, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on uh, a point uh, of order. Uh, yes, I wondered if uh, direct relevance. We are actually putting a direct quote to the minister and asking. Uh, if the Deputy Prime Minister agrees with Mr Fletcher that same job, same pay is a quote, made up issue, end quote. I've allowed you to restate the question to the Minister. Uh, Minister, you have the call. Well, what I'm going to in answering the question is actually that our government supports an industrial relations system which relates to jobs, which relates to wages, who gets paid for what, when and where, and I've been directly Order. relevant to the question uh, in both my first answer and in my second. In terms of helping our, go our nation recover from COVID-19— Time. Sorry, Minister. Please resume your seat. Time. <laughs> Senator Ayres, second supplementary question. BHP, the largest miner in Australia, told the Senate Job Security Committee that more than half of its workers at mine sites nationwide are employed by labour hire or other contractors. Does the Deputy Prime Minister believe that two mine workers in regional Australia doing exactly the same job should get the same pay? Minister. Well, I am sure that the Deputy Prime Minister wants businesses in this country to operate under legally and, and under the law. We want to make sure that we have rewarding, sustainable careers, not just in the mining industry, Senator Ayres, but right across the economy in regional Australia, and for people, local workers, to be paid correctly and fairly for the work that they do. Um, and that is why, under your fair work system, we've done the changes that we have been able to get through um, in this particular period of government. But we want to make sure that employees are protected, that they are having rewarding Minister, careers. Please resume your seat. Senator Ayres, on a point of order. Not, not remotely relevant. Each of these questions constructed, as you, as you indicated early, quite narrowly. The, the question was, does the Deputy Prime Minister believe that two mine workers working side by side, doing the same job, should get the same pay? And she hasn't come close Senator to Ayres. beginning Senator answering Ayres. that question. Senator Ayres, you have, you have restated a part of the question. Senator McKenzie, I believe, was being relevant to the question. Uh, I will return to Senator McKenzie. 
Well, in my previous answer, as I uh, stated, the um, enterprise agreements negotiated in the coal mining industry are signed Order. off by the CFMEU. And so, if you have an issue with how people are actually being paid in that area, maybe you need to go see your mates. Your private members' bill is actually discouraging employment <coughs> right Sen across Minister, Australia. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Attorney General. There has been extensive criticism of the government's Integrity Commission model, judged to be the weakest in Australia. We've been told repeatedly that the department and the attorney have been considering feedback received during multiple rounds of consultation. At estimates in March this year, both the department and Assistant Minister Stoker said of the draft exposure bill, quote, we've identified some ways in which it could be improved. We're quite sincere in our desire to reflect that feedback in the next version, end quote. Yet the Prime Minister and several other ministers have this week said that the government's proposal remains unchanged from the exposure draft. Why hasn't feedback been taken into account? Was it always just sham consultation to allow you to delay tabling your bill? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Waters, no. Uh, the consultation was General Ryan consultation, and certainly the issue we have is this. We have a bill to deliver a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. That is a bill that we have. It is a bill that has been out there. Not only do we have a bill, Mr. President, Senator Waters, we have actually committed funding to actually fund the body when it gets up, $150 million. We have consulted widely on its structure. And what our proposed model will do will build on the already strong anti-corruption arrangements that exist at the Commonwealth level. We have released our bill to the public. And in fact, if you were to join us, we could forget about the Labor Party because they just want a political witch hunt. They just want a political witch hunt when it comes to a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. They are not interested, Senator Waters, in a model that ensures that integrity is pursued in a manner Minister, which— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters, on a point of order. Yes, a point of order on relevance. My question went to whether or not feedback from the consultation has been reflected in the draft or not. Nobody wants to hear a lecture Senator about the order. politics. Senator Waters, I was listening to the minister. Uh, I, there was also a long preamble, and as you know, direct relevance is judged on the whole question, not merely the last part of a question. Uh, Attorney General, you have the call. Thank you. Well, as I was saying, but you see, Senator Waters, unfortunately, from that comment, I'm going to assume that you also do not want to support the Commonwealth government's Commonwealth Integrity Commission. The fact of the matter is, we have a model. The bill is out there. We have funded the model, Senator Waters. We have released our bill to implement it. But this should be something that is not just bipartisan. It should be a multi-partisan approach to putting in place a model, Mr. President, that ensures that integrity is pursued in a manner which respects due process, due process and democracy. And clearly, from your comments, Senator Waters, you are also not interested in doing that. If you are interested in a political witch hunt, nothing more and nothing less, then that is not something we are going to agree on. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. At the National Press Club today, Geoffrey Watson QC <laughs> said that public hearings, where the ICAC has determined that they're in the public interest, are, as, are you going to make some more interjections? <laughs> I dare you. Order. Or can I ask my question? Order. Order. Yes, this is question time. I do Order. get to ask you questions. That this is, is how this works. This is not a time for discussion across the. Senator Waters, resume your seat. Order on my right. The questioner and the person answering the question should both be heard in silence. Senator Waters, uh, please continue your question. Thank you, President. So, as I was saying, Geoffrey Watson QC said that public hearings, where the ICAC has determined that they're in the public interest, are essential to deter maladministration, expose corruption, earn public trust, and allow ICAC findings and processes to be interrogated. And yet, members of this government have described it as a witch hunt, as kangaroo court, and the Spanish Inquisition. 
Senator Why does the government continue to demonise transparency and continue the protection racket you've been running for years? Senator Waters, I allowed you to continue there as you were interrupted during your questioning, but I believe, to be honest, that question would have gone over time regardless. So I will give the Attorney General the call. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad you actually allowed Senator Waters to run over time because I didn't hear everything she said, but I did catch the words Spanish Inquisition. And you see, Senator Waters, that is exactly what we are not going to pursue a Spanish Inquisition. Because at the end of the day, this needs to be a body, a body which ensures integrity is pursued in a manner which respects both due process. Mr. President, and democracy. Senator Waters seems to forget, and the Labor Party do seem to forget as well. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission is to investigate corruption, serious corruption. It is not a tool that is to be used to wear vexatious and politically motivated claims. You want a Spanish Inquisition. That is not something that we are going to support. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. At the press club today, former chair of the Law Council of Australia and now counsel of the uh, Civil Liberties, Pauline Wright, said that the threshold set by the government's model would prevent most matters from even being investigated, and she described that as unconscionable. Why is the government proposing an integrity commission that would not be able to investigate most breaches of integrity? The Attorney General. Well, I completely disagree uh, with what Senator Waters has just quoted. Mr President, the government's model that we have put forward builds on the already strong anti-corruption arrangements that already exist at the Commonwealth level. Senator the body that Waters. we put forward would be a specialised investigation body for the most serious forms of corruption with the resources and powers necessary to fulfil that role. At the same time, and for some reason the Australian Greens don't seem to agree with this, the body Senator will have Lyons. appropriate safeguards to protect Senator Waters, the rights and reputations of the people in, it investigates, but also robust oversight through an independent inspector general and a dedicated parliamentary committee. The telling words, Senator Waters, from everything that you have said is Spanish Inquisition. Spanish Inquisition. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the steps the Liberal and Nationals government has taken this year in relation to supporting Australian women and focusing on their safety? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Yesterday's report on Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has underscored the task that is ahead of us, both here and nationally, a task to which we as a government are very strongly committed. Too many Australians, particularly women, do continue to face harassment, violence and inequality across the country. However, we have made progress in important areas. Addressing inequality is fundamental, and that is why the Morrison government is supporting women's leadership and strengthening women's options by helping to enhance economic security. We have established a cabinet task force dedicated to women's safety and economic security, including ministers with specific responsibility in those areas. And I acknowledge Senator Rustin, Senator Hume and Senator Stoker and their roles. Our women's budget statement is investing a record $1.1 billion in women's safety. Our measures include the Escaping Violence Payment, the Safe Places Program, with 780 additional emergency accommodation places for women and children, the Stop It at the Start campaign about creating more respectful attitudes. We have funded or fully implemented most of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report, with further work underway. And we are finalising the next national plan to end violence against women and their children following a valuable and important national summit. We have also funded national partnerships with states and territories for frontline services during COVID-19. 
Just as within parliament we must work across parties in addressing these issues, nationally we must work between governments, with the private sector, community and advocacy groups and frontline organisations. Mr President, this is a task for all Australians. Senator Hughes, a Thank you, Mr. supplementary President. question. Can the minister outline the government's investments in women's economic security and workforce participation? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Through a $1.9 billion investment in the women's budget statement of May of this year and our broader policies, the Morrison government is working to build women's economic security and to grow women's workforce participation. We've increased the childcare subsidy to make childcare more affordable. Our Boosting Female Founders program has awarded nearly $12 million to 51 women-owned and led startups. Our Career Revive program is supporting 60 additional employers to attract or retain women after they take a career break, and the Family Home Guarantee is supporting single parents to buy a home. We know the COVID pandemic has had a particular impact on women's employment, but our economic recovery plan has helped create jobs, rebuild our economy and provide the conditions to enhance women's economic security. We will continue to focus on these tasks as we build the recovery. Senator Hughes, a Thank second you, supplementary President. question. Can the minister also outline to the Senate the government's support for women's leadership and equality? Minister. Mr President, this government is strongly committed to supporting more women into leadership positions. We've expanded the successful Women's Leadership and Development Program and funded over 70 projects across Australia in both urban and regional areas that support around 50,000 women and girls into employment and leadership opportunities. Our Academy for Enterprising Girls, for example, is developing young women's skills in entrepreneurship, now supporting over 6,300 students. We're also leading by example. We are less than half a percent away from our goal of having 50 per cent of women holding government board positions. We set that target and we will meet it. Under the Morrison government, the gender pay gap has narrowed to its lowest level on record at 13.4 per cent, but I acknowledge and recognise that the impact of COVID-19 and consecutive lockdowns has impacted that figure. Continuing to narrow the gap and enhance women's leadership and equality remain our priorities. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Senator Fairavanti Wells has described the draft Commonwealth Integrity Commission model put up by the Morrison Joyce government as, and I quote, the weakest and least effective integrity agency in the country. Is Senator Fairavanti Wells right? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Urquhart for her question. Um, the, uh, the answer to her question, in short, is no. Um, uh, now, Mr. President, uh, the model that, uh, that Senator Cash indeed was speaking about in the chamber uh, just before uh, is a model that has, uh, has been carefully developed uh, to ensure that it focuses where an integrity commission should focus in terms of the elimination of corruption, in terms of tackling yes. corruption in public office. Uh, and in terms of ensuring, ensuring, Mr. President, uh, that officials, public officials, office holders uh, are held to account, uh, and that you do prevent effectively that, it builds upon what is a very strong existing framework uh, in the Commonwealth government. Uh, we should never underplay the important role that our existing integrity agencies, police agencies, and others play in relation to ensuring uh, that the law is upheld in Australia uh, and that we do have uh, one, of, uh, one of the best systems yep. arguably in the world in terms of the transparency, the accountability and the legal arrangements that apply uh, in our country to Order. ensure, uh, to ensure uh, that in this country uh, everyone is held to account and everyone operates within the law. But the government recognises uh, the opportunity uh, to be able to enhance that framework, and that's the work that Senator Cash and her predecessor have done in developing this model, developing a model uh, that is underpinned by hundreds of pages of legislation. I remind through you, Mr. President, Senator Urquhart Order and her colleagues, uh, that the Labor Party's Integrity Commission uh, is a two-page glossy brochure at present. So, Senator Cash. Hundreds of pages of legislation yes. Yes. Uh, that, if the Labor Party were yes. willing to back it, could be passed through this parliament. Absolutely. Senator Urquhart, you and your team 
two pages, nice glossy brochure. Congratulations to those who did the design work, uh, but of course it's not actually an integrity commission model at all. Senator Rickert, a supplementary question. Senator Fear of Andy Wells has also said, and I quote, negative public perceptions are compounded when politicians dig their heels in, spin the story and fail to take responsibility for their actions. Is Senator Fear of Andy Wells referring to Mr Morrison? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Senator Fear of Anti Wells is, uh, is as entitled as any of the other 75 senators elected to this place uh, to come into this chamber uh, to provide speeches, to give general reflections in relation to uh, the way in which the way in which uh, politics operates. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I recognise the enormous contribution that Senator Fear of Anti Wells makes on behalf of New South Wales. Uh, to, uh, to our party and to our government in particular, and has done so through a wide range of different roles, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but, Mr. Order. President, uh, I know as well that the model for an integrity commission we have developed uh, is a sound model, a model that strikes the balance of ensuring that we would have an integrity commission focused on rooting out corruption, on prosecuting where applicable but not, Mr President, on show trials. And I know those opposite just want show trials. They just want politics. We actually want effective reform. Minister, Sen order. <laughs> Senator McAllister. <laughs> Senator Urquhart, second supplementary question. Senator Fear of Andy Wells has asked, and I quote, those who resist the introduction of an effective federal integrity body raise people's curiosity. One has to ask the question, are they conflicted? Why are they resisting the implementation of such a body? What is Mr Morrison trying to hide from the last eight years? Minister. Thanks, uh, th thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, we're a government Order. that proudly turns up answers questions, even sometimes quite silly ones, works our way through all the different processes uh, and, indeed, Senator in having Keneally. said that we would develop Senator an integrity Arneal. commission, we spelled out the type of integrity commission that we would develop. We have gone through Senator the process Ayers. of developing that into legislation. We have the legislation there. We have budgeted $150 million uh, to, ensure, to support it and to provide for it. And Mi the only barrier, Mr President, the Minister. only barrier to it Minister. actually Passing Minister. into law are those Minister. opposite who say those opposite. Minister, resume your seat to, until there is silence in the chamber. Qu Pe Senator Wong, it's an answer to one of your questions, Senator Wong. You possibly should be listening to the answer. Interjections are always disorderly. I cannot hear the minister, and he's standing only a few metres from me. Minister, you have the call. Now, now Mr. President, their, their two-page glossy was developed by the member for Isaacs, the shadow attorney general. But of course, we know his track record, which shows what the Labor Party really want. He sought on nine different occasions uh, to refer matters to the Australian Federal Police, and they've all been tossed out because it's all just about frivolous politics, all about show trials, all about smearing and allegations by those opposite. Minister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is committed to keeping Australian women and all Australians safe online? The Minister representing the Minister of Communications, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question. Mr President, the Morrison government has been at the forefront of delivering measures designed to give people the protection of the rule of law online, just as they have it offline. We cannot accept a situation in which social media is a place where cowards use the shield of anonymity to bully, harass and ruin lives. For too long, Trolls, bots and bigots have flourished online behind a digital curtain of anonymity. Mr President, that's why we on this side of the chamber have been steadfastly committed to measures that keep Australians, particularly women and children, safe online. Yeah. 
This government established the world first e-safety commissioner and the legislation to deal with abhorrent violent material online. This year we passed the Online Safety Act, which will take effect in January. And this act gives the e-safety commissioner new powers and digital platforms more responsibility, a new cyber, adult cyber abuse takedown scheme and a stronger cyberbullying scheme, reducing takedown periods from 48 hours down to 24 hours, giving the e-safety commissioner power to respond more quickly to the worst of the worst content, such as child sexual abuse material, no matter where it's hosted. And importantly, Mr. President, we've provided Australia's eSafety Commissioner the power to order tech companies to report on how they are responding to these harms, so that Australian parents know what these families, what these companies are doing to make their products safe for kids and families. If the platforms don't respond, they can expect hefty fines of over half a million dollars. Mr. President, since we came to government, the coalition has not stopped fighting to keep Australians safe online, whether it's the Online Safety Act, the recently announced anti-trolling bill. And these measures are all part of our plan to keep Australians safe online. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how the government's strong stance on online safety will be bolstered through the proposed new anti-trolling laws? Minister. Thank you again, Mr President. The Morrison government is acting urgently to develop world-leading reforms to protect all Australians who maintain social media accounts. This legislation will protect social media users from liability when third parties post defamatory comments on their page and will also empower Australians to unmask anonymous originators of defamatory comments and, and content. Mr President, we want to give a voice and a pathway forward to the voiceless and protect the unfairly targeted, like the young woman are suffering unwarranted attacks about her appearance or perceived sexuality, or the parents struggling to figure out how to stop the cyberbullying of their teenage daughter. These reforms will permit more Australians to seek redress for online harms, because anonymity should not be weaponised to abuse, to harass, bully or destroy people's reputations. The Morrison government is committed to keeping Australian women and indeed all Australians safe at all times in the real world and online. Well Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline any other initiatives that will work towards protecting Australians online and how these build on the government's previous investments? Minister. Thank you again, Mr. President. Yes, Mr. President, in addition to the new powers that force global social media giants to unmask anonymous online trolls, the Morrison government has today announced a parliamentary committee to put big tech under the microscope. Australians are rightly concerned about whether big Order. tech is in fact doing enough to keep kids safe online. And as the Prime Minister said, big tech created these platforms. They have a responsibility to ensure that their users are safe. Big Tech has big questions to answer. But we want to hear from Australians, from real Australians, from teachers, from parents, from athletes, from small businesses and more about their experience and what it is that they want to see change. This inquiry will give Australians the opportunity to air concerns and give the opportunity for the tech companies to Order. deliver solutions. Mr President, the Morrison government is committed Senator to keeping Australians safe at all times in the real world and online. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to uh, the Finance Minister, um, Minister Birmingham, with the WHO declaring Omicron a COVID variant of concern, which could lead to further restrictions, has already led to border closures. Australia's live music and entertainment industries are again in chaos, concerned that they don't have the insurance to cover them in the upcoming seasons. They have issued an urgent call to your government and the Prime Minister to step in and fund a government insurance scheme for them. When will the Prime Minister do this, and why is the Prime Minister risking the small businesses and this economy simply because your refusal to act? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson-Young 
uh, for her question. At, uh, at the outset, as I've said, um, I think on every day so far this week, I do uh, urge um, caution in relation to uh, some of the commentary around uh, the Omicron variant uh, of COVID-19. Uh, that, uh, that whilst uh, there are still things that are not known about it yet, which is why some precautionary steps have been taken, uh, such as the two-week uh, deferral uh, of Australia's uh, reopening for movement of, uh, of students uh, um, and other particular visa category holders. Uh, it is the case that, uh, that um, many experts are highlighting uh, that, uh, that perhaps some of the concerns around this variant uh, are less than, uh, than perhaps were first thought in the initial couple of days after it became more publicly aware. Nonetheless, we take the matter seriously. We have also taken quite seriously support for the creative economy, Mr President. Uh, our creative economy COVID support package uh, was originally $250 million. Uh, we have since then increased it to over $475 million. That is in addition, that's in addition to some $730 million provided uh, to creative and performing arts subdivision uh, of industry through JobKeeper, uh, and about $119 million are provided in cash flow payments uh, to creative and performing arts organisations. And so, Mr. President, uh, altogether, uh, you can see that, uh, that the COVID support uh, has been well in excess of $1 billion through a range of different measures. Uh, that is uh, in addition uh, to the business as usual funding provided uh, to the arts sector at around $750 million uh, per annum that, uh, that the government provides, uh, along with other additional support. So, uh, Mr President, uh, I do not accept the characterisation from Senator Hanson Young in relation to an absence of support. Support has been significant, uh, it has been extensive, and it has been expanded throughout the course of the pandemic. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question uh, was specifically in relation to an insurance uh, support program, a guarantee for insurance. There is a market failure. Other countries have recognised this. The UK, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, New Zealand have all put in place insurance schemes to fill this market gap. That is the role of government. Why won't you act? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the $200 million RISE program, the Restart Investment to Sustain and Expand Fund, um, uh, indeed uh, delivers on some of the objectives that Senator Hanson Young is precisely asking about in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, programs uh, and initiatives to be able uh, to restart uh, that when events are postponed. Uh, due to COVID restrictions, we have been working with funding recipients uh, to assist them in relation to uh, the rescheduling. Uh, the funding is there uh, to provide, and to provide, in a sense, uh, that support, that underwriting, uh, to ensure that an event uh, can proceed, uh, even if there are uh, concerns and doubts that exist around that. Uh, now, it doesn't, and the Commonwealth government's programs don't operate in isolation. Uh, they operate, of course, alongside uh, many state government. Uh, ventures, and, uh, and it is not unusual for many of these uh, major events in particular uh, to, in fact, be operated often by state government agencies and instrumentalities too. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary. Minister, last year the Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian and made a bunch of promises for the live music and entertainment industry. Very little of that has come to fruition. Now we see the industry on its knees begging you, begging you to act to stop them from going bust. Prime Minister, what would Guy Sebastian say? Minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not actually the Prime Minister, and nor am I actually Guy Sebastian. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not particularly well placed to. Uh, to Necessarily address uh, those uh, those aspects in that form, Senator Hanson. Oh, um, sorry, no. Minister. <laughs> Senator Hanson Young, on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'd just like to correct the record. I didn't mean to give Senator Birmingham a, a promotion he will never actually achieve. I take that back. Uh, so starting, to, starting to look a lot like Christmas. Minister. 
It cuts deep, Senator Hanson Young, I heard. It really does. Anyway, anyway, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, we. Uh, I'm definitely not going to sing. That's uh, that's true, um, Mr. President. Um, these are serious issues, and it is why more than one billion dollars of additional COVID-19 assistance uh, has been provided to the creative industries, uh, and the live performance industry being a key part of that. But in addition to all of those funding principles, the work in the national plan to help drive reopening is a key part of that, and it is something that our government has led and encouraged the states and territories to follow to make sure these sectors can get back to business, which I know Minister, is what they want to do most. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Glen Ira Council revealed that their future funding was threatened by Minister Fletcher when they questioned the benefit of two car park projects based in the Liberal seat of Goldstein. Mr Fletcher's letter states, and I quote, such a decision could well have the long-term consequence of reducing the chance of future applications for Commonwealth funding for the city of Glen Ira being successful. Why did the minister threaten the council? What a the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Walsh for her question. I am not familiar with the correspondence to which she is referring. Perhaps she could table that correspondence so that we could all become familiar with that correspondence. What I can say is that the provision of commuter car parks under the Urban Gest Congestion Fund was an important commitment and part of the Australian government's budgeted $5 million, the part of the, uh, $5 million towards, uh, uh, sorry, ex more than $5 million towards, uh, towards busting congestion, reducing time, thank you, reducing time that people spend going to work, coming home from work and spending more time with their families. And we know that this is an important election commitment. It was not just an election commitment, it was a budgeted commitment. We know how important it was because it was very similar. It was a very similar program to that of the Labor Party. In fact, the Labor Party Park and Ride Fund was almost, almost identical. In fact, it was announced the day after it was announced by uh, then uh, opposition leader Bill Shorten, in fact, there were announcements of commuter car parks in places like Woi Woi. Woi Woi. The day after, the day after that the uh, urban the, 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 the fund was announced, that it was announced by Woi Woi. In fact, uh, by Deb O'Neill, uh, Senator Deb O'Neill. Does that sound right to Senator oh. O'Neill? You announced oh. a car Order. park. A car park. Order. That's extraordinary. Minister. Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order, order. direct relevance. The question went to why the Mr. Fletcher threatened the council. The minister says she's not aware. I have here the letter from Mr. Fletcher, in which the threat is made. I seek leave to table it so the minister could actually respond directly to the question. Is leave granted? Sorry, I'll just. Seeking clarification, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator, uh, uh, sorry, Minister, I'll just rule on the point of order. I will, I will bring you back to the question. Um, uh, it was a reasonably specific question. I will uh, bring you back to the question, and you have the call for 35 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank very much Senator Wong for um, obliging the opposite, for obliging the government with a copy of the letter. It would have been much handier if we had have had that at the beginning of the question, yeah, rather than in the middle. What I can Order. tell you, what I can Order. tell you, Order. if you would like us to respond, Order. I would understand. Order. If you would like us to Order. respond to a piece of correspondence, it would be very handy if we actually had the correspondence in front of us Minna while Senator we're asking Wong. the question. But that's all right. Senator you can do a little bit of political Senator point Ineo. scoring. What I can tell you is that in 2018, yes. Glen Ira Council provided the member for Goldstein with a set of project proposals that included a commuter car park around, um, up upgrades in Bentley and in Elsterwick. Now, as is the prerogative of all Minister, members of the House. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. 
An independent report found that the proposed commuter car parks wouldn't remove cars from the road, but would actually increase congestion around the car parks. How many car parks will the Morrison Joyce Order. government fund for their own political purposes against the advice of their departments and the wishes Order. of state and local governments who actually deliver them? Minister. Uh, thank you very much again, Mr. President. What I can say that, and what I was continuing to say is that the prerogative, as is the prerogative of all members of the House, the member for Goldstein advocated for his community and he successfully secured funding for those projects in Glen Ira. Now, on those projects, the Mayor of the Council said in August 2020 that substantial Order, federal government funding. Senator O'Neill. Substantial Senator federal government Minister, funding. Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. There's no, Senator O'Neill, please withdraw. Oh, I didn't call her. I sorry, I may have misheard. Senator O'Neill, if you did not I say something disorderly. I did not use the word disorderly. you don't want me to name again, but I did say about truth. Yes. Senate Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Neill for her good manners. On the projects, the Mayor of the Council said in August 2020 that substantial federal government, and I'm quoting, and I know you love a good quote, Senator O'Neill, substantial federal government funding has allowed us Order. to bring forward these two. I'm sorry, Senator Wong. Order. I can't hear myself, let alone Senator Order. Wong. Order. Senator Wong. Um, Minister, you have the call. Thank you. Substantial federal government funding has allowed us, this is from the Council, Order. to bring forward these two priority projects. Meaning that Order. this is from the Council. This Minister, is from the Council. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh, resume your seat. Senator Walsh, resume your seat. We will not recommence until there is silence in the chamber. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. Given the council said the proposed car parks would create more congestion, can the minister confirm this money was just another taxpayer-funded rort to get Mr Tim Wilson re-elected in Goldstein? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I suggest that, that can I suggest that Mr. Wilson has absolutely no problem beating whatever candidate you put up in Goldstein? <laughs> what I can say. What I can say is that what we are seeing, Order. what we are seeing, is nothing more than a petty Order. partisan stunt by Labor and, dare I say, by Order. the Greens councillors yeah. in Glenara, who are determined to strip their own constituents of hard-won funding to generate a headline and score a cheap political point. I wonder who they learned that from. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Order. President. Uh, my question is to my fellow West Australian uh, Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds, and a question that I think we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll all be united on in asking. Uh, can the Minister please advise the Senate why International Day of People with Disability is so important? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you also to Senator O'Sullivan for your commitment to people with disability right across our nation. Here in this place, we often focus on what divides us instead of those things that unite us and achieve Order. what Order. you could be proud of. Senator Thorpe, is this a point of order? <sighs> point of order. Point on. of order. Senator Thorpe, what is the point of order on? In the last eight hours, we've had Senator two Thorpe, Aboriginal women there is die no point in of order. custody. Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. There is no point of order. There is no point of order. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Order. Order. Order in the chamber. 
Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, and I think that was a great example of one of the things that can in inadvertently divide us in this chamber. But this Friday, the 3rd of December, is International uh, Day of People with Disability. And it's a great opportunity for us all in this chamber to focus on the things that unite us and the achievements that we can all be proud of. This day is about recognising people with disability and how we all support them to realise their aspirations and realise their full potential. The NDIS plays a critically important role in supporting 480,000 Australians to achieve their own life goals, just as we all aspire to do. And let me share with you one of the 480,000 individual stories of how the NDIS is changing lives. Mr Kupix from Victoria recently wrote to me and said that my support worker and the NDIS funding have provided me with the opportunities I never ever thought I would have again. The letter goes on saying how exercise, healthy eating and getting outside to enjoy the sunshine has been completely life-changing for him as it allows Mr Kupix to stay positive and also to continue Order to work. Order in the chamber. He also said that I can't be thankful enough for my government implementing the NDIS. On International Day of People with Disability, we unite across the political divide to acknowledge the contribution of people with disability and our bipartisan, in fact multi-partisan, support for their aspirations. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, how is the NDIS helping to deliver us on Australia's commitment to implementing the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disability? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again for the question. Australians can also be incredibly proud that we were one of the first nations in 2007 to sign the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. We can also be very proud that we continue to lead the world in implementation. And again, the NDIS is a great example of this as a world-first scheme that promotes dignity and respect and puts participants at the heart of decision-making about their own lives and about what they aspire to achieve. Choice and control means that NDIS participants are more able to participate in our community and in society, both economically, personally, and also to live their lives independently. The Morrison government is committed to ensuring that the NDIS endures and continues to deliver for the 480,000 participants and also on their families whose lives have been changed by this scheme. Senator O'Sullivan, a second supplementary question. Mr. President, I thank the minister for that answer. Uh, how is the Liberal and National Government ensuring that all NDIS participants are provided opportunities to participate and achieve their goals? Minister. Uh, well, thank you very much again for that question. The NDIS has been transformative for hundreds of thousands of Australians with permanent and very significant disability. And it's also important to remember that it not only changes their lives, but it also changes the lives of their family and also for those who love and care for them. And being a world's first scheme, there were bound to be some teething issues with the scheme still being designed as it was rolled out to welcome hundreds of thousands of individuals into the scheme. But with eight years' experience behind us now, now is the time to again work together to mature and to evolve the scheme. Can I just say uh, I'd like to thank the states and territories and also in particular the disability representative organisations for their engagement on a wide range of issues and, um, and reforms to continue to improve the scheme. And I'll shortly be bringing forward a bill for the Senate to consider to further Minister, improve the participant experience. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice, and I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? There being <laughs> leave is not granted. Oh, sorry, Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Pursuant to contingent notice, standing in my name. 
I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide the, for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation uh, may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that the question now be put. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose.
Order in the chamber. Order. Senator Thorpe. Senator McKenzie. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. We all have to be responsible for our own actions. Allow the whips to do the count. Order. S Senator Thorpe. Senator Canavan. Senator Birmingham. This, Mr. President, can I, can I ask all senators, both those voting in the ayes and the noes, for silence to at least assist the tellers and the counters in this process? Of all corners of the chamber, please. There should be silence in the chamber during the counting of a division. <laughs> oh. No, it hasn't. I can try and refresh it. No, got nothing. There being 33 ayes, 8 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the next question that the suspension be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. I did. Stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the suspension be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 8. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Mr President, I move that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation, uh, which would uh, provide for more than three hours of additional consideration of legislation, may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put.
The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the question now be put. Eyes were passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the eyes and Senator McKim teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 8. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the motion that the, uh, I will now put that the precedence motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the precedence motion be agreed to. Uh, eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 8. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Thanks, Mr President. I move the motion as circulated. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. <laughs> This is the final. Stop the bells. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, tell her for the eyes. Senator McKim, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 8. The question is resolved in the affirmative, and I will call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number three, Telstra Corporation and other legislation, Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Bragg is in continuation. I'm just going to give uh, Senator Bragg a moment. You're in continuation. Um, terrific. Well, thanks very much, um, Acting Deputy President. It's a uh, Senator terrific... Bragg. You have the call. Thank you very much. Well, it's terrific to be able to make some remarks about uh, this Telstra Corporation uh, Amendment Bill, and um, I um, I 
note that uh, this bill still maintains a significant degree of control over this corporation, and I think it is incumbent upon us as the elected officials to consider the longer-term view here about uh, mass disruption of the technology industry, of telecommunications, uh, the role of uh, big tech organisations uh, and media disruption. Um, and we need to think about whether or not we should be sustaining highly detailed, um, quite prescriptive arrangements for particular companies that were once monopolies. I think that's a good question for us uh, to consider. Certainly in terms of uh, the, the current arrangements and the proposal that is before the chamber, now, this is an updating and upgrading of the, uh, the, the functioning of the, of the governance arrangements of the corporation. Um, I, mean, I think given that there's always been a, a heavy need to have regulation for telecommunications companies, uh, especially to provide uh, universal services into the regions, uh, it is of course appropriate that this be updated over time. But as I say, I think over the long, long term, we want to make sure that uh, we are having an economy that is governed by dynamic rules, that isn't stuck in the past, that isn't looking to uh, put in place arrangements which holds the country back. Uh, and uh, it's very important that uh, this particular bill pass now, but I do, su do suggest that uh, the chamber and the government and the parliament consider further opportunities uh, to upgrade all of our settings in this space. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, th thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I thank those senators who have contributed to the debate on the Telstra Corporation and other legislation, Amendment Bill 2021. I also thank the Senate Environment Communications Legislation Committee for its report on the bill and its recommendation that the bill be passed. This bill will amend a range of telecommunication legislation to maintain regulatory obligations that protect consumers and promote competition in response to Telstra's proposed restructure. These obligations cover core parts of Telstra's long-standing regulatory arrangements, including its corporate obligations put in place at the time of its privatisation. Without legislative amendment, there is a risk that Telstra's obligations would become less effective or cease to apply to its successor entities following this or any future restructure. While there have been significant changes in the telecommunication industry over the past decade, Telstra continues to play a key role nationally in both metropolitan, regional, rural and remote Australia. Telstra's role has long been underpinned by a range of regulated consumer safeguards, including the universal service obligation, which requires Telstra to deliver basic telephone and payphone services in rural and remote areas, the customer service guarantee, the network reliability framework, priority assistance, as well as the operation of the triple zero emergency call service. The effect of this legislation is that obligations which presently apply to Telstra under its current organisational structure will continue to apply following Telstra's restructuring. This in turn will be important to achieving the continued protection of consumers, promotion of competition and support of Telstra's public interest roles in Australia's telecommunications market. And I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those that have opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to Telstra and for other purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any member, any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to Telstra and for other purposes. Government Business Order of the Day, Autonomous Sanction Reform Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to 
speak on behalf of the Labor Party on the thematic sanctions bill, a bill which seeks to amend the Autonomous Sanctions Act 2011 to enable the listing thank you, of individuals and entities responsible for or complicit in egregious conduct, including the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, threats to international peace and security, malicious cyber activity, serious violations or serious abuses of human rights, activities undermining good governance or the rule of law, including serious corruption. This is an important addition to Australia's existing Autonomous Actions Act, introduced and passed by Labor in 2011. It significantly broadens the scope of, the acti of activities counter to Australia's interests for which financial sanctions may be applied. For the past 10 years, Australia's ability to implement sanctions against individuals was more limited to those responsible for the pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and threats to international peace and security and to regimes that committed grave human rights abuses or acts of aggression. These sanctions enabled Australia to take seriously our commitment, international commitments to peace and security by further augmenting pressure on foreign regimes where the UN Security Sex Council sanctions had been adopted, for example, those which were applied in relation to Iran and North Korea, as well as for Syria, Zimbabwe and Russia. But it has become increasingly apparent that an update and broadening of the scope of activities to which sanctions may be applied is necessary. We are more than 70 years, uh, Acting Deputy President, from the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as Eleanor Roosevelt described it, the International Magna Carta for All Mankind, or Humankind, with its foundations and the four freedoms proclaimed by her husband, freedom of speech, freedom to worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear, with its recognition that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and its implication that to be sincere, this must encompass civil and socio-economic rights. It remains as profound as ever, and perhaps it rem remains as aspirational as ever. Because while we have seen so many advances in human rights, we have also seen stagnation and we have seen deterioration. While the pandemic has fostered greater awareness and debate in some societies about the devastations of poverty and inequality, in other places, political <coughs> leaders have sought to manipulate the circumstances of the pandemic to further weaken human rights. But sadly, this is also not a new phenomenon. Sergei Magnitsky was a Russian lawyer and tax auditor who was hired in 2007 to investigate corruption by Russian Interior Ministry officials. After uncovering a $230 million US dollars scam, Magnitsky was arrested, detained and tortured, denied medical treatment and family visits. He died in prison in 2009 at the age of 37. And it is in his name that advocates around the world have sought to shed light on those individuals, that governments and regimes, that those individuals, governments and regimes, that use their power to crush dissent and resist accountability, and those that commit gross human rights violations. If the absence of sufficient global accountability mechanisms that raise the in the absence of sufficient global accountability mechanisms that raise the cost of such behaviour, it does fall to nation states to act. Previously, through our UN commitments, Australia targeted entire regimes for nefarious behaviours, grave abuses and serious risks to international peace and security. The Autonomous Sanctions Act that a Labor government legislated uh, brought forward and legislated in 2011 enabled sanctions that targeted countries and individuals independent of multilateral arrangements. And these have prov proved an important tool of Australia's foreign policy, targeting those responsible for egregious behaviours whilst limiting the negative consequence on others by depriving access to capital, goods and services. But it is clear we need to go beyond what has traditionally been the realm of sanctions, threats to international peace and security. We need to use sanctions to help support agreed international norms of human rights and to be a force for positive change. As the global Magnitsky movement has shown, depriving human rights abusers of their wealth and ability uh, to travel can hit them where it hurts. Magnitsky sanctions will ensure that those responsible cannot seek safe haven for themselves or for their assets in Australia. Legislation referencing Mr Magnitsky has been enacted in various jurisdictions, including the US, the European Union, Canada and the United Kingdom since 2012. In Australia, Labor and others have been calling for Australia to join our friends and partners in the introduction of Magnitsky-style sanctions for some time. 
As shown to Foreign Minister, I have previously raised the need for the such sanctions with the Turnbull and Morrison governments, including and with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. For some time, the prevailing view in the Morrison and Turnbull governments was that such a regime was not necessary, that the Autonomous Sanctions Act, introduced by Labor, already allowed for the listing of individuals and entities complicit in human rights abuses abroad. But Labor took the view that Australia being part of the global Magnitsky movement was in our national interests, because it is in our interest that we work to generate and preserve global public goods. Shaping the world for the better, something all of us in public life should aspire to, includes promoting issues and principles which we believe are of common benefit to all nations and all peoples. This is at the heart of Labor's foreign policy tradition. And Magnitsky sanctions and formalised engagements with NGOs to target those responsible for human rights abuses are contemporary expressions of that tradition. Enshrining in law those actions that are counter to our interests is an important signal to the perpetrators and beneficiaries of egregious human rights abuses, as well as threats to international peace and security. And working with our like-minded partners would enable effective and timely targeting of individuals and entities responsible for such conduct, whilst also minimising the impact on the broader population. In December last year, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade recommended the Australian Government enact standalone targeted sanctions legislation to address human rights violation and corruption, or well, that is, a Magnitsky Act that should be able to receive nominations from any sources. And I acknowledge the work of the committee, and in particular the Human Rights Subcommittee, uh, and particularly the Chair, Senator Fawcett, uh, Senator, Mr Andrews, who chaired the Human Rights sub Subcommittee, and the Labor members of, the, of that committee and the subcommittee, Ms Swanson, Senators Ayres and Kitching, uh, Mr Gorman, Mr Hayes, Mr Hill, Mr Khalil, and Senators McCarthy, O'Neill and Sheldon, and Ms Van Vakenu for their leadership and their work to bring this bill into existence. The Morrison government did not respond to the committee's recommendations uh, until August of this year, and it has taken a further three months for the bill to be introduced. Uh, whilst that it is a welcome step that the government has introduced it, the delay in introducing Magnitsky style sanctions has sent a regrettable message that Australia is not committed and that we do not take human rights seriously. And meanwhile, we have seen increasing and disturbing reports of human rights violations around the world. And in some places, political leaders have sought to manipulate the circumstances of the pandemic to further weaken human rights. Mr Magnitsky is not alone among those who seek to expose abuse and wrongdoings by those in power. As we speak today, Chinese citizen journalist Zhang Jian is on a hunger strike and at risk of dying without the urgent medical requirements she needs. Ms Zhang was sentenced to four years of prison in December 2020 for social media posts critical of the handling of the early COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. The 1st of February military coup in Myanmar was a direct attack on the country's ongoing democratic transition, uh, a democratic transition which Australia and Australians uh, had been uh, deeply supportive of. The subsequent violent crackdown against those protesting the coup saw thousands of political prisoners detained and civilians killed by security forces. Ten months have passed and Australia stands alone amongst the UK, United States, Canada and the European Union in refusing to apply any additional targeted sanctions against those responsible for the violence. And now we have reports that Australia's future fund, that is taxpayers' funds, has been investing in joint ventures with the Tatmadaw and Chinese weapons manufacturers dealing in Myanmar. I have written to the minister and expressed my deep concern about these reports. Our future fund should not be investing in Tatmadaw-linked entities and should not be profiting from the Tatmadaw's attack on Myanmar's democracy. Importantly, the regulations of this bill enable the listing of individuals or entities that engage in serious violations of a person's right not to be held in slavery or, to be, or be required to perform forced labour. Modern slavery is real. Modern slavery, including forced labour and forced marriage, still affects millions of people, including in our region. In 2017, an estimated 40 million people around the world were living in conditions of modern slavery, and 24.9 million of them were in forced labour situations. Research by the Walk Free Foundation has found that one in every 130 women and girls around the world is living in modern slavery. 
When it comes to criticising these violations, Australia cannot bring the moral credibility we need to the table unless we strengthen our own Modern Slavery Act. So I again continue my call on the Morrison government to work with us and the crossbench to improve the Modern Slavery Act, to introduce tougher penalties for non-compliance and to strengthen mandatory reporting requirements and possible exposures to abuses. Certainly, if elected, Labor will put place ending modern slavery uh, as a central priority of our international human rights engagement. And it, this would include sanctions against those directly profiting from forced labour and modern slavery. Uh, Mr. President, an Australian, it is incumbent upon the Australian government to prosecute our interests, including support for human rights and democratic freedoms. Decisions to implement sanctions against individuals and entities are and should remain executive decisions of government, which has to have to take account of all relevant factors, including foreign and strategic interests and implications for bilateral relations. But it would also be appropriate to consult more widely. The process leading up to this legislation has laid bare some of the deficiencies in the Morrison government's engagement with human rights advocates and diaspora community groups. So often, their insights, not to mention their real-time reporting and on-the-ground knowledge, have been ignored. Uh, and then, if elected, Labor would correct this. We also believe that the themes of the bill under which sanctions can be applied are insufficiently wide. That it does not cover the violations and rules, uh, violations of the rules and norms of armed conflict. It does not cover the crime of genocide or other crimes against humanity. It does not cover instances where rape and sexual violence are used as weapons of war. It does not cover the targeting of civilians nor the manipulation or blockage of humanitarian aid in conflict zones. And this is why we will amend this legislation to enshrine violations of international humanitarian law, the law of conflict, as an additional theme under which sanctions can be applied. And this is a view that has been clearly communicated, certainly to us, and I assume to the government, by human rights NGOs, including Human Rights Watch Australia and Save the Children. And I thank them publicly for their constructive engagement in providing feedback to the government's bill. And there is a further amendment I urge the government to consider. This is Australia's Magnitsky Act, which is why today we will move an amendment to include Magnitsky in the title of the bill as a strong signal of Australia's support for the global Magnitsky movement. Senator Rice. President, first up, I do want to thank the Foreign Minister and her office for, this work, for their work on this legislation. As the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade set out in a unanimous report, it's important that Australia adopt Magnitsky legislation and be part of the global Magnitsky movement to enable the application of targeted sanctions against human rights abusers. This legislation isn't called Magnitsky legislation, but in enacting this framework, Australia will be following in the steps of other countries around the world, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and others, who have created legislative frameworks to impose targeted sanctions against human rights abusers. And this legislation does not go as far as the unanimous committee report recommended, but it is a very good beginning. And I and the Greens will be moving amendments to strengthen and improve this legislation so it goes closer to the committee report um, unanimously recommended. But in talking about committee reports and bills and targeted sanctions frameworks, it's easy to lose sight of why this matters. It matters because this framework, when applied correctly, can be a tool to support human rights around the world and to respond to those who at attack and undermine them. I want to share the story of an anonymous prisoner who was taken captive by junta forces in Myanmar. The soldiers in rural Myanmar twisted the young man's skin with pliers and kicked him in the chest until he couldn't breathe. Then they taunted him about his family until his heart ached too. Your mum, they jeered, cannot save you anymore. The young man and his friend, randomly arrested as they rode their bikes home, were subject to hours of agony inside a town hall, transformed by the military into a torture centre. As the interrogators' blows rained down, their relentless questions tumbled through his mind. There was no break. It was constant, he says. 
And sadly, that isn't an isolated story. From the same reporting by AAP of torture by the junta forces, the prisoners came from every corner of the country and from various ethnic groups and ranged from a 16-year-old girl to monks. Some were detained for protesting against the military, others for no discernible reason. Multiple military units and police were involved in the interrogations and their methods of torture similar across Myanmar. The attacks by junta forces on human rights and democratic freedoms have been relentless since the coup in February this year. And I want to acknowledge the work of others in this place, including Senator Smith and the member for Wills in the other place and many others in this building, as we have worked together to highlight the horrific situation in Myanmar. Australia should respond to the human rights abuses that are occurring in Myanmar and elsewhere around the world. We think targeted sanctions are a good step and an important step in responding to those human rights abuses. And I use Myanmar as an example, but this issue is much broader and goes to countries around the world. Here in Australia, we must be doing more to address human rights violations. We cannot claim to impose sanctions with any credibility unless we are willing to uphold human rights here in Australia. That must start with justice for First Nations peoples, but address a whole range of issues. And I am proud to be part of the Greens that call out human rights abuses wherever they occur. And my heart goes out to the two First Nations women who we have just heard have died in custody in the last day. But it should, our response must include where human rights abuses occur in other countries as well. In West Papua, we've seen, we have seen attacks on civil populations. In the Philippines, protesters have been killed. In China, we have consistently called for action on targeted sanctions against the officials who have been responsible for the cultural genocide of the Uyghur people. Our approach to human rights should be consistent, calling out human rights abuses wherever they occur, whether by Australia's allies, including the United States and India, or against Tibetan and Hong Kongers, or in other countries around the world. Australia should place human rights at the centre of our approach to foreign policy, not just a selfish interpretation of what's in the national interest. And sadly, we need more than a legislative framework that enables the minister to impose sanctions. We need a fair process and we need the political will to impose sanctions. And in raising the issue of the will to impose sanctions, I want to return to and highlight particularly the case of Myanmar and to foreshadow that we've got substantive amendments to the bill that go to some of these points. And I'd like to quote here from the submission provided by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to the Joint Standing Committee on, um, during the inquiry. Keep in mind that this was written before this bill it was introduced, early in the inquiry, referring to the existing legislative framework. And the submission states, Within the, current autonomous sanction, within the current autonomous sanctions framework, Australia could establish thematic sanctions regimes, such as a human rights-based regime, where the regime is not tied to a particular country. Such a regime could comprise targeted financial sanctions and travel bans, which could be directed against individuals or entities designated or declared on human rights grounds. And this submission outlines two ways to establish a thematic human rights-based regime, one by way of new standalone legislation, or two through incorporation into the existing autonomous sanctions framework by way of an amendment to the regulations. And clearly, DFAT's very public advice was that there was no need for a new act in order to impose targeted sanctions on human rights grounds. Now, we welcome these amendments that will make it clearer that there is an opportunity to impose thematic sanctions, including on human rights grounds. But the fundamental point here is that we could have been using the existing legislative framework um, to impose thematic sanctions. We could have imposed targeted sanctions against the generals leading the coup in Myanmar when it started in 2021. The reason that we chose not to, as far as we can tell, based on multiple rounds of multiple questions in Senate estimates, is because the Foreign Minister believes that it's in Australia's interest to follow the approach of ASEAN. And sadly, that point has been addressed repeatedly and publicly, but to no avail. I'd like to quote from a letter written by current and former ASEAN members of parliament. More than six months since the military coup and the subsequent campaign of violence unleashed by the Myanmar army, 
ASEAN has failed in its responsibility to the people of Myanmar and the broader international community. And ASEAN's very own principles of non-interference and consensus-based decision-making prevent the bloc from taking any meaningful steps towards an end of violence in Myanmar. Even, if, even its provisions of humanitarian aid, if it takes place, risks further legitimising the junta and not reach those in need. And in that regard, we would like to echo the findings of our fellow parliamentarians from Australia who, in their recent inquiry into certain aspects of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Annual Report 2019-20, Myanmar noted that there are complex relations within and between ASEAN nations and that this led to concerns that ASEAN would not, directly, would not intervene decisively on the Myanmar crisis. And this reflects a fundamental problem in the current legislative framework, in the, in the current legislative approach that we are looking at today. It simply strengthens the legislative framework for powers that the foreign minister already has but has refused to use. We support this bill and we welcome it, but it does not address this fundamental problem, which is that Australia has not imposed targeted sanctions using the legislative tools that are already available. So this now, of course, then goes to the amendments that we'll be debating later today. And I can foreshadow that we will welcome and support the amendments moved by the, uh, circulated by the Labor Party. But in turn, our amendments, I believe, would significantly improve the bill if supported. And in particular, I'd like to go to the issue of how the minister selects which individuals should be target, targets of sanctions. Quoting from the Joint Standing Committee report, the subcommittee considers that there should be an established and transparent pathway for organisations to nominate a person for sanctionable conduct, and the subcommittee recommends that an independent advisory body be created to receive nominations, consider them and make recommendations to the minister for a decision. This would provide a degree of public confidence in the process of nomination and now allow representations from those people and organisations directly affected. The structure and composition of this body would be the subject of further consultation. However, the subcommittee considers it should include the ability to conduct its inquiry in public and to publish reasons for its decision. It's also important that recommendations by the independent advisory body must be considered by the minister and that the minister must give reasons for any decision not to adopt a recommendation by the advisory body. This is a very important recommendation from the committee, and it is extremely disappointed that it has not been adopted in the, le in the legislation that we are um, discussing this afternoon. I would note, however, that in its response, the government notes that the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade could fulfil some of the functions of that independent advisory body. And so, given that, I hope that the minister will welcome the amendments that I will be moving today. Broadly speaking, those amendments, the ones on sheet 1502, would create a framework to enable referrals to the minister, including through the Joint Standing Committee. The minister would still remain the decision maker, and the power to impose sanctions would remain with the executive, unchanged by the amendment. All that would change is that there would be an established and transparent pathway to nominate individuals for sanctionable conduct. The United States adopts a similar approach, with congressional committees able to refer names with a response required from the executive government. We think that this is a very reasonable, balanced approach, and it addresses a fundamental flaw in this legislation. We I'm, will be moving a number of other amendments, but let me reiterate: we welcome this bill and are keen to ensure it passes um, before the end of the year. And it looks like um, we are. Before it, keen to ensure that it passes today, but we think that it can be improved, and the amendments we have circulated will help improve the bill and, in turn, provide a better framework for protecting human rights. I do want to go through some of the details of the amendments because I'm not at all certain, that with, with the guillotining of debate, that we are going to get to the, a full committee stage for this bill, or whether we are just going to ram through amendments. So, look, I will go through. Um, some of the points with each of these amendments. My amendments on sheet 1502, as I, as I have just um, reiterated, that amendment addresses an important 
gap in the current bill. It, establishes, it creates an established and transparent pathway for re referrals, and it provides for a review in three years, as recommended by the Joint Standing Committee. And this is a fundamental point. If this bill is to genuinely create a framework for protecting human rights and not simply creating targeted sanctions as a tool that the minister can use for geopolitical reasons, then there must be a capacity for an established, transparent pathway for human rights abusers to, nom to be nominated. And here in Australia, we have seen horrific human rights abuses. And some of Australia's close regional neighbours, as well as major international allies, have committed significant human rights abuses. That includes the Indonesian government, the Philippines government, the government of India, the United States government. If the Australian government is to avoid claims that targeted sanctions are anything more than a thinly veiled tool for advancing Australia's so-called national interest under the guise of human rights, there must be some basic framework and those pathways, transparent pathways, for how these sanctions are applied. My amendments on sheet 1508 reflect recommendations from the Joint Standing Committee and our consultation with civil society. We think that they will significantly improve the framework and the capacity of civil society to engage in these issues while not detracting from the minister's powers. I reiterate the Australian Greens will be supporting this legislation, but I do look forward to the support of others in this place for our amendments that we think would significantly improve the bill. I also wish to note that I had circulated the second reading amendment, but I am not going to be proceeding with that second reading amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Kitching. Thank you, President. I am pleased today to rise to speak on the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021. The world is at a tipping point in the struggle against creeping, or in some places, marching authoritarianism. In Australia, we live with the benefits of a stable and prosperous democracy. Its superior superiority over any other model of political and economic organisation may seem self-evident. But this is actually not the case for many people in many parts of the world. Democracy and personal liberty cannot be taken for granted, anywhere or at any time. They must be defended, and if I may put it this way, they must be aggressively defended in all of our countries. The practical application of human freedom through political participation and democracy is a universal idea central to our humanity, and so are human rights and the protection of human rights. While these notions have their origins in Europe and North America, they are not Western in essence. They are universal and just as applicable in the developing world as they are in the developed. As the United States Declaration of Independence expresses it, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them a life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And La Declaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen of 1789 contains a very similar principle. L'article premier states, Les hommes naissent et demeurent libres et égaux en droit. Les distinctions sociales ne peuvent être fondées que sur l'utilité commune. We must remind ourselves that these are quite radical ideals. Throughout history, they have not been the norm. For evidence of how fragile democracy is, we need only to look to certain parts of the world where in recent years we have seen a slide back to authoritarian governments. So in that context, the fault lines are there for all of us to see. Many of the great democracies, the free world if you like, and I'm sorry that that is a, has become a controversial expression, but the free world of which I am very proud, the free world, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, India, Japan, New Zealand, and of course our great alliance partner, the United States of America, respect human rights, the rule of law, the protection of private property rights and the right to speak out about political issues without fear of a knock on the door at midnight. And just imagine what that is like to live with that and someone coming to knock on your door to take you away. Now, of course, democracies, we, we don't always do this perfectly. The Declaration of Independence, which I quoted earlier, has not always guaranteed the United States is free from error or the oppression and dispossession of its own citizens. Yet its ideals have lit the way to freedom. 
One only has to look at the T-shirts of those marching for freedom recently in Cuba and in Hong Kong. They were T-shirts adorned with the American flag, the Stars and Stripes. However, no less a figure than Dr Martin Luther King Jr invoked that very phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal in the struggle for civil rights that led his nation to a more perfect union. And therein lies the, the genius of democracy, our willingness to accept imperfection, to own up to our mistakes and then use them as an example of how to be better and how to do better. The authoritarian world, and I won't name individual countries, but the authoritarian world does not respect anything other than the maintenance and projection of power. It has ever been thus. Without the protections and due processes of democracy, even the most prosperous business people can lose everything overnight, and we've seen this quite recently in a country in our region. The most innocent citizen jailed without cause. The most seemingly powerful official can be sent straight to jail after a show trial if she or he falls foul of their authoritarian ruler. In the authoritarian world, the average citizen lives looking over their shoulder, watched by facial recognition cameras, judged by a police state, randomly punished in the most brutal prisons imaginable, all while these abuses are aided, abetted and covered up by a controlled media. As Democratic Senator for New York, Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, if the newspapers of a country are filled with good news, the jails of that country will be filled with good people. It is not wrong to say that one side, for all of our faults, which are many, is good, and to say equally that to deny basic human rights and due process to any person is evil. Evil is a word that some are uncomfortable with in our modern age. It is a word without which we cannot do. And I'm idealistic enough to believe that you support good and you oppose evil. <coughs> even if it costs you, even if it hurts you, history will judge us for this. Future generations will judge us for this. And in a modern age of regimes run by the dregs of humanity, because they are so inhumane, who torture and jail and murder their own citizens, break their spirits, who delight in causing fear, who take away hope and humanity, place their citizens in concentration camps, they steal from their compatriots, they enforce slavery and arbitrary detention. If you understand the beauty that it is to be a human being, of being alive and vital, if you believe in the dignity of human beings, well, then you can't really allow such evil to go on, unchallenged. And if you do believe in the beauty of human life, then every person who lives under such regimes, who cannot stand in the light but is shoved into the dark, then you understand why Magnitsky legislation is necessary. And you also understand why democracies must be supreme. President Kennedy said in his inaugural address that the rights of man come not from the gener generosity of the state but from the hand of God. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Abetz. He was, of course, when he said those words, referring to the Soviet Union. And look today, la plus a change. I'm not saying that democracies always are right. After all, it was from his jail cell that in Birmingham, Alabama, that Martin Luther King Jr. wrote these words that still, should still ring in our ears, and they certainly ring in mine very often. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. But it is the democracies where there is sunlight and transparency that have a rule of law, respect the rights of minorities, that believe in free and fair elections, that believe in the freedom of the press, that believe in human rights, it is they that are the promised land for those who suffer at the mean and ugly hands of authoritarian regimes. Democracies need to grow, not to contract. And for those of us in this parliament and around the world who do not hold out an appeasing hand to those who commit human rights abuses, who do not hold out a slippery hand to those who engage in large-scale corruption, to those who tell these evil people no, we will not look away while you do wrong, but rather look them straight in the eye and say, we shall make pariahs of you all. For those of us who choose to fight for the best world we can have, for those of us who will fight for right justice and righteousness, we have made the only choice there is to make. I was recently in one of the oldest centres of democracy on this earth, in Westminster, 
for an award ceremony. I am honoured and humbled that I was an award awarded an outstanding contribution to Magnitsky legislation. Thank you. Thank you. I will never forget some of the people I met there and had an opportunity to become better acquainted with in meetings concerning Magnitsky legislation. These people included ha people whose hands have been permanently affected by the poison that agents of the Russian state had administered. So their hands are red and disfigured and the veins distorted. They have had to learn to walk again so, because they were so badly affected by the poison. Some who were not able to come at all because they are imprisoned with no due process, no process at all. Journalists who have been threatened because they have written about despots in the money trails of their corruption and are still threatened years after their books and columns are published and their publishers threatened as well, both through legal and extrajudicial means. Their families threatened as well. Maybe today is the day that they or their children put their hand on a doorknob at their home and that doorknob has been coated in poison. And that's happened to people. Whether it be the Republic of Conscious, as imagined by Seamus Haney, which makes clear that we are self-aware beings, being cap beings capable of self-examination, whether we are guided by the Bible or the Torah, or the Quran or the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, whether it is what we see in our daily dealings with other human beings, we learn to distinguish what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and immoral, and indeed what is good and what is evil. If we don't call out evil where it lurks, if we don't fight back when given the opportunity to diminish and defeat evil, then who are we? What are we doing in this place? And it is for that reason, the lack of respect of rights of their fellow human beings, that we observe the phenomenon of those who've gained the authoritarian system by stealing or engaging in the most heinous human rights abuses and corruption, and they seek the safety of the free world's jurisdictions. They seek to protect themselves and their ill-gotten gains with the very protections they deny to the victims of their regimes. Our system of land title gives you as close to absolute certainty that no one can steal your property from you. In the authoritarian world, there is no such safety. If those with power want to take, he or she can do just that. And there might be the occasional fig leaf of pretend process, but the outcome is the same. So this brings us to this bill. This bill is inspired by Sergei Magnitsky, an employee, an employee of hedge fund manager Bill Browder. Sergei Magnitsky was murdered by Russian crooks connected to the highest levels of the current Russian regime. He died in a Russian prison after being tortured to death. He was murdered because he had uncovered what were successful attempts to steal hundreds of millions of dollars from the Russian state. Mr Browder, the employer of Sergei Magnitsky, was a prosperous, is a prosperous man, and I spent quite a lot of time with him in London recently. But he could have continued a quiet and comfortable life. But he was so outraged and saddened that he has dedicated his life to what are now called Magnitsky laws. Prior to the introduction of the bill we are speaking on today, local proposals to do the same have been driven by many in this place. I want to talk about Michael Danby, um, who was the first person I talked to about Magnitsky legislation, having seen Bill Browder interviewed on 7.30. But I also want to acknowledge um, Senator Payne um, and her office, as Senator Rice has said. I want to acknowledge Senator Rice, uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge James, Senator James Patterson, uh, another Victorian, so maybe the Victorians really are where the, the good people are. Um, I want to acknowledge Mr Hasty in the other place, the Honourable Kevin Andrews and Mr Chris Hayes. I want to acknowledge Senator Abetz and Senator Feveranti Wells. Um, while this was done in the Joint Standing Committee, uh, the Senate Committee was, I think, equally as committed to this legislation, so I appreciate the work uh, of, my, of my fellow committee members. On the 3rd of December 2019, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, the Se Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, asked the Human Rights Subcommittee of the Joint Standing Committee to inquire into the use of targeted sanctions. In that committee, we heard from a number uh, of expert witnesses, both local and international. These included Bill Browder, uh, prominent inter international lawyers Geoffrey Robertson QC and Armal Clooney, as well as the former Canadian Attorney General Professor Erwin Kotler. I met all of these people in London and uh, they have been and remain very generous with their time 
and I, I want to say thank you to them. They were amazing sounding boards. I'd like to um, also acknowledge uh, again the, the members of the Joint Standing Committee, particularly those on the, on the Human Rights Subcommittee. Um, I think it's also important to make, and this will be the last point I make, that it's, we want to synchronise our local response through the passing of this bill with the responses of like-minded democracies, which is why I'm so pleased that we're uh, moving, Labor is moving an amendment to put Magnitsky into the title of this bill. In a world of growing authoritarianism, the harmonisation of this type of le legislation becomes a weapon for democratic pushback. I'm in regular contact with New Zealand and Japanese legislators, and they hope to enact their own Magnitsky legislation. I think this will be very important for our region. A strong and clear message will be sent to lower ranking officials and criminal thugs that their crimes, whether on behalf of or protected by their superiors, will not be immune from international consequences. This legislation says to them, your stolen money is no good here. No matter how you steal from your people, there will be no shopping trips to Paris, no harbour front mansions in Sydney, no skiing in Aspen, no nest egg in a Western bank. And like King Midas, they'll have lots of gold, but no way to enjoy it. It will also say that you are beneath content. You are so loathsome that we have judged you and we will say so in public. We will name you. Australia will not become a fence for stolen goods, nor a hollow log for stolen money. This legislation is important. We are a democracy, and as a democracy, we should stand with other democracies, with other like-minded people around the world, and we should say no to the evil that we also see in our world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021, and I would like to associate myself with the remarks made by my colleague, Senator Janet Rice, um, and how eloquently Senator Rice has expressed the position of the Greens, and that we support this bill, but Senator Rice will be moving amendments, hopefully to make this bill stronger. And while, while we are talking about human rights and human rights abuses today, I do want to use this opportunity to highlight the hypocrisy on human rights in this chamber. Ever since I joined parliamentary life, and indeed well before that, I have been talking perhaps nonstop about human rights. My first speech in New South Wales Parliament way back in 2013 discussed the plight of girls in Pakistan. I've supported the human rights and self-determination of many marginalized and persecuted peoples around the world. In this chamber, many senators get up and speak about human rights violations, human rights abuses, indeed, as they are doing today. But there are definitely choices that are made about whose human rights will get the nod in here and whose are taboo. And I can tell you that there is one group of people whose human rights don't matter to those opposite me. That's Palestinian people. Palestinians for decades have been amongst the most oppressed people in the world, subject to daily humiliation, brutality, and violence by the Israeli government. Their human rights being violated and abused every single day. But they are not considered human enough in here to have rights. Obviously, they are not equal. Everyone is not equal in the eyes of many in this chamber. Israeli authorities continue to persecute and oppress Palestinian people. Settlement and occupation continues. Violence continues. The Gaza blockade continues. Homes continue to be demolished. Palestinians are routinely subjected to dispossession, to violence, to forcible separation, to persecution and humiliation. Yet, as soon as you raise these injustices, you are hounded and you are condemned. Shamefully and shamelessly, they try to label you as anti-Semitic, all designed to shut you up, to silence you. Well, I can tell you that your false accusations are not going to silence me. I will not be backing down in calling for an end to these injustices 
of settler colonialism, as I will not be backing down in talking about human rights abuses wherever they happen. Just recently, the Israeli government has labeled six Palestinian civil society and human rights organizations as terrorist groups. This is another attempt to criminalize criticism of Israel. This is an appalling and alarming decision and must be condemned. But there is no condemnation from the Australian government, all while they stand up here today and talk about human rights abuses. The former manager of operations of World Vision in Gaza, Mohammed El Halabi, has been in detention in Israeli custody since 2016. That's five years ago. Israeli authorities allege that he diverted 50 million US dollars donated to World Vision to armed groups of terrorists for terrorism purposes. But comprehensive audits by World Vision and the Australian government found no evidence of funds being diverted. Yet, he languishes in detention, his trial held behind closed doors in secret. So why aren't the so-called arbiters of human rights sitting across the chamber jumping up and down for a fair and transparent trial? Why has the Morrison government remained quiet about Muhammad's plight? Because you just don't care about Palestinian human rights and justice. In fact, you want to silence those who want justice for Palestinians. That's why Prime Minister Scott Morrison has, was so enthusiastic to adopt the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism, which has been used to silence critics of the Israeli government for its human rights abuses of Palestinian people. It is clear that there is a very shallow understanding of human rights in this place. Human rights cannot be discarded when they become politically inconvenient. The reality is that many of those who are human rights converts when it comes to helping certain causes are just fair weather friends. Because the ultimate taboo in Australian politics is to talk about the human rights of the Palestinian people. The hypocrisy on human rights in here, though, can be seen by people out there. The reality is that change is not going to come from this chamber. It will come from out there where people are rightly angry at the decades upon decades of injustices towards Palestinian people. They are tired of your silence. They are tired of being silenced. They are speaking up and they are standing up. And I am one of those people who will not be silenced. Senator Fear of Anti Wells. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I have continued over the years to advocate for the enactment of laws to deal with perpetrators of human rights abuse and corruption by those who transfer assets to use them in countries which are usually democratic and financially stable. Um, can I thank you, Senator Kitching, uh, for your comments and for the strong sentiment with which you expressed it. I know that uh, um, uh, those of us who have been on this journey um, agree uh, very much with the sentiment of your comments. Um, you outlined the history of the Magnitsky uh, legislation uh, following the death of lawyer Sergei Magnitsky and the work that Bill Browder uh, has focused on and the efforts uh, internationally uh, to bring human rights perpetrators uh, uh, to the front line uh, of uh, responsibility uh, and introducing of targeted sanctions. Now, this type of legislation has been introduced. Standalone uh, Magnitsky legislation has been introduced in various countries, and I was very pleased uh, that the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, of which I'm a member, has recommended that we enact world-leading law to apply targeted sanctions to perpetrators of serious human rights abuse and corruption to align Australia with the global movement uh, and to seek those, uh, to limit those opportunities for those human rights abusers, uh, corrupt officials and their beneficiaries to enjoy the proceeds of their abuse. Now, the recommendations that were made by the committee were aimed at strengthening our commitment to protect human rights. Uh, including banning entry of perpetrators to Australia and the capacity to seize uh, assets. And therefore, a proper and targeted sanctions legislation will make Australian places and institutions off limits to people who have profited, profited from unconscionable uh, conduct. Um, 
I would have liked to have seen standalone uh, legislation uh, enacted uh, rather than uh, an extension of uh, the um, framework, the sanctions uh, framework that we are uh, now uh, adopting. Having said that, I think, though, this is a very good start to legislation. I'm pleased that we are uh, adopting the amendments that are going to be proposed by uh, the Labor Party, as I understand, um, and most especially uh, to ensure that the name Magnitsky is included in the title to emphasise the important links with the global uh, movement. I am disappointed, though, that we are not going to have uh, a watch list of people being considered for sanctioning, uh, given um, that uh, many of them come from the range of authoritarian regimes that certainly Senator Kitching uh, referred to. And of course, I have uh, in the past uh, made uh, comments, particularly in relation to the communist regime uh, in China and its skullduggery. Um, I, I note that perhaps in the past there has been a reluctance uh, and resistance to a full-blown Magnitsky standalone sanctions legislation. And whilst I think this legislation is a, a good step in the right direction, I do think that ultimately uh, I, there is scope for us to strengthen and enhance um, that framework uh, into the future. Thank you, Senator, <coughs> Thank you, pardon. Thank you, Senator Fioranti Wells. Senator Betts. The Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Bill has my full support. Much has been written and said about this legislation and other like pieces in other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, can I commend Senator Kitching on an exceptionally good and powerful speech, the full contents of which I adopt? And uh, can I again congratulate her on a very, very good uh, exposition on the matters that are before the chamber? I'm also delighted that I understand that the two amendments that the Labor are moving uh, will be adopted, and uh, to have the Magnitsky name in the title, I think, is fitting for this martyr, and that is what he is. And so we're delighted that that is going to occur. And I understand in the breakout of uh, bipartisanship uh, that the Green Amendment in relation to uh, having this legislation reviewed after three years by the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade will also be adopted by the government. And Mr Acting Deputy President, I think this has been one of the examples uh, that has, or this bill has been one of the examples of our parliament working at its very best. And I recall the journey myself, uh, and I pay tribute to the former member for Melbourne Ports. Uh, he was the one that first made me aware of the name Magnitsky and then uh, the legislation that might be put forward in honour of his name. And uh, I then wrote to uh, relevant people on my side of politics to get the polite, uh, not needed response. Uh, which was then followed up with an acceptance that it might be a good idea for the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Subcommittee on Human Rights to have a look at this uh, idea and whether it is needed in Australia. I was very pleased to be able to serve on that committee and come down with a unanimous report where all members of the committee, under the very able chairmanship of the member for Menzies, Kevin Andrews, uh, produced a uh, result which has now been adopted, I think, uh, from what I can gather, by all sides of the parliament in uh, both chambers. Um, so, in short, uh, that which is before us is legislation I fully support. Given the time constraints, Mr Acting Deputy President, I can simply ask people who want to know my thoughts about this matter to read and look at things I may or may not have said in the past, but especially to read Senator Kitching's speech. Very efficient, Senator Betts. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make a contribution on the Autonomous Sanctions Act to introduce a Magnitsky-style sanctions regime for Australia. It will be a brief contribution because of the time management motion in place to ensure this and other important legislation passes tonight. Magnitsky-style sanctions is an idea whose time has come. 
and in the current geopolitical environment has an irresistible logic. It has in recent times become a very popular cause, and I expect it will shortly pass this chamber unanimously, but that was not always the case. It was only a few years ago that it was a very lonely cause. I'm proud to have been one of the early advocates for Magnitsky sanctions before it was my party's policy to introduce them. I recognise that there are a number of others in the chamber and in other places who are also early supporters of this important cause, in particular Senator Kitching and, of course, the member for Menzies, Kevin Andrews, who did a wonderful job chairing that inquiry. But I want to pay tribute uh, to someone who has been recognised by others as well in this debate, who was earlier than all of us in recognising the importance of this initiative, and that is, of course, the former member for Melbourne Ports, Michael Danby. Michael was publicly making the case for Magnitsky sanctions before it was called and introduced in the previous parliament a private member's bill to legislate them. He, in turn, was inspired by people like Bill Browder and Senator John McCain, who pioneered and first instituted these sanctions in the United States, which has since been widely adopted across the world. It was first enacted, of course, in the memory of Sergei Magnitsky, who was murdered in custody in Russia, but it has since become a much wider cause for those who are oppressed all around the world. I'm very pleased that Australia is now standing with like-minded countries, including the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, the European Union and many others, in equipping ourselves with a vital tool to combat rising authoritarianism. It is time that democracies have the ability to push back and enact a real and personal cost for those who abuse human rights and seek to reshape the international rules-based order from one which respects the freedoms of the individual to one where the power can be exercised without any restraint. No longer will human rights abusing and corrupt foreign officials be able to comfort themselves with the idea that even if they were sanctioned by our partners, Australia could be a safe haven for their ill-gotten gains or a refuge for them to flee to. I hope that in a few years' time, as momentum for sanctioned regimes like this grows all around the world, that there will soon be nowhere that they can seek comfort or shelter. I am particularly pleased to see a uniquely Australian innovation in this version of the Magnitsky Act. For the first time ever in the world, our Act will not only equip us to target those who abuse human rights or engage in seriously corrupt conduct, but also those who threaten our national interest in the cyber realm. This will become an increasingly important tool to help shape and deter our adversaries, in addition to the other measures we have at our disposal, like publicly attributing responsibility for cyber attacks. It will be particularly powerful if our allies and friends, who already have Magnitsky seams, amend them to include this provision, and I encourage them to do so. Acting in concert, we can wield a powerful weapon of deterrence against those who seek to do us harm. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, in bringing this proposal to the parliament today. It was Senator Payne who first referred this issue to the Human Rights Subcommittee of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade, and it is Senator Payne who has brought forward this robust legislation today. In addition to the Foreign Relations Act, which passed this time last year, which ensures the federal government is in charge of our foreign policy as it should be, Australia is equipping ourselves with the tools that we need to defend our democracy, our sovereignty and our freedom in a dangerous world. In passing the bill tonight, and I hope in the House tomorrow, the Parliament of Australia is sending a very strong message to those who would seek to bully and threaten us to seek to change who we are. Australia is a proud liberal democracy. We will stand up for ourselves, our interests and our values on the international stage, no matter what you throw at us. Senator Fawcett. Acting Deputy President Curtis, before the minister concludes, uh, the debate on this speech, as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, I'd like to thank the minister for her referral to the committee uh, for us to consider this. I'd like to thank colleagues from across uh, all sides of the chamber and also the House for their constructive engagement, and particularly Mr Kevin Andrews, who chaired the subcommittee. But I'd also like to thank the executive for their constructive engagement after the report and their decision to proceed. Uh, I think it's quite appropriate that our system of democracy has worked and worked well. It's why we should defend it, and I commend this bill to the House. Minister. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, let me begin by acknowledging and thanking uh, those colleagues who have spoken on the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment uh, Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021 for their contributions to this very important debate. Some colleagues have been part of the policy discussion on Magnitsky-style discussions for many years. Uh, in particular, colleagues who have spoken in here this afternoon uh, let me acknowledge the Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Senator Fawcett, the Chair of the uh, Joint Standing Committee uh, Subcommittee uh, in the other place, uh, from the other place, Mr Kevin Andrews, uh, and colleagues on the committee. That includes, of course, uh, those across the parliament, Senator Rice, Senator Kitching, uh, Senator Wong, uh, my good friend Senator Patterson, Senator Abet, Senator Fieravani wells uh, and uh, many other colleagues who have contributed uh, over time. This is an important reform. It's an important response to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade's inquiry into the use of sanctions to target human rights abuses and violations. Senator Patterson is right. Australia has a strong history of promoting and protecting human rights globally, of supporting the international rules-based order and acting for the peace and security of the international community. As a government, We've used our existing country-specific autonomous sanctions regimes to those ends, whether that includes human rights violations in Syria or Russian threats to sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Establishing new thematic sanctions will enhance the government's long-standing use of autonomous sanctions as a strategic foreign policy tool, through which Australia can impose costs on and influence and deter those responsible for egregious situations of international concern while minimising impacts on general populations. So with this reform, Australia introduces Magnitsky-style sanctions. The, movement, the Magnitsky movement to establish thematic sanctions addressing human rights and, and corruption was indeed inspired by Sergei Magnitsky, the Russian lawyer who exposed fraud committed by Russian government officials. He was currently arrested and imprisoned, subjected to degrading treatment and tortured. He died in custody on 16 November 2009. Through the advocacy of Bill Browder, whose firm Hermitage Capital Management Mr Magnitsky was advising, in 2012 the US Congress passed the Magnitsky Act, banning travel and freezing assets of those Russian officials responsible. Since then, countries including Canada, the United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom began to create or update their respective sanctions frameworks to enable perpetrators of egregious conduct to be sanctioned in a more timely way, no matter where the conduct occurs. While that debate gathered momentum internationally, as others have said, I referred the matter for inquiry by the Joint Standing Committee. An increasing number of like-minded countries have joined the movement, and the bill is timely for Australia a reform which will mean Australia can take timely action, including with like-minded partners where it is in the national interest, in response to situations of international concern wherever they occur in the world. Denying the perpetrators and beneficiaries of egregious acts from accessing our economy is essential and ensures they cannot benefit from the freedoms our democracy and rules-based society allows. This reform will importantly ensure that Australia does not become an isolated, attractive safe haven for such people and entities and their illegal gains. Our government response included a commitment to introduce a new thematic cyber regime, in addition to the regime canvassed by the committee. This additional tool will serve alongside other law enforcement and operational mechanisms to enhance Australia's responses to instances of egregious malicious cyber activity that impact our interests. The government response also agreed to the Attorney General being consulted in the making of thematic sanctions by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. The Minister will also consult any other relevant ministers to ensure consideration of all relevant foreign policy and national interest equities. These am amendments set out the executive process by which thematic sanctions decisions are made, not the material on which the Minister can rely. In making a listing, the minister can consider any relevant material that will assist in being reasonably satisfied the criteria is met, including incredible material and information obtained by non-government organisations. The government strongly encourages public engagement on human rights and corruption issues and regular consultation with civil society and will continue to receive suggestions for sanctions listings from a range of sources. 
The regulations will provide the specific criteria under which a person or entity could be sanctioned under these new thematic regimes, should it be in Australia's national interests to do so. Embedding the new thematic regimes in our existing autonomous sanctions framework means that established processes and safeguards will continue to apply, not be duplicated across multiple sanctions acts and frameworks. That's important to provide certainty and continuity for all of those who engage with our autonomous sanctions framework. This is similar to the approach taken by the United Kingdom, which does not have a standalone act and has a similar framework with uh, regulations under an overarching act. The government encourages public engagement on these significant issues, and we look forward to continuing to receive future recommendations from parliament and civil society on possible listings. The bill will support the ongoing role of sanctions as a primary tool of statecraft, by which Australia can define, defend and demonstrate our values globally and support a robust international rules-based order. This is a significant reform, and I thank all of those who have worked collaboratively on it and I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Autonomous Sanctions Act 2011 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is the bill stand as printed. Who's first? Uh, Senator Wong. I, I move. Uh, I seek leave to move opposition amendments one and two, one and two on sheet one five one three together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, <laughs> Acting Deputy President. Uh, these amendment, this amendment goes to an expansion of the grounds on which, or the themes under which, um, sanctions may be implemented uh, to include uh, serious violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, that's item two. We are also, as flagged in my speech, uh, seeking to move the uh, changes to the title of the legislation to include Magnitsky style and other thematic sanctions uh, in the title of the legislation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The government supports both these amendments. In the interest of time. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Senator Wong. Thank you. I thank the government for their support. Senator Rice. We will also be supporting these amendments and, in particular, I think amending the title to refer to Magnitsky I think is a very important amendment. Very happy to support it. No one else, in, no one else seeking the call? Okay. So the question is that the amendment be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. I move amendments on sheet 1526. Um, I'll move the amendment on sheet 1526, um, which is requiring the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade to undertake a review of the operation of the amendments in the bill three years after it commences. And this reflects recommendation 28 of the um, committee report of the review and the report of the Joint Standing Committee for Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade. Clearly this is an important, significant step forward in our sanctions regimes, and, and I think that having a, this review process um, is also going to be incredibly important to see just how, how many people are being sanctioned, what they're being sanctioned for, all of the issues that need to be reviewed. So I think, and I understand that I, there is now going to be support for this amendment from the government, which I'm very Thankful for and very pleased to, um, yeah, very very pleased to acknowledge. So I think having this review process in the in the legislation, I think, is a, a, a significant improvement. Minister, Deputy President, uh, or um, Acting Chair, uh, Chair, yes, uh, the Chair. government supports Correct. this amendment. Uh, 
Uh, the question is, the amendment be agreed to? All those that have opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. And the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Chair. Look, I now wish to move by leave, um, seek leave to move together um, my amendments on revi sheet 1502 revised. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Great. Um, let me just get my place here. So these uh, basically go to the po go to the issue of who um, ends up being sanctioned and the process for the determining who ends up being being sanctioned. We think it's very important, as I um, outlined in my foreshadowed in my, in my second reading speech that these amendments would create an established and transparent pathway for referrals. And, and it's absolutely it's fundamental, because if this bill is genuinely to create a framework for protecting human rights and not simply creating a targeted sanctioned regime as a tool that can be used picking and choosing who you are sanctioning, there has to be a capacity for an established, transparent pathway for human rights abusers to be nominated. It shouldn't depend on whether they are our allies. It also actually shouldn't depend on any narrow definition of what's determined by the minister to be in our national interest. And I want to go to the issue of Myanmar, where the minister has determined it's not in our national interest to sanction the human rights abusers, the members of the coup the members of the junta who undertook the coup in Myanmar because it's determined that's not in our national interest. It is so important that we actually have that transparent, accountable pathway so that civil society and others can be putting forward nominations, they can be investigated and they can be reported on. The measures that are set out here lay out those sorts of um, processes and lay out you know, the need to be, um, for the minister to give a statement on request by parliament, giving a, and, and in particular also going again to the point in, in Myanmar that really, you know, I think Myanmar is a really important case in point because we had the ability to be imposing sanctions on Myanmar. The minister had the ability under our existing legislation, but she has chosen not to. And so actually having that transparent pathway for, these, for the sanctions to be for individuals to be proposed is, is very significant. Now, I actually did want to ask some questions of the minister relating to, to Myanmar. I mean, because I think it does go to the point of where, you know, where this bill now needs to be strengthened. I mean, Minister, on the 5th of October, you made the Autonomous Sanctions Designated and Declared Persons Myanmar Amendment Continuation of Effect Instrument 2021. Did you seek advice from the department about adding names to that list? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Chair, and uh, thanks, Senator Rice, for her question. Uh, I have um, engaged uh, regularly with both the department and uh, post uh, and uh, with counterparts uh, on these questions, uh, including in relation to, uh, to sanctions issues. I want to be very clear, um, Mr. I want to be very clear, Chair, that uh, I have said uh, many times that our policy settings, including sanctions, are kept under active consideration. That is absolutely right. And in fact, the case to which Senator Rice refers validates that. Uh, I've always said that I do not rule out the application of sanctions. Uh, and we are continuing to actively consider our response. Those options are on the table, including pursuant to, uh, to these reforms. Um, we, of course, respect the efforts of partners uh, who have determined that imposing sanctions is the most appropriate measure for them. Uh, at this point, as the senator knows, because we have discussed this at some length uh, across a number of estimates committee processes as well, uh, that is not Australia's view. Senator Rice. Thank you, Minister, which goes to the point it's not Australia's view, but there is no transparent process that people can be you know, part of and that the community be part of as to why or why not targeted sanctions are being applied or not being applied for people who are absolutely, there is no doubt whatsoever, uh, human rights abuses that would be 
eligible to, to have sanctions under this legislation as it stands and certainly under the revised legislation to have sanctions against them. I mean, Minister, in that designation, you maintain the designation of five people, Ong Kiao Zor, Mong Mong So, Ong Ong, Tan U and Kin Mong So. Did you consider sanctioning Min Ong Lang, the commander-in-chief and the leader of the coup, when you made that designation? Minister. Yeah. To add to my previous response. Senator Bryce. Look, I mean, I did, I did, I don't want to take up too much time in the chamber, knowing that um, the time constraints we are under. I mean, I just, can I confirm, however, that Minister, Minister that uh, even under these, the revised legislation that we will be approving today, your process and your decision to not impose sanctions on the leader of the coup so far, it would remain unchanged. Minister? No, Senator, and I refer to you in my previous response where I said these are matters which are kept, maintained, are under review. Senator Rice. Minister, if we had had this revised legislation, your decision up until now to not impose sanctions would still have been possible under this legislation. Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? I don't want to interrupt the flow of questioning, uh, so, but if I might just indicate Labor's position, if, if that's all right with Senator Rice. Um, <clears throat> uh, we are, Labor's not supportive of these amendments. Um, I do want to just make two points. So the first in relation to Myanmar is that we have taken a different view to that which Senator um, Payne has outlined, uh, and uh, we do believe uh, that given the attack on the democratic transition, uh, uh, given the violence uh, that has been perpetrated against um, citizens, uh, given the uh, participation in and the execution of a coup against um, uh, those, uh, you know, the government of the day, uh, and given Australia's length of engagement uh, in the democratic transition, that we do think uh, there is a case for additional targeted sanctions against those responsible for the violence. And I place that on the record in the second reading speech. Uh, having said that, really the way to understand Senator Rice's amendments on 1502 is really it goes to the relative roles of the executive and the parliament. Uh, and on this we do have a different view uh, to that of the Australian Greens. We may not agree with the government's decisions in relation to which sanctions it seeks to impose or not impose, but we do think in our system uh, that the government of the day has to make that decision, considering all of the information which is available to government. Uh, and so we are not supportive of the schema that is laid out. Uh, in Senator Rice's amendments, which essentially uh, provides to the parliament uh, a much greater engagement on what we think is really the responsibility of uh, executive government. It's a responsibility at times governments may not exercise in the way the opposition thinks it might, or uh, if the shoe is on the other foot, the, the coalition that the now government thinks is correct, and certainly the minor parties. But these are significant decisions, they are important decisions, and they are not decisions which are made for symbolism. They are decisions which are made uh, soberly around how we progress Australia's national interests, which include, uh, as this, this deals with, uh, ensuring that we seek to shape the world for the better through what we do uh, um, in foreign policy. So we are uh, I do think there is a place for consultation, uh, which is one of the, I suppose, themes of the amendment that Senator Rice has moved. Uh, and certainly, we, we gain a great deal from our consultation with human rights NGOs, uh, who, who have participated in discussions with us, which have informed our amendments. Uh, and 
I would assume any party of government would do so. But ultimately, we do believe these, the, these decisions are matters which ought be made in the best judgment of uh, whoever is uh, responsible executive government at the time they are being made. Senator Ross. Thank you. I did want to clarify, and it goes to the point, goes to the heart of this does not take away the power of the minister to be making that decision. It does not take away the power of the executive government. It lays out a transparent pathway. I mean, it, it sets out that the minister must prepare a statement setting out whether, in the minister's opinion, the person is responsible for serious violations or serious abuses of human rights, whether autonomous sanctions will be applied to the person or associated entity. And if they'll be applied, a description of those autonomous sanctions. And if they won't be applied, the reason why autonomous sanctions will not be applied. So it's basically making it transparent. It's making it much more objective than having the potential for decisions to be made on who is sanctioned being made on a judgment that the minister makes on these opaque grounds of national interest or whether, you know, that in terms of our relationship with other countries. This means that we can have a sanctions regime where we can we pick and choose. That we can decide, yep, we're going to sanction you know, human rights abusers that are occurring here, but other ones because it's not conceived to be in our national interest, despite the fact that they might be just as egregious. If it's determined to not be in our national interest by the minister and there is no process for setting out an a assessment process, well then this, um, nothing will occur. Um, hence, I mean, I think the, the point, uh, my point is that the, this does nothing. It, it maintains the power of the minister to still, and the executive government to still be the one to decide on sanctions. It just makes the process fairer and clearer. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Russ for her contributions, and Senator Wong also for her contributions. Um, and Senator Wong uh, has uh, has made some. Uh, some salient points, particularly in relation to uh, the role of, uh, of the executive. Um, I would uh, say uh, to the chamber uh, that um, the decisions that are made are already subject to parliamentary scrutiny, uh, that they are legislative in instruments, uh, including uh, the scrutiny of the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation. They are disallowable by the parliament. Uh, and I think it is important to uh, acknowledge the points that uh, have been made in relation to the, um, the, the clear and plain fact uh, that uh, from time to time uh, governments will uh, need to exercise judgment uh, in relation to these matters based on all of the information that is available to them. Uh, in, uh, in the context of, uh, of the sorts of issues that have to be considered in the application of sanctions in particular, which is obviously a very serious uh, and a very considered decision to be taken by a government. Uh, we have said um, in the past also that uh, the suggestion that prior notice uh, being given to parliament um, uh, does rather defeat the purpose of uh, of these uh, steps if it gives potential sanctions targets uh, an opportunity to move assets uh, and to uh, conceal or hide um, their, uh, uh, their assets, and that would ultimately d dilute the purpose of, uh, of listings as well. Senator Rice. Thank you. Look, I do want to go to the other part of this amendment on, on sheet 5, 1502, and that is in particular, again, continuing on the minister giving a statement in relation to, to Myanmar. And the reasons that we have heard, and again, why we need to have a transparent process as to why or why not sanctions are being opposed, uh, imposed, which we currently don't have, this amendment would actually set out, make the minister give a statement as to whether um, people who have been proposed for sanctions, whether they are in fact responsible for serious violations or serious abuses of human rights, and whether or not a sanctions will be applied, and the details of any consultations undertaken by the minister in preparing the statement. And this it goes to the 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 holes in our current sanctions regime and the holes that will still be there 
even when we pass these amendments um, today. I mean, in terms of you know, the information that has so far been informing you, Minister, about not to apply sanctions, we have heard that it's not in our national interest and also that it's not um, conducive to maintaining a good relation with, with ASEAN. Um, in terms of ASEAN, do you think, Minister, that the strategy so far is, is working? I mean, we have welcomed ASEAN's decision to uninvite Min Ong Lang from upcoming meetings. But other ministers from the junta have participated in ASEAN meetings. Do you think that the ASEAN strategy of maintaining that good relationship with ASEAN is, is that working in terms of the um, applying you know, appropriate um, pressure on the coup, on the leaders of the coup in Myanmar? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I take the point that Senator Rice is, is making in relation to, to Myanmar. Uh, and, uh, we have, as I've uh, previously advised uh, the Chamber, discussed these matters at length uh, in the estimates uh, context. I would be happy, um, as I have uh, previously this week, uh, to meet again with the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade uh, in relation to, uh, to these matters. Uh, but I think this is not an appropriate amendment for this bill. It's not in the right place. The senator wishes to uh, take up this issue in uh, a more appropriate uh, construct, then of course the chamber would consider that. Senator Rice. Thank you, Minister. I look forward to taking, up on, taking you up on that offer. I mean, again, with regards to our relationship with ASEAN and Myanmar, the Philippines Foreign Secretary told the Lowy Institute recently that if ASEAN did not take a tough stand on Myanmar, it risks being perceived as a bunch of guys who always agree with each other on the worst of things. I mean, Minister, do you think ASEAN has taken a tough stand on Myanmar? Minister. On the 24th of April, the uh, leaders of 10 ASEAN nations met in Jakarta uh, to uh, address the um, crisis in Myanmar and the impact of the coup by the regime. Uh, to bring that meeting together, uh, not only in the context of COVID, but also uh, given the nature and the history of ASEAN was a very significant step for those leaders. To determine the development of the five points of consensus which were uh, brought together as a result of that meeting, the appointment ultimately of a special envoy uh, in the uh, person of the second foreign minister of Brunei, Dato Erawan, uh, also a very significant step. Uh, I acknowledge, and as I have acknowledged publicly elsewhere, that uh, the lack of goodwill which has been displayed uh, by the regime in Myanmar in relation to that has not helped with ASEAN's efforts to advance the, their, their response and their engagement. But Australia strongly supports uh, the work of ASEAN in this regard, the work of the Special Envoy uh, and all endeavours for uh, that approach by ASEAN to progress. Senator Rice. Um, Minister, given that we haven't applied sanctions on Myanmar, on further targeted sanctions on, on Myanmar so far, and given a look, and I take your point that it's, it's still open, and I'm looking forward to those sanctions, you know, that further consideration of it. There are so many people, the community um, here in Australia, Myan Myanmar diaspora, others who are desperately concerned to see action um, taken against the coup leaders. Um, I mean, Minister, given that this legislation actually, without this amendment, is not going to change the situation, it's going to continue, continue to enable you to fairly opaquely decide whether or not to apply sanctions to the coup leaders in Myanmar. I mean, what do you say to those people, the people of Myanmar, the diaspora members, community members here in Australia, who say that Australia is not doing enough and that people are dying while Australia adheres to a failed strategy? Minister. Uh, well, I would respectfully um, not agree, Senator, with that uh, interpretation. Um, as, a, as a minister uh, in the government with responsibility for, for these matters, uh, then there is an expectation that I would take into account, and the foreign minister of our nation would take into account, our interests, uh, our objectives, uh, the best options to achieve outcomes, uh, and ultimately these reforms uh, are about uh, Australia's interests as well as uh, the issues that have been discussed in, uh, in other remarks today. 
Senator, in the interest of time, I'm not going to reiterate all of the steps that Australia has taken in relation to Myanmar, but again, you and I have discussed those uh, in, our, uh, in our estimates um, exchanges. I have uh, reiterated my strong support for the uh, ASEAN initiatives uh, in relation to addressing this. I share the frustration of a number of ASEAN members, which has been expressed publicly uh, in relation to this. I share concerns, uh, particularly in terms of uh, operational support for the, uh, for the military, for the Tatmadaw. Uh, we have joined calls and led calls for the um, ceasing of the transfer of arms, materiel, dual-use equipment, technical assistance to the military and its representatives. We already have an arms embargo and we are supportive of calls for a global arms embargo and we will continue to, uh, to do that. Uh, but, Senator, I do not agree with the proposition that you are putting that this amendment should be included in this bill for this purpose. I do not think it is the appropriate place. I'm in the hands of the chamber. If there are no further senators wishing to contribute on the amendment, then I will put the question that the amendments, uh, as moved by the Greens on sheet 1502, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Oh, sorry, the noes have it. Apologies. Very good. Thank you, Senator Wong. Oh. Um, division required? Sorry, the noes have it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Senator Rice. Senator Rice, your Thanks. second lot of amendments. Yes, so I now seek to, leave, to move by leave my amendments one to six on sheet um, 1508 together. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Rice. Okay. I mean, these amendments reflect recommendations from the Joint Standing Committee and our consultation with um, civil society. And they think that we think that they will significantly improve the framework and the capacity of civil society to engage um, on the issues that are being addressed by whether to apply targeted sanctions while not distracting from the minister's powers. Minister, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And uh, the government does not support um, the amendment. Uh, we have. Uh, always um, considered credible information that is provided to us uh, by civil society. We will continue to do that, including conducting regular consultation. We receive suggestions for sanctions listing from a range of sources. I have absolutely the expectation that that uh, would continue, and I know what a constructive role that uh, non-government organisations have played uh, in the development of uh, this legislation and these discussions today. Any individual or organisation can make representations uh, to government regarding uh, potential sanctions targets. Um, and uh, in terms of other aspects of the amendments on 1508, I think we've dealt with some of those already, Senator. If there are no further senators wishing to make contributions on those amendments, I will put the question that the amendments moved on sheet 1508 by Senator Rice be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the committee has considered the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Magnitsky style and other thematic sanctions bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments, including an amendment to the title. I call the minister. I move that the report be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Madam Chair, it gives me great pleasure to move that the bill be read a third time. 
The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Autonomous Sanctions Act 2011 and for related purposes. Government business order of the day. Uh, sorry, Clark, Senator Patrick, you're seeking the call? Are you seeking yes. leave to seek the call? Um, okay. um, Madam Deputy Chair, I withdraw contingent notice of motion number 5A on the notice paper. Thank you very much for alerting the chamber to that. Senator Patrick, I'll call the clerk again. Government business order of the day. Defence Legislation Amendment Discipline Reform Bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator. Just allow senators to get to their spots. Senator Kitching. Thank you, President. I'm, I'm pleased to speak on the Defence Legislation Amendment Discipline Reform Bill 2021, which was introduced into the Parliament in August and passed the House of Representatives on 1 September. The bill is aimed at reforming the system of military discipline for those who serve in our Defence Force by improving the way discipline officers and summary authorities operate under the Defence Force Discipline Act 1982. Our military discipline system provides the Australian Defence Force with an Australian legal framework that is able to be applied on operations anywhere in the world. However, the system of discipline in the Australian military has become slow and unresponsive under the weight of administration required to address minor breaches of discipline. Re reform is required to modernise our current system that predates modern warfare, technologies and tactical requirements and the way our Defence Force is organised. On this basis, Labor will be supporting this legislation. To defend Australia and our national interests, we must maintain an operationally capable defence force, which demonstrates high levels of discipline, professionalism, competence and commitment. The women and men who join the Australian Defence Force are subject to military law, in addition to civilian law, which has its own discipline system and capacity to impose punishments and orders under the Defence Force Discipline Act. The Act provides a comprehensive system of military discipline that must be trusted by the Australian people and, most importantly, by those who serve in our Defence Force to be applied fairly and effectively in all circumstances. The system of discipline administered by the ADF must encourage the men and women of our Defence Force to be accountable for their actions and, importantly, to learn and grow from their mistakes. Because the people in our Defence Force work and live with one another and within teams, they have a perfectly reasonable expectation that any wrongdoing or breach of discipline will be dealt with quickly and fairly. Failure to do so may put the lives of others at risk, erodes morale and adversely affects unit cohesion and fighting capability. Military service and the need to maintain discipline places constraints and responsibilities on the people of our Defence Force. These challenges are unique and experienced by few of their fellow Australians. A separate system of military discipline is therefore essential to enable the Defence Force to deal with matters that relate directly to its discipline, morale and operational capability. It is in this context of a disciplined fighting force that in some cases breaches of military discipline by the people in our Defence Force are dealt with more severely than would be the case if a civilian engaged in similar conduct. conduct. The military discipline system operates in Australia and overseas in times of peace, conflict and war. Enforcing military discipline is essential at all times, both in training for operations and during conflict, in often difficult and dangerous circumstances. Those in the ADF are legally bound to follow all lawful commands, including orders that involve considerable, considerable risk to their own life and others, or may require them to use lethal force against an enemy. The military discipline system administered under the Defence Force Discipline Act has three tiers. At the lowest level is a disciplinary infringement scheme. This enables minor breaches of discipline to be dealt with by the issue of an infringement notice. A person can choose to admit the breach of discipline and be dealt with by a discipline officer who may impose a low-level punishment such as a fine or reprimand. This has some similarity to being issued with a speeding ticket by the police. You can accept the ticket and pay the fine or you may choose to contest the matter in court. 
The second tier is the summary system. This comprises of subordinate summary authorities, commanding officers and superior summary authorities. These proceedings are adverse, adversarial in nature with criminal law-like procedures within the disciplinary infringement scheme and are not administered by legally trained personnel. At the highest level are superior tribunals. These comprise of defence force magistrates, restricted and general courts martial, which deal with more serious matters and apply criminal law procedures. As early as 1989, the Defence Force Discipline Legislation Board of Review, chaired by the Honourable Xavier Connor AOQC, reviewed the operation of the newly enacted Defence Force Discipline Act on behalf of Parliament. He observed, for the most part, service discipline, particularly as administered by summary authorities, has to do with matters which do not contain any element of criminality and which would not constitute an offence under civil law. Many of them are of quite a minor nature and probably in more than 90 per cent of these the facts are not in dispute. These matters referred to by the Review Board range from actions such as those relating to operations against an enemy force, not attending duty on time, the unauthorised discharge of a weapon and having dirty boots on parade. Discipline lies at the heart of service in any defence force. In 2005, the Senate Committee com commenting on change within the Australian Defence Force military dis discipline system noted, military command is in many ways defined by obedience and conformity. Discipline is, along with leadership, a crucial underpinning of command. In fact, it was then, the, then Labor, the Labor opposition that initiated this inquiry in 2003 to hear evidence from ADF personnel and their families about the military justice system. The broader context for this bill is that Australian Defence Force commanders have a duty of care to all the people under their command, whether at home in Australia or deployed overseas. The priority is not just about maintaining discipline. Equally important is the welfare of our sailors, soldiers and aviators who serve in the Australian Defence Force. By simplifying the disciplinary processes, the time required to resolve commonly occurring minor breaches of military discipline could be significantly reduced. This would ease the strain on those involved with the disciplinary action process. A 2017 review directed by the Chief of the Defence Force found that aspects of the current system were overly complex and difficult to use. The review found in particular that summary discipline matters were taking too long to resolve and adversely impacting the people accused of wrongdoing. Delays in resolving breaches of military discipline also adversely affects the morale and potentially the safety of other people. This is particularly so in circumstances where the people in our Defence Force live, work and operate closely together. The current adver adversarial court-like summary discipline system has not been serving our defence personnel as best it might. Many senior non-commissioned officers and junior officers are reluctant to use it. There has been a lack of confidence in applying and understanding the complex court-like requirements of the adversarial summary proceedings. As a consequence, use of the summary discipline system has been in constant and consistent decline. The operation of the summary discipline system has proved problematic in recent conflicts and the nature of modern warfare has changed significantly since the Act commenced in 1985. Our Defence Force personnel have been deployed in smaller Australian formations, often either as independent units or embedded with our allies, frequently far from administrative support. The complexities of the summary discipline system, particularly given the frequency, nature and length of overseas operations, has often resulted in unacceptable delays in resolving or finalising breaches of military discipline. Given this feedback, Labor acknowledges that the reforms in this bill would build on and are consistent with the defence values of service, courage, respect, integrity and excellence. But we question why it has taken four years to bring the bill on. The reforms would provide Australian Defence Force commanders and the men and women who serve under their command with a system of discipline that allows for minor breaches of discipline to be dealt with quickly and fairly. We note more serious offending would continue to be dealt with by a superior military tribunal or referred to civilian authorities as appropriate. The bill would reform the discipline system in three ways. Schedule 1 will expand the operation of the highly regarded and effective disciplinary infringement scheme. The changes will allow a greater range of minor breaches of military discipline to be dealt with more quickly and fairly and with less formality within the disciplinary infringement scheme, rather than by the more complex and adversarial service tribunal processes. This bill introduces a new senior discipline officer position, creating a two-tier disciplinary infringement scheme. 
Labor welcomes additional safeguards included in the bill to ensure the, the scheme continues to be operated fairly. In particular, this reform to military discipline preserves the right of anyone facing a disciplinary infringement to make an informed decision whether to choose to have their matter dealt with under the disciplinary infringement scheme and appear before a discipline officer or a senior discipline officer in a non-adversarial process. Schedule 2 would modernise the discipline system structure. It reduces its complexity by removing the subordinate summary authority. It would realign the rank and punishment jurisdiction of summary authorities, ensuring a logical progression in terms of the rank of the accused person, the seriousness of the breach of military discipline, the level of punishment that may be imposed and the seniority of the summary authority. Schedule 3 would re further reform the military discipline system by introducing several new service offences. These relate to cyberbullying, receipt of a benefit or allowance and failure to perform a duty or activity. Cyberbullying conduct is corrosive to, dis to discipline and can have an extremely adverse effect on the mental well-being of its victims. The new cyberbullying service offence would send a very strong message to those in our defence force that the use of social media to cyberbully another person is unacceptable and will not be tolerated in the ADF. The intention of this new service offence is to enable defence to protect victims of cyberbullying through early intervention and putting a stop to the cyberbullying behaviour before it gets out of hand. It would protect the people who choose to serve in our defence force. Current, current safeguards for persons accused of breaching military discipline will remain. Crucially, under the disciplinary infringement scheme, a person must choose to be dealt with by a, se a discipline officer or senior discipline officer under the disciplinary infringement scheme. Additional safeguards included in the bill are the requirement for any reasonable excuse to be considered before issuing a, a disciplinary infringement notice, the ability of a discipline officer or senior discipline officer to dismiss an infringement if the officer considers a person has a reasonable excuse for committing the infringement, Punishments imposed by a senior discipline officer must be reviewed by a commanding officer. On review, a commanding officer will have the power to one, confirm a, a punishment decision, substitute a punishment decision with a reduced punishment or decide that no punishment be imposed or that the discipline infringement be dismissed with no punishment imposed. On the surface, these proposed changes would appear to have a positive effect on improving the administration of discipline for all those who serve in our defence force. However, it was not clear to us whether the changes were strictly necessary and there had been little consultation with legal experts in the wider defence community prior to the introduction of the bill. At the same time, it is important to ensure that we get the balance right between administrative efficiency on the one hand and fairness, the preservation of legal rights and access to justice for ADF members on the other. In particular, uh, the Minister had not provided a compelling explanation or any concrete evidence of how exactly the amendments in the bill would enhance the ADF's operational effectiveness. In addition, Labor was concerned that under the proposed changes, ADF members would have to choose to be dealt with under the infringement scheme. Further, the adversarial procedures, simplified rules of evidence and Criminal Code Act 1995 provisions that apply to summary authority proceedings will not apply to the new disciplinary infringement scheme. Labor's view was that any changes should not remo remove um, rights and should be broadly consistent with what applies at the upper levels of the military justice system and in civilian courts. We do not want to stand in the way of genuine reform. However, we want to ensure that the military justice system competently balances the following twin objectives. First, it must ensure that the ADF's operational needs for effective and efficient discipline are met. And secondly, it must uphold objective and independent standards of justice that the public has confidence in, protect the rights of ADF personnel and ensure fair treatment. These are the principles that would guide an Albanese Labor government and we would look to continue the process of reform to ensure military justice is fair and effective. To that end, Labor agreed to support the bill in the House but refer it to a Senate inquiry and reserve our final position in the Senate subject to that. To that end, Labor moved to refer the bill to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee for an, inquiry to in, for an inquiry to ensure proper scrutiny and stakeholder consultation and to help clarify the consequences of the amendment. The committee introduced a short inquiry on the papers and this provided an opportunity to, for defence community stakeholders like the Australian Defence Association, Defence Force Welfare Association and legal experts like ANU, ANU Centre for Military and Security Law to examine and, commend, uh, and, and comment on the bill. Submissions to the inquiry were very supportive of the bill. 
Most stakeholders supported removing the subordinate summary authority and expanding the disciplinary infringement scheme to improve its effectiveness to deal with minor breaches of discipline. This should allow for early intervention and reduce delays, thereby improving operational effectiveness. Submitters also broadly endorsed a proposed restructure of summary authorities to realign jurisdiction of discipline officers and summary authorities in between summary authorities in terms of the types of breach, rank of individual and available punishments. Most also agreed with the introduction of new service offences to better manage breaches of discipline in the modern ADF. We note some submission raised concerns about aspects of the proposed reform of the disciplinary infringement scheme and the new service offences, notably the new cyberbullying offence. However, the committee was satisfied with the need for this offence and the protections available for ADF members dealt with under the offence. The committee reported back on 14 October, recommending the bill be passed without amend amendment. Based on the committee's recommendation on balance, Labor will now be supporting the bill in the Senate in its current form. We note uh, some submitters to the inquiry suggested that changes may need to be reviewed down the track to see that they are operating as intended and that the advantages have outweighed the disadvantages. We think this is a sensible proposal. In addition, as some uh, submitters noted, the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is likely to examine the role of the military justice system and issues of abuse, mistreatment and bullying in the ADF. So it's possible that further reforms to the military system may be required to the near future based on its findings and recommendations. Order, Thank Senator you. Kitchen, your time has expired. Senator Stilljohn, remotely. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, and as I uh, speak to this bill today, as the uh, spokesperson for the Greens on matters in relation to peace and veterans affairs, I'd like to acknowledge that the context in which we have met as a chamber this week has been a context in which there is now um, an operating uh, Royal uh, Commission investigating uh, matters relating to defence force suicide. And I'd like to pay tribute uh, to the many campaigners, family members and advocates who fought for so long uh, to achieve this uh, vital opportunity for justice uh, in the face of much uh, resistance um, and dismissal, uh, particularly from the current government. And I can't help but reflect upon the fact that this is at least the second Royal Commission, if you include the Royal Commission into the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of disabled people, that this government has been uh, dragged by the relevant community, kicking and screaming, uh, to implement uh, and action. Given that context, I'd like to make a couple of uh, key uh, observations in relation to the bill and put clearly on the record uh, that the Greens cannot support the proposed reforms um, to the defence discipline system at this time. Uh, the Royal Commission uh, into Defence and Veteran Suicide has only just started and its public hearings uh, and examination of evidence have only just become underway. We know that, that the uh, disciplinary system uh, will be under intensive investigation uh, and scrutiny, uh, which is uh, exactly the right thing to do. It is our view that any reforms proposed should be considered in the light of evidence and recommendations that come from the community and the Commission through this process. Whilst we understand that the intention of this reform is to simplify the operation of aspects of the discipline system, we are concerned that on balance they may serve to exacerbate existing cultural and structural issues that we know cause considerable harm to serving personnel, including but not limited to bullying, gender-based violence and bastardisation. Uh, we have significant rev, uh, reservations about the proposed expansion of the disciplinary infringement scheme. As stated uh, by the GAP veteran uh, and legal service in their submission to the bill's inquiry, uh, quote, reforming the operation of the scheme is not of itself uh, accompanied by merely expanding its application such that it can be used in more situations. In light of the fact that in accepting the jurisdiction of the scheme, as opposed to being dealt with by a tribunal process inclusive of representation uh, by a lay defending officer, the member is in essence pleading guilty to the offence. Uh, greater safeguards are required 
uh, to prevent or limit the abuse of this process. We note with concern the proposed legislation expands the types of offences uh, that the scheme deals with. Anything from turning up late to work to behaving abusively towards colleagues is captured in this scheme and we are concerned that the scope of offence doesn't amount to just minor service discipline matters as suggested by the explanatory memorandum. These concerns are exacerbated by a lack of clarity on what happens should a service member become a repeat offender. Uh, do they continue to get away with minor disciplinary actions when in reality their behaviour warrants more severe consequences? This is one of the key outstanding questions. Our view is that the application of the rule of law and access to justice uh, may not be achieved by expanding the scheme in this way. Further, we accept evidence from the authors of the GAP submission uh, that the disciplinary infringement scheme has been improperly used and weaponized by ineffective chains of command. Specifically, that this scheme and its structure enables uh, more senior members of command to uh, exercise their authority unfairly uh, and to issue infringements as a way of asserting improper power over more junior members. We also note that a key safeguarding mechanism that is meant to counterbalance the above mentioned issues at uh, the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force uh, is subject to considerable criticism and is likely to form part of a lot of the evidence to the Royal Commission itself. This again highlights the need to delay consideration of this legislation until the rights and responsibilities uh, and the effectiveness of this oversight body uh, in upholding the rights and responsibilities of the ADF uh, and its serving members uh, are better understood. As is the case uh, in many other areas of law, the Greens are concerned uh, that the reliance on delegated legislation, in this instance empowering the CDF uh, to make rules in relation to the use or discretion of disciplinary infringement records, diminishes the role of parliamentary scrutiny and of parliamentary oversight. As was made clear in submissions to the inquiry, there is a great need uh, to ensure the application uh, of, disciplinary, of the disciplinary infringement system, uh, that it is uh, operating effectively and that its application uh, is one which does not solely leave the CDF uh, without limits on transparency and accountability. To this end, we note uh, and support the concerns raised by the scrutiny of Bill's committee. Uh, it is stated in its digest that the committee has raised concerns about the uh, proposed section 9FA uh, and uh, section 42 uh, under the relevant sections of the bill. Uh, that makes a particular mention of these concerns. Uh, notwithstanding the details of the bill, uh, the Greens would like to put on record uh, that in principle, defence being empowered to investigate itself and its personnel without sufficient gate safeguard accountability to civilian authorities is a cause for significant concern. The proper and fair application of the law and the justice system is essential and goes to the very heart and integrity of a functioning ADF. We hear the concerns of those serving and ex-serving personnel who have experienced significant systemic violence and injustice uh, through the defence disciplinary system and we are very alive to the reality that this system may not work as intended. In summary, uh, we have a number of principled and substantive concerns with respect to the proposed changes to the disciplinary system uh, and the ways in which they will work in practice. In our view, uh, these proposed changes carry the potential of serious unintended consequences that must be considered uh, fully, particularly in the light of the current Royal Commission, which will gather evidence on the system and culture that underlie the ADF and its functions. We note and acknowledge that this bill uh, is proposing a number of important updates 
to the nature of offences to be considered as offensive as offences by the disciplinary system, particularly cyberbullying. Uh, but we think the application of these provisions and the consequences they carry must be further assessed uh, before they are implemented. And for those reasons, uh, we will be opposing the bill uh, alongside uh, Senator Lambie. Senator Betts. This bill improves the management of disciplinary issues in the Australian Defence Force. The reform measures will result in a military discipline system that is easier to understand and use, reduce unnecessary delays while being fair to all those involved, and allow commanders to more simply and quickly address poor behaviour and create opportunity for early intervention to better support the people in our Defence Force to continue as a positive contributor to their service. The, ma the majority of breaches covered by the Act are of a uniquely military nature. They range from offences relating to operations against an enemy to being late for work. Serious criminal offences or other illegal conduct are usually referred to civilian authorities, such as the police. It is critical that breaches of discipline are resolved quickly and fairly to maintain morale, ensure good order and fighting capability. We need to maintain an operationally capable defence force with the highest levels of professional competence, commitment and discipline, both on and off duty. The bill will reform military the military discipline system in particular the lower level summary system and disciplinary infringement scheme. This will make it easier to use when dealing with minor discipline matters, particularly when deployed on operations. It will do this in three ways. Firstly, by building on what is working well, the disciplinary infringement scheme, by enabling a wider range of minor breaches of military discipline to be managed quickly and simply as disciplinary infringements, rather than service offences where complex adversary or court-like procedures apply. Secondly, they provide a better structured discipline hierarchy based on the seriousness of the offending, available punishments, rank of the individual and the seniority of the discipline authority. Thirdly and finally, the changes introduce several new service offences relevant to the modern ADF. Those new service offences include cyberbullying and the related offence of failure to comply with a removal order concerning cyberbullying material, failing to, to perform a duty or an activity and failing to notify a change in circumstances when in receipt of a benefit or entitlement. The changes will build on the very successful and highly regarded disciplinary infringement scheme. Many senior non-commissioned officers and junior officers had little confidence in using the summary discipline system because of its complexity. Its use has been in constant and consistent decline from 1,743 summary trials in 2009 to just about half of that 923 in 2019. The people in our Defence Force live, work and fight alongside each other. Delays in dealing with discipline matters erode morale and impact mental well-being. Delays can also affect the careers of our people beyond the intended discipline action. This is because leave, attendance on courses and promotional prospects are often on hold until a discipline matter is finalised. This places undue stress on all involved. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, having uh, had the pleasure of chairing this inquiry, I commend uh, the explanatory memorandum and the Minister's second reading speech and the bill to the Senate. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I don't support this bill. It's a shame that we couldn't have had all those diggers come forward and listen to what sort of legal system we have in our Defence Force because I can tell you it's not a legal system. It's a bastardised and abuse system. And that is half the reason why we are losing diggers to suicide. This is absolute abuse. The DFDA and the power it gives those officers out there is nothing but giving them power to abuse a digger. 
We have a Royal Commission for this. I thought this was the whole point of hitting veteran suicide. We have a Royal Commission. It is going to go in and examine what is going on in our defence forces. And I can tell you now, I certainly know you are going to see a lot of abuse matters coming up, a lot of cover-up coming from still going through the Royal Military College. I had four females that have been through there in the last five years come forward to me yesterday in tears saying, we've been raped, abused. I've now sent them to a lawyer so they can get their submissions ready to go to the Royal Commissioner. This is where we are at. The Defence Force Discipline Act does enormous, enormous damage to serving members, and that's the reality. That's the reality. It is used to bully people. People are getting charged for things they never did, and they're too scared to take it to a tribunal because they know what I do. Their careers are over. It is finished for them. And not only will they get discharged, it'll say admin discharge, see you later. Imagine trying to get a job once you say, hey, I was, I was wronged in the army or, or the military um, for doing this, uh, you know, and, I've, and actually I didn't do that, trying to explain that to an employer. It ruins, it ruins a digger's life. It really ruins a digger's life. I just I wish you would not do this today, because what you are doing here is making the situation worse. You are giving more control to the people who are doing the bullying and the bastardisation. Jeez, I'd love to see you give that sort of load to the diggers. Because I tell you what, there's some karma to come at those high-ranking officers. When someone has an injury and they're looking like they could get a medical discharge, it is not uncommon, uncommon to see them getting picked up for things they never should get charged for. And all of a sudden they end up fired up with, like I said, an admin discharge. No medical discharge. No medical discharge for the abuse that they've had to go through, through this process. This Defence Force Discipline Act, she's been gone for a long time. I'll get into some more stories about when I'm serving and, and what's been going on since then, very shortly. This bill won't fix it. In fact, it will actually make things worse and you will see more, more suicides because you're just giving more control to the abusers. And that's all these new offences will do is open it to more abuse. Take the new offence, failure to perform a duty. It's a strict liability offence, which means it doesn't matter if someone had a good reason for failing to carry out their duty. The punishment is dismissal from the defence force. So if you're too sick to do what you're told, or if you're injured, or if you're given an order that you can't possibly comply with, you could get the boot from the defence force through no fault of your own. Let's use an example that's been going on at 7RER, which I brought up last year and again this year, about the abuse that went over there from Lieutenant Colonel Gower and how there was people, there was diggers over there that were on medical, that were on medical, um, medical chits to say that they were so psychologically damaged that no way should they have a weapon in their hands, let alone go to a wage practice. You know what that little bugger did? That little bugger made them sign waivers. And when I reported that to the very top of our defence force, you know what they did? Uh, Senator Lambert, just so I have a point of order. That was used with uh, appropriate parliamentary language. Senator Lambert, just ask you to reflect on your language. Please proceed. So, you know, you know what happened to that, Lieutenant? Colonel, I'll tell you what happened. He got scurried out in the middle of the night. Three months later, he showed up and he was promoted to Colonel. What's new? What's new? Who's being done over here? That's what's going on. The power imbalances are terribly, terribly wrong in the ADF, and that's a recipe for disaster. And this thing, I can assure you, is only going to make it worse. I served in the military police. <laughs> We all know that. So I'm going to tell you some little stories about that today while I've got the time. I'm going to tell you how well we are trained out there, and they've been promising so, since I was certainly in there that they were going to train us up to the expertise of when we walked out, we were pretty much trained like civilian police. We are trained to take a single statement, how to use a speed camera, 
um, and pretty much how to warn people if they haven't got a beret on. That's what the taxpayer pays for for eight or nine weeks while we sit in there. That's what you train us with. It is getting that bad in there right now that um, you have investigations going on where you're not even using the military police. They're not even using the military police with a little bit of expertise that they do have to do those written statements of written statements of fact to be used as evidence as evidence uh, for uh, as evidence uh, for any uh, court proceedings that are going on. They're using what they call fact finds. These fact finds, oh, whoa, which you'll hear come out of the Royal Commission. I imagine the Royal Commission won't take him long before he says get rid of them. These fact finds are doing enormous damage. What you have is you have sergeants, warrant officers, lieutenants, no experience whatsoever in how to write a statement, let alone how to collate evidence and write that. That fact find, which has no um, central records. It goes nowhere. Basically, it goes up to whoever decides at that commanding officer spot. Uh, he puts it through the shredder and says, nothing to see here. That's where we're at. That's where we're up, up in our defence force. I have seen in my time some really great officers be officers in command, and because they were too close to their diggers, commanding officers of units say, hey, big boy, this is what I want you to do. Go and charge your couple of your diggers and show them who's boss. This is not a legal system. This is a system of abuse. There'll be 30 or 40 people sometimes in that unit. That's all there is. That gives one person all that power to be judge and jury. That one person, if it doesn't like the digger, they're gone. They're absolutely gone. If you're lucky and your commanding officer likes you or you're extremely valuable because you're the only one that's got that experience, you're safe. You're good to go. You'll stay. This is how the system works. It is not a legal system. It is a system of abuse. And that's all it is. There are ways to fix this. For an example, when I was a corporal, I was an ops corporal in, um, in the military place. I had access to all the computers. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll just determine who, even at my level, who's going to be charged and who's not. I'll remove those statements if I don't like them. I'll remove them if I believe they're raw regimental sergeant majors in their units will take care of their own men, so they don't walk around with black marks near their name. Back then, we used to get extra duties. We didn't charge every digger. That's how it worked. Even at a corporal's level, I could put in or remove whatever I wanted out of a computer. I decided the fate at a corporal level. This is your legal system. This is really, really bad. But what's even, even worse, which really annoys me, is there is a Royal Commission going on. Seriously, there is a Royal Commission going on? Do, do you not want to wait? Because all you're doing is passing over more power to the abusers. You put this through and that first suicide that I have out of this, I will be back in here. I want you to think really carefully about this because, quite frankly, I want you to delay it. If you really want to do something about the suicides in defence at this point in time before the Royal Commission starts putting his recommendations in, then I'm begging you, I'm begging you not to put this bill through. Because once again, you know, we, we just seen, it was on the 7.30 report last Monday night, we seen a young, young fella gagged up, taped up, gabber tape all over him, being abused. Your Defence Force, uh, your military knew about that for months, trying to shove it under the carpet. That's what happened to that poor young fella. That's your high-ranking officers doing that. 
That's the harm that they're bringing to these people. Because it is not a system of law. It does not work. You cannot have these people that you are working closely to decide your fate. They cannot be judge and jury. It is a disaster, an absolute disaster. You put this third tier in, you put these infringement notices in, and all you're doing is slapping a dig around more. Because I can tell you, as soon as we take a complaint, as soon as we take a complaint higher up, hey, see you later, there goes your career. And by the way, we'll make sure we charge you on the way out. Just for taking us on, we'll stick our chests out at you. That's how it is. We have problems with the leadership in our military. And this is a very, very big part, is the legal system that does not work. It's like I said, this is a system of bastardisation and abuse, and that is what this legal system, this is all it has become. So I'm asking you before you make any moves, you need to hold. Trust me, you just get through that March and April when you start hearing those stories coming out of the Royal Commission thick and fast, because you will regret this move. And all you'll do is take more diggers' lives through suicide. And that's all this bill's going to do. Give more power to the abusers, do over more diggers. Because it's not a legal system. You cannot leave a legal system internally. You need an independent legal system that's on the outside. You need better tra trained military police out there. They're actually promised what we should have got 25, 30 years ago. So we could work out, walk out with a qualification that doesn't just say, hey, here's one for security guard. That's ripping the digger off what's new when it comes to them being educated. I'm just asking you, don't vote for this bill. Just put it on hold because you're getting it really, really wrong and it will bring more suicides. It is a system that's in a mess. It is a shame the diggers can't come forward and couldn't have stood in front of us or even behind camera because they're too scared to. I'm running around like no tomorrow trying to convince them at least come in camera with the Royal Commissioner and trust that process. I'm begging them. I'm not asking them to just do it for themselves but their mates that they've lost. If they don't come forward, the system will never change. And it certainly hasn't got any better since I was in there. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen how yeah, these big commanding officers up there have got no idea how to deal with these females in combat units and infantry units. No idea whatsoever, let alone psychological issues. Just most men aren't, and I, I'm trying to say this politely, but most men aren't good at that anyway. The military men are even worse. You have massive culture problems in there that are going to come out. But one of the reasons, one of the big reasons we are losing them and they're taking their lives is because they've been bullying and abused by their commanders. Through what you call or what you name in here a legal system. The legal system of abuse. You go ahead and vote for it. Because I'll be standing up not so long in the future and saying, I told you so. I told you so. You're getting it wrong. And unless you've served in there, unless you've been military police, unless you've been on the other side of it and seen, seen it still happening, and they're all coming to you, you have no idea what you are voting on today. Because I'll tell you what you're voting for. More bastardisation and more abuse to every digger that serves our military. That's what you are voting on today. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You've got a Royal Commission out there looking into this. And you're going straight over the top of it without even hearing what's coming through. Seriously, don't vote for this. You're getting it wrong. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, let me begin by thanking those members and senators who have contributed to the debate on this bill uh, and a number of those members and senators who have served 
in our defence forces who have brought their experience uh, to this bill. I would note that the bill has been scrutinised by committees in this parliament, uh, including the scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. And through their diligence, uh, those committees have strengthened its content. The intent of this bill is to reform the system of military discipline for those who serve in our defence force uh, by modernising and improving the way that discipline officers and summary authorities operate under the Defence Force Discipline Act of 1982. The reforms are intended to result in a discipline system that is easier to understand and to use, that reduces delays while introducing new checks and balances to ensure that discipline continues to operate fairly. The reforms in this bill are intended to provide those in our Defence Force with far greater choice to have minor breaches of discipline managed as a <coughs> disciplinary infringement without the strength of the lengthy criminal-like investigations and court-like procedures that apply to matters dealt with by summary and superior military tribunals. Indeed, for the first time since its introduction in 1995, we do make clear what the disciplinary infringement scheme is and how it operates. Those impacted by poor discipline will benefit from having matters resolved more quickly. And that is essential because our people live and work and fight together. These reforms will also allow commanders to more simply and quickly address poor behaviour and create opportunity for early intervention to better support the people in our Defence Force to continue as a positive contributor to their service. These reforms will encourage our service women and men to be accountable for their actions and, importantly, enabled to learn and grow from their mistakes. These reforms provide a more logical structure to the various discipline authorities based on the seriousness of the offending, the rank and the experience of the alleged offender, the authority and experience of the discipline authority. These changes to the DFDA will reform the military discipline system so that the people in our Defence Force will benefit from a discipline system that is easier to use, particularly at the lowest levels and particularly when the ADF is deployed on operations, is more timely and responsive, enabling commanders to effectively manage personnel and address behavioural concerns, and is fair and just towards all people involved in the disciplinary process. Further is trusted by our people in our Defence Force and the Australian community, and also is responsive to contemporary technology and how it is used. The bill demonstrates the commitment of this government to achieving a fair and just military discipline system for those who serve our nation and meet the disciplinary needs of the Australian Defence Force. And I acknowledge the contribution of uh, Senator Kitching on behalf of the opposition uh, in relation to this bill. I also acknowledge the uh, comments of Senator Lambie in relation to the uh, contemporaneous uh, commencement of the Royal Commission with the uh, processing of or progress of, uh, of this bill. I acknowledge the points that Senator Lambie has made, uh, but it is the view of the government that uh, addressing the issues that I have outlined um, in my summing up speech uh, is important. And I don't think that the operation of the Royal Commission necessarily, necessarily negates the importance of progressing these matters. I do want to thank all of those who serve and have served in the defence of our nation and acknowledge sincerely the sacrifices that they and their families have made. I would also chair table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to this bill the addendum responds to concerns raised by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the, the Senate is that the bill now be read a second time. I point teller for the ayes, Senator Davey. I point as teller for the noes, Senator Lampy. Honourable Senators, there have been 26 ayes and nine noes. It's resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to defence and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Uh, Chair, I um, would like to table a supplementary, a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amended to be move, amendment to be moved to this bill and move the amendment on sheet ZA126. Um, Mr uh, Chair, the uh, purpose of this amendment uh, is to insert the term, quote, in all the circumstances, unquote, and to remove the element of, quote, offensive, unquote, from the new cyberbullying offence set out in clause two of schedule three of the bill. Cyberbullying offence will apply when a defence member has used a social media service or relevant electronic service in a way that a reasonable person would regard in all the circumstances as threatening, 
intimidating, harassing or humiliating another person. Chair, the Human Rights Committee has suggested uh, in its uh, report on 20 October that the cyberbullying offence be adjusted by either removing the offensive provision or limiting application of the offence to situations where there is a service connection and a need to maintain military discipline. The Scrutiny of Bills Committee also raised concern over the appropriateness of what a reasonable person would regard as the offensive use of a social media service or an electronic service. In moving this amendment, Chair, the government has listened to the concerns raised by these committees and in response has proposed this amendment to the cyberbullying offence to omit as offensive or and to substitute in all the circumstances. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just wish to place on the record the Greens' opposition to this amendment. Senator Lambie. I'd like to um, uh, put our opposition to this amendment on record as well, please. Does any other honourable with senator wish to make a contribution? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor notes that the government has proposed an amendment to the new cyberbullying offence in the bill set out at new section 48A. The effect of this would be that cyberbullying offence would apply when a defence member has used a social media service or relevant electronic service in a way that a reasonable person would regard in all the circumstances as threatening, intimidating, harassing or humiliating another person, but not necessarily regard as offensive. The government says this response to concerns raised by the Senate, Sta Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills and by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. Labor will be opposing the amendment. In terms of the substance, we are concerned that the amendment narrows and weakens the proposed cyberbullying offence. Indeed, the government's own supplementary explanatory mem memorandum to the amendment acknowledges as much. We understand the issue that the minister is trying to address here, but we are broadly satisfied with the interpretive guidance that has been provided in response to the questions from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights about proportionality in relation to this new offence. Labor will not be supporting the amendment because we do not think that removing the word offensive will have the desired overall effect of re reflecting the reality of cyberbullying, that is, that a lot of it does in fact come down to offence or content that is considered offensive. The amendment appears to rely on a libertarian freedom of expression or free speech argument that we believe is inconsistent with the need to maintain a strong system of military discipline which is the over objective of the overall bill. Labor may be open to retaining the words in all the circumstances as threatening, intimidating, harassing or humiliating, but we think it's essential to retain the word, word offensive, otherwise this risks watering down the offence. In terms of process and consultation, we are also disappointed that the government has tried to ram this amendment through at the 11th hour. Uh, this amendment was known about for some time but only provided us with, with it and the supplementary explanatory memorandum yesterday, potentially an, only an hour or so before the bill could have been debated. This is not simply a minor or technical amendment, so this was not enough time to consider properly the proposed change. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. And division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The uh, eyes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey for the eyes and Senator Ciccone for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 19, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as the, the question now is that the bill be reported. So, sorry, that the bill stand as printed. So it's the wish of the it's the wish of the Senate for us to We won't go to the question because I believe Senator Kitching is seeking the call to ask for the questions in committee. So Senator Kitching, you have the call. Um, could I ask uh, the 2017 review directed by the Chief of the Defence Force? which found that aspects um, of this current system were, current, were over, overly complex and difficult to use. And that summary Order. discipline matters were taking too long to resolve. 
what what were the sum what were the um, typical summary discipline matters that were taking too long to resolve? Minister. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I can advise uh, that the average time taken for, for such an investigation was 86 days. That, I'm advised, has been reduced to 56 days. Uh, and uh, in contrast, uh, the time for a discipline officer inquiry um, is two to three days. Senator Kitching. So, with the summary, the typical summary discipline matters, is there? A, do you have a list of those? Of what were the typical matters that were being being heard? Um, at the table with me, but um, at the chair with me. But I will see if I can obtain some information for you. Senator Kitching. On the amendment, uh, why was the interpretive guidance that was provided in response to the questions from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights? about proportionality in relation to this offence not sufficient? Minister. Let me seek some advice, Senator. Senator, as I understand it, both of the committees responded and said that it was uh, not sufficient, uh, both the scrutiny of bills and the Human Rights Committee report. Uh, Senator Kitching. Um, why the minister's initial response to the Human Rights Committee that was found to be not sufficient? Minister. Oh, minister, you didn't have the call. Oh, sorry, so, sorry, Chair. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Minister. That's correct, as I understand it, Senator. Yes. Thank you, Senator Kitching. He's talking across the chamber, Chair. Oh, but uh, it's very nice why to have such um, polite. Like it's very polite, yes. Didn't this support um, the original form of the offence that was effectively refuting any subse subsequent amendment? So perhaps I should explain that better. So the support um, of the original form of the offence, was that effectively re refuting any subsequent amendment? Minister. Um, Senator, I'm not sure that I understood uh, your question then, but I'll, I'll seek some advice from officials as to whether they have anything for me in relation to that. Can I say in relation to the summary of um, uh, to the offence categories, your previous question, uh, the ones that, uh, that I have been advised are relevant are absent from duty without leave, um, insubordinate conduct, disobeying a lawful command, failing to comply with the general order, assaults, weapons discharge, and prejudicial conduct. Senator Kitching. Um, in the minister's initial response to the Human Rights Committee, did he not support the original form of the offence, effectively refuting any subsequent amendment? Did he not assert that the original provision was suitable, necessary and adequate in its balance? Minister. Senator, I'm not aware of the details of the minister's original response, but I think what came back to the chamber today, based on the advice of both the Scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Human Rights Committee, uh, was, uh, was in accordance with um, the positions that both those committees took. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Could I ask, um, in terms of ADF members uh, who are subject to this, um, the defence discipline and the amendment, Are there, is there training that's received or training given uh, to members of the ADF, and how? I mean, how how adequate? I mean, how? Um, I guess how, how, how? What kind of training is given? Uh, does it um, does it? Do most of the ADF personnel find it to be adequate? Minister.
Thank you, Chair. I understand that uh, the training is part of uh, initial recruit training. Uh, there is also the establishment uh, in more recent times of a new joiners guide, uh, and there is a requirement uh, that uh, it must be completed by all members. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Um, in terms of the strengthening of the social, uh, the cyber, cyber bullying offences, um, the new, new legislation has been announced. Um, by the Prime Minister in relation to, um, you know, to, to ensuring that online trolling doesn't happen. What is the so in terms of uh, what's happening in the in the with the ADF personnel and with the new offence, uh, is that do you feel is that in uh, is that in balance or is that in in is that consistent with what the online trolling uh, offences that the Prime Minister has recently announced? Minister. Sorry, Chair. Um, Senator, I think the points that uh, I, uh, I, I uh, enunciated in my earlier comments on the amendment itself uh, reflects a uh, consistency uh, between the uh, initiative announced uh, by the Prime Minister and colleagues uh, on these matters. Uh, and certainly, if there were uh, more work to be done, uh, I'm sure that uh, the minister would look at that with keen interest. Thank you. Uh, it being 6.20, senators, the time allotted for the debate on the bills has expired. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today, I'll now put questions before the chair and then put the questions on the remaining stages of the elect of the and then the electoral bill. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, all of those opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Oh, we can't, we're not having you. If it assists the chamber, this is just the determination that the bill stand as printed. It is not the final vote on this matter. So this just gets us out of committee stage. So I'll put it again, making sure that everyone is aware of that. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, to the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Uh, is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bills. The question is that the bill stand as printed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point Senator Davey for the ayes and Senator. I thought it would be McKim. Senator McKim for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 9. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, the committee reports progress. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill now be passed. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those who say no. Aye. Those against say no. Um, the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Bring the bills for one minute. We are out of the committee now, that's correct.
question is that the remaining stages of the bills be agreed to and the bill now be passed. Those of that opinion, uh, ayes will move to the right of the chair and those will move to the left. I appoint Senator Davey Teller for the ayes and Senator McKim Teller for the noes. I'm sure you can. The result of the division is eyes 31, nose 9. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to defence and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Electoral Legislation Amendment Political Campaigners Bill. 2021. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Aye. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a second time. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I point Senator Davey Teller for the eyes and Senator McKim Teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 10. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of political campaigners and to provide for application of the amendments. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thank you, Minister. I'll now deal with the amendments circulated to the bill, starting with government amendments. The question is that the amendments on sheet ZD154 circulated by the government be agreed to. Those of that opinion say from the remaining amendments. All right, we will be splitting the amendments. We will be dealing with first with item one. So I put the question on item one. Those, uh, those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that item one on sheet ZD 154, uh, as circulated by the government, be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, tell her for the eyes, and Senator McKim, tell her for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 7. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the remaining amendments on sheet ZD 154. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. 
I will now deal with the amendment circulated by Senators Patrick and Lanby. The question is that the amend amendments on sheets. Oh, sorry, Senator Griff. To uh, vote uh, differently on both of these, um, if we could have them split. All right, then I will propose that the amendments on sheet 1398 revised uh, two. We'll put the uh, we'll put the question on that first. Everyone clear? Question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. We are dealing with amendments on sheet 1398, revised number two. Uh, eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the eyes, and Senator Ciccone, Senator Ciccone teller for the nose. Senators, please remain in their chairs and to be quiet. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 31. The question is resolved in the negative. I will now put the amendments on sheet 1401, revised number 2. The question is those amendments be agreed to. Oh. Okay, so we are now on 1401, revised number 2, which I believe was circulated by Senator Lambie. Is that Lambie and Patrick, sorry? No, we just voted on 1398. We have now moved to 1401 revised 2. Is everybody clear? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Okay. 
are real. Oh, stop the bells. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, tell her for the eyes. Senator Ciccone, tell her for the nose. It does. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 31. The question is resolved in the negative. I will now move on to amendments circulated by the Centre Alliance. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1524 circulated by the Centre Alliance be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have, have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1524 be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim. Are you happy to be the teller for the eyes? And Senator Ciccone, teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 30. The question is resolved in the negative. I'll now move on to amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. And we will start with item two of schedule two. Uh, the question is that item two of schedule two stand as amended by government amendment three. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is now that the remaining amendment on sheet 1525 be agreed to. Um, those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Stop the bells. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Ayes passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the noes. That's you.
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 30. The question is resolved in the negative. The question is now that the remaining stages of the bill. Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. Well, Pai, yes, can I just ask, because I made a mistake, um, that the uh, Greens Amendment 2 on sheet 1525 that you record us as saying no rather than yes, because it was a stand as printed, which I belatedly realised. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Senator Waters. The question is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and that the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that the remaining of the stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Eyes passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, tell off the eyes. Senator McKim, tell off of the nose. There have been 30 ayes, 9 noes. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of political campaigners and to provide for application of the amendments. Thank you all. As per the change to the order of business earlier today, we will now move to petitions. Clerk. Clark. A petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number four, standing in my name for five sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the legislation exemptions and other matters amendment 2021 measures number one regulations. 2021 and business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for 13 sitting days after today.
today proposing the disallowance of the taxation administration data sharing relevant COVID-19 business support program declaration 2021. Thank you, Senator Viravanti Wells. Uh, I will now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desi Oh, sorry. Apologies, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs five to eight of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings: the Biosecurity Amendment, Enhanced Risk Management Bill 2021 and the Treasury Laws Amendment Enhancing Superannuation Outcomes for Australians and Helping Australian Businesses Invest, Bill 2021, and I also table statements for reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated into hands up. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any other notices of motion to be given for another day? If not, then we will move to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clerk. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 13 on today's order of business. No postponements have been received. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. If nothing further, I will proceed now to the discovery of formal business. Are uh, there any formal motions? Now we might proceed through these in a way that assists the operation of the chamber. Perhaps we may start with your uh, government business motion number two, Senator Rustin. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to estimates hearings for 2022 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? If not, Senator Austin. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move to uh, government business notice of motion number three, Senator Dunningham. President, I ask the government business notice of motion number three. Uh, relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Dunning. I move that motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Senator McKim, are you seeking leave? I'd like to have the question put separately on one of the bills covered by this motion, which is the Investment Funds Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, because we wish to vote differently on that bill. Okay, the investment funds. So uh, I haven't got the motion in front of me. So. We'll put the main motion without the investment fund first. Um, those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we will put the investment fund. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. For right. I've got an indication that we need a division. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. Having 33 ayes, 7 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Given we have moved into divisions, I will just proceed through the rest of the motions as set out. We will go to Senator Rice, Business of the Senate, motion number one. Um, to seek clarification from you, President, that was one that I was wanting to have debated at item, sorry, at item 21, which I understand we are not doing under the hours motion. So my, my understanding is you can either move the motion now or it uh, can be carried over till tomorrow. Yes, I'd prefer to carry it over till tomorrow. Okay. So I can, do I need to postpone it till uh, tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Well, I seek to postpone it until tomorrow. Thank you, Senator Rice. Um, we will now proceed to uh, business of the Senate motion number two. Senator Hanson is Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, because remote participation doesn't allow Senator Hanson to move this, on behalf of Senator Hanson, I ask the business of the Senate notice of motion number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Smith. I move the motion. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Question is that business Senate notice of motion number two be agreed to. Ayes are passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Chandler, teller for the ayes. Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. Result of the division is ayes 23, noes 22. The question is resolved in the affirmative. We will now move on to business of the Senate motion, notice of motion number three in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Thanks, Rice. President. I seek leave to um, postpone business of the Senate notice of motion number three to tomorrow. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator O'Neill? Uh, are you Mr. President, I, I seek a recommittal. I'm sorry to um, delay the chamber, uh, but it is my fault, and I was in I was in my office, so I seek. Uh, so first thing, I seek leave to make a personal statement. Is leave granted? So my apologies is, sorry, to the Senate. Is leave granted? Leave Thank is you. Granted. So my apologies to the Senate for delaying the vote. Um, I was actually at my desk and just. Because we've had so many divisions, it didn't register that it was uh, not a Mickey. So I'm very sorry that I've delayed you, and I seek a recommittal of the vote. Senate, uh, Minister, uh, with, with the indulgence of the chamber, um, could I ask Senator O'Neill um, if we could take that on advisement? Um, I'm not saying no, and, and I'm not saying yes. Just well, no, only in as much, Senator, yeah, Senate. Uh, with the indulgence of the chamber, Mr. President, um, you know we, we have some very um, <coughs> strictly adhered to protocols in relation to misadventure, and I was just seeking the opportunity to be able to get some advice in relation to whether this is a normal reason why the chamber would accept a recommittal. Of course, if it is, Senator O'Neill, I'm more than happy to um, uh, to agree to it. However, I would like the opportunity to seek that advice. <laughs> Well, I will say that. Thank you. We, we, we will be in formal business for quite a few minutes, so there, I will allow some discussion to occur. I will allow some discussion to occur. Senator, Senator Rice, let's just allow that discussion to take place. Let's move to the next motion. Uh, we're on business. We'll move. We'll move, Senate of, uh, Senator Rice. You have the call. Thanks, President. And I seek leave to postpone business of the Senate number three until tomorrow. Sorry, I think leave was actually granted. Apologies. Postpone so it. <laughs> Leave was granted. So we'll now move on to uh, government business notice of motion number one. S Senator Rustin. Ask the government business notice of motion number one relating to the days of meeting for 2022 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Move an amendment. Uh, she needs to move the motion first. Uh, sorry, she. Sorry, Senator Rustin <laughs> needs to move the motion first. I move the motion. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move an amendment and uh, to make a short statement is of no leave, more than two minutes. Is leave granted? Um, 
Leave is granted. Yep, I've sought leave to move the amendment, and I've also sought leave for a two-minute statement. Uh, I believe uh, leave hasn't been granted for the statement. Am I correct? Two minutes. You have leave for one minute. All right. Thank you, President. We've moved to add two sitting weeks to this pathetic Senate, uh, Senate sitting calendar, which has barely any sitting days in it at all. It is a record low number of sitting days. Now, we could be debating and passing ICAC legislation. We could be debating and passing legislation to give effect to the Jenkins recommendations. But this Prime Minister, who has set this flaccid calendar, can't face the wrath of the chamber and doesn't have a legislative agenda, and so that's why they've listed barely any sitting days. It's absolutely shameless, uh, and we are seeking support from the chamber for the chamber to do its job, to sit and consider legislation, debate it. We've just seen a gag rammed through Order. where we couldn't debate anything. We want some more sitting days so we can do our job. Corruption Order. legislation and Jenkins recommendations. Let's do Standard our job. Orders. Your time has expired. I will. Is leave granted? One minute. Just to put on the record that Labor won't be supporting Senator Waters' amendment, but we do have sympathy for it. Uh, but Labor has taken the position as a convention of this place. Order. Just referring order. to the previous matter. Order. If someone on their feet, I assume on a point of order. I apologise to Senator Gallagher for interrupting, but Senator Thorpe just made the most outrageous statement directed at Senator Hughes, which you probably didn't hear. But in the scheme of disgusting statements made in this chamber, that surely ranks at the top of them. S Senator, I, Senator Small, I obviously did not hear the statement. Senator Thorpe. I'm happy to retract. I just got a view of something over there that disturbed me, but I'm happy to retract. Sen Senator Hughes, Senator Thorpe um, has retracted whatever statement she made. I think we should move on. Senator Gallagher. Sen order. Order. It's the end of a long week. I understand that. Let's try to keep the chamber moving. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I was just making the point, Mr. President, that um, Labor has always taken the view that the sitting program is the government's to determine, uh, which is why we won't be supporting your amendment, even though we have sympathy and we acknowledge that the government is, has a very low number of sitting days uh, for this chamber because they've lost control of it. But I would point out the purpose of convention in this place to allow the smooth operating of this chamber and urge the government to consider that in light of the request that Senator O'Neill has made about the previous matter before, this, uh, before you, Mr President. All right. I will now put the amendment. Senator Lambie. Request leave for, to make a short statement for less than a minute. Is leave granted? One minute. I cannot believe you people over here. You had Burke down in the lower house going on and on and on about the Prime Minister and those sitting weeks, and you are sitting here. We have all this stuff that needs to go through. What are you so concerned about? Is the election that important to you? You buy your seats anyway. You don't earn them. I cannot believe Tony Burke's down there being a Twitter sensation. Well, take this, Twitter, because you're full of it. You don't want extra sitting weeks. This is embarrassing for you, and you should be doing the right thing. We get paid to sit up here and get a job done. Absolutely disgraceful performance by Labor. Now, we want those extra two sitting weeks. Get it done. Question is that the amendment, Senator Patrick. Seek leave to make a one minute statement. Is leave granted? One minute. No, sorry, I heard a no. I. Sorry, I will put it again. Is leave granted for one minute? One minute. One minute. Thank you. I, I would just encourage Labor to support this amendment. I take the point uh, that Senator Gallagher has made about uh, about 
the government control of, of the Senate. But of course, we suspend standing orders from time to time. We seek to do that when things are important. And indeed, uh, this is not disorderly. It's simply uh, amending a motion that would permit more sitting days, more scrutiny of government, and I urge the Labor Party to change their position. I will now. Sorry, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, I would seek leave just to take a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Right. Um, I'll make a few points here. Um, uh, we, as the opposition and in government, over decades have taken the view that the government of the day has the right to set the parliamentary sitting schedule. And th that is the position we have consistently taken. So the position that we are demonstrating today is no different to the position that successive you know, Senate delegations. Yeah, well, 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 and, and I'm happy to take take the interject. Well, I'm, I'm happy to take the interjection, um, Senator Lambie. Uh, and what I would say to you is this: We do have a view that this chamber should be run differently. We do have a view that a government should legislate on the things that matter. We do have a view. We do have a view. Uh, about actually having a government with an agenda, and what, what we believe is elect a Labor government. Elect a Labor government, and then we will put forward a Senate program. A Senate program with all the, with, with respect, Mr. Senator Patrick, you voted with the government more times on many pieces of legislation over many years. No, but my point Senate, is, Senator Wong. my point is, if I could, if I could, I understand Sen people are tired. I understand this has been difficult, Sen but I Senator would Wong, say your this. time has expired, unless. Um, if you want to seek leave for an ad finish the point. If is leave granted, leave is granted. Thank the Senate. I make this point about conventions. Uh, this place uh, is about the management in many ways of, of conflict, of different views about how this country should be run. Uh, and part of how we manage and contain uh, some of this conflict is by the observation of conventions. They include things like ministerial accountability. They include things like the pairing arrangements, recommittal of votes, a whole range of things. And this is one of them. This is one of them. And it is about, it is not about ceding control of the chamber. It is recognising the role of the executive government in a Westminster system because we are also a party of government and we seek to change the country by changing the government. All right. I think <laughs> Senator Birmingham. A one-minute statement that will be less than one minute. Is leave granted? Being no objection, Minister. Thank you, President. I just wish to, uh, to uh, make two points. Uh, one is in relation to the sitting calendar, to acknowledge that uh, it is a replication of the 2019 sitting calendar uh, in terms of accommodating uh, the delivery of a budget, delivery of a budget in a normal way in terms of enabling the preparation of that budget. Uh, but it does identify, of course, uh, the sittings right throughout the course of the year. We all know there will be an election at some stage. However, our intention is fully to deliver upon uh, those sittings and to get the parliament back as quickly as possible if we are in the position to do so. The second point is to acknowledge, as, uh, as Senator Wong just highlighted, the importance of conventions, the convention of the government establishing the sitting program uh, and of supporting uh, that approach. Uh, that is a convention the Liberal and National Party's support uh, have supported, will continue to support. All right, I'm going to put the amendment, Senator Waters. Yes, I just neglected to uh, seek leave to add Senator Patrick's name to my amendment, so I'm belatedly doing that now. I assume there would be no objection to that. Leave is granted, and I will move the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Waters to Government Business Motion No. 1 be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. I will now put the substantive motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will now move to motion, general business notice of motion number 1287 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that general business notice of motion 1287 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I beg leave to make a short statement. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Commonwealth does not have permission from relevant state and territory and New Zealand ministers to table the documents that have been requested. Disclosure of documents could damage relationships between governments. Submissions from public consultation will be made public in due course. I will put the question. Those in favour of the motion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, motion number 1288, also in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1288 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move on to 1289, also in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1289 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move to Senator McGrath, 1290. Senator McGrath, you have the call. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1290 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McGrath. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of ballot papers and to provide for optional preferential voting and ensure voter choice. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. 
The ayes have it. On, uh, Senator McGrath. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of ballot papers Order. and to provide for optional preferential voting and ensure voter choice. Sorry, was someone seeking the call? Senator McGrath. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McGrath. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I will now move Senator Thorpe. Are you seeking the call? Seeking leave to make a personal statement. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Thank you, President. Uh, I just want to uh, unreservedly uh, take back my comments uh, that I made earlier. And I apologise to um, that senator wholeheartedly, um, Senator Hughes, and that won't happen again. So I apologise to um, the senator and also the Senate. All right. We will move on to motion number 1291 in the name of Senator Hanson, senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I move the motion, I just seek leave to uh, amend it in the terms circulated in the chamber. It was simply a change to the minister's official title. Is uh, leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I move the amended motion, uh, number 1291, uh, as circulated. Question is the motion be Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. One minute. You Thanks, Opposition Whip. Uh, the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for Resources and Water have complied with the provision of all orders for the production of documents relating to the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program, and the Senate has already received redacted documents consistent with what has been provided to applicants under the Freedom of Information Act. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We'll now move to 1292. In the name of Senator Wish Wilson, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice and Motion 1292 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunning. Seek leave to make a short statement. One minute. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Community development grant projects contribute to local economies, create jobs, and boost confidence within a region. They provide much-needed new and upgraded facilities, from sporting facilities to upgrading community centres and small-scale infrastructure. The process includes detailed assessments, including project viability and sustainability and project benefits. The government won't oppose this motion, but is unable to provide the requested documents within the required time frame. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, now, one, two, nine, three. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Sorry, Mr. President, I didn't have that uh, number in front of me. Um, I move the motion uh, as circulated. I seek leave to have the motion taken as formal. There is no objection. That motion is taken as formal. Just for clarification, that's motion one, two, nine, three. I move the motion. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a very short statement. One minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The government will consider the responses and will make a commitment to publish these when finalised. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that have that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now, was anybody moving anything else? I seek leave. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to recommit um, business of the Senate number two for a vote based on the explanation provided by Senator um, O'Neill. Is leave 
granted. I believe leave is granted. In that case, I will again move a motion number, business of the Senate motion number two. Uh, those in favour of that motion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Chandler, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, tell her for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 24. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. Now, just to be sure, I think that concludes formal business, but I'll just I'll check, with, check with the clerks. Um, we'll now move on to table and, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. Uh, I'll let Senator Gallagher do hers first so she can go. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I present the third interim report of the Select Committee on COVID-19 and I move that the Senate adopt the recommendations contained in the report proposing orders for the production of documents Correct. and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Oh, we need to put the question? Put the question. Okay. Okay. To put the question. Okay. The question. No. Okay. Well, the question lost. is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Now. Thank you. Is any objection? Sorry, Senator Gallagher, they could not hear you. So to which bit? <laughs> just seek, seeking leave to continue your remarks. I'm seeking leave to continue my remarks. There, there Thank being you. no objection, leave is granted. Senator Reckitt. Thank you. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bill, Senator Polly, I pre present Scrutiny Digest 18 of 2021. Uh, Senator Davey. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, Senator Firavanti Wells, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 17 of 2021. Thank you. Uh, Senator Davey, I believe you have another. Oh, let me see, I've got a few. On behalf of the Joint Standing Com Committee on Treaties, I present the 198th report of the committee relating to European tariff quota rate quotas following withdrawal of the United Kingdom. Thank you. And one more, perhaps? On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I present two reports as listed at item 17 of today's order of business together with accompanying documents. Thank you. I'm looking around the chamber, but I believe that may almost be it. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I'm, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Patrick, in his absence. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. And I believe on that note. Is anyone seeking the call? If not, the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.